Good morning, everybody, and uh, you're very welcome. Uh, those of us joining online, I feel like I'm sort of talking into the ether, but hopefully you can see and hear me. And um, those in the room as well, you're very welcome uh, to today's workshop after Brexit, debating constitu constitutional futures across these islands. My name is uh, Jonathan Evershed, and I am the uh, Newman Fellow in Constitutional Futures uh, the School of Politics and International Relations here at UCD uh, and the Institute for uh, British Irish Studies. Uh, before we kick off this morning, I just want to express uh, my solidarity with friends and colleagues uh, on the pickets um, in uh, the UK and um, uh, send them my very best wishes uh, from Dublin this morning. Um, I also want to flag at the outset that my fellowship and today's event are funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs through the Reconciliation Fund. Um, I've got a bit of a spiel about the Institute for British Irish Studies, about this particular project, Constitutional Futures After Brexit, and then I want to kind of frame and introduce today's event as well before handing over to the first of our three panels this morning. Thanks for those of you who made it through Storm and Tempest to be here. I know that some others had planned to be but couldn't make it in the end. Um, and, uh, um, but uh, hopefully you've, you've had the opportunity to tune in online. The Institute for British Irish Studies provides a platform for academics, politicians, public servants, NGOs, civil society groups and citizens to share perspectives on a range of aspects of the evolving British-Irish relationship, and it operates an active research and outreach program uh, to stimulate debate and advance understanding of this relationship, including Northern Irish, North-South, East-West, European, and international dimensions. The Constitutional Futures After Brexit project is a three-year project exploring the consequences of Brexit for the constitutional futures of Great Britain and Ireland. The project has used deliberative methodologies, uh, many public, to explore attitudes towards constitutional futures on and for this island in particular, uh, which have revealed a demand for further discussion and planning around possible constitutional change. This research has been led at IBIS by Paul Gillespie and by former Newman Fellow Roland Gajoni, who I think is tuning in from, is it Brussels or... or uh, from Strasbourg uh, today, um, and they have worked with partners uh, at Queen's University Belfast and elsewhere, and there are, there's a, public, a publication of the results from the mini-public is, is imminent, I believe. Uh, my own research um, within the Constitutional Futures After Brexit project focuses on relationships between Ireland, Wales, and Scotland, uh, and their role in constitutional debates in and between them. Um, I'm gonna, uh, my New Year's resolution was to speak more Welsh in public, um, and uh, it's a bit risky given uh, the audience in the room, uh, and uh, I've no doubt those tuning in as well. And my rai di vidwaid fel berson y mai e a fywyd wedi'r ddifnidio gan fôr i werddon, ac wedi'n fyw ei draws, mae'r mae perthnasoedd hyn o'r or, uh, ar wyddocad uh, personal dwys. Um, mae'n drwy geni os uh, dydy ddim yn make any sense, but... Uh, okay. <laughs> um, but I, I just want to say, as a person who's, whose life is defined by uh, and lived across the Irish Sea, um, these relationships are very personal, as well as of profound um, uh, you know, scholarly and, and political interest to me. Um, under the, the remit of the, of the Constitutional Futures After Brexit project, I, with others, are engaged in ongoing research in collaboration with partners in Scotland, Wales, England, and on the island of Ireland, North and South, uh, exploring changing identities and institutions across these islands after Brexit. The Britishness, Irishness, and Institutional Links project is funded by the IRC through its new foundations programme, uh, watch this space. Um, and the Constitutional Futures After Brexit project is also seeking to use methodologies and insights from the field of future studies to inform debates about constitutional change. Uh, watch this space. 
Uh, this all sits within the wider work and, and research program within IBIS and uh, further information is available on our website at uh, ucd.ie slash IBIS as well as through our social media channels. I just want to take a bit of time now to, to introduce, uh, to frame and to explain today's event uh, about which I am stupidly excited. Um, we were talking last night about how this is a very Jonathan event um, and I'm, I'm thrilled um, to have been able to, to bring together um, friends, colleagues, uh, scholars whose work I so admire, um, practitioners who I find, whose work I find uh, very inspiring too. And the design of this workshop has been informed by my research on the politics and cultures of Ireland and Great Britain over several years. Uh, the unifying concern across all of my academic work to date has been the political future how political futures are conceived of and articulated. And this includes my work on the politics of memory and commemoration, which is actually a set of practices and discourses that is all about how we conceive of the future rather than of the past. Um, and I'll leave it at that for now. For more, see my published works. Um, um, more immediately, I suppose, the impetus for today's event is provided by my experience of both Brexit and the COVID pandemic, which have revealed in stark new ways the connections and ruptures that shape the relationships across these islands and how I understand them as my home. And I'm grateful for the space that the Newman Fellowship has given me to think critically about this. Um, Stating the obvious, I suppose, it's quite clear that everything has changed, changed utterly, to, to coin a rather hackneyed uh, phrase. The centre cannot hold, as it were. There can be no return to what came before Brexit and COVID. Brexit and COVID have overlapped to produce a constitutional moment for the UK and Ireland, in which some form of constitutional change is now inevitable and indeed has already happened. Brexit itself representing a, a fairly profound process of constitutional change in and for uh, these islands, on and for these islands. Uh, a range of possible uh, constitutional futures remains. Um, but further constitutional change is now a live and immediate prospect in every jurisdiction across this Atlantic archipelago. But when we talk about constitutional change in Ireland, Scotland, Wales or England, are we necessarily talking about the same thing? What are we really talking about when we talk about constitutional futures? And this, in my view, needs a little more unpacking and some grounding in what constitutions are, how they work, what they can and can't or might do. And returning to these kinds of first principles, these questions will be the focus of the first roundtable discussion today. Conceptions of the constitutional future of these islands um, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a risk here by saying this, but I'm going to go with it, uh, might be thought of as belonging to ve very broadly to two very broad families of ideas, unionism and nationalism, though these categories are, of course, infinitely complex, permeable, their families fraught, of course, with internal tensions and conflicts. Uh, some of the nuances and conflicts uh, within and across these categories I hope we can explore a little today. Um, sparing you a very deep dive into post-structuralist theory, <laughs> uh, suffice it to say that all political projects, including unionism and nationalism, are ultimately and definitionally concerned with the future. I've become increasingly interested in how unionisms, as both a particular set of constitutional understandings and a way of doing politics, do and don't speak to each other, how little attention is paid, for instance, in Northern Ireland to the successes of the Labour Party in Wales vis-à-vis -vis the dominance of the SNP in Scotland and Ulster Unionism's uh, somewhat obsessive focus, I think, on the threat of nationalism rather than on articulation of the union per se. What does it mean to have a unionist conception of the political future after Brexit, after Covid, and how is this different in different parts of the union? Today's second round table will address some of these questions. Likewise, I'm interested in what connects and what separates different nationalist visions of the future of these islands after Brexit. My current research focuses particularly on whether and how the projects of 
Irish unity, Scottish independence and constitutional change in Wales, transformative visions of a new constitutional settlement are interrelated. To what extent are or can these projects of constitutional transformation be transnational? And what sorts of futures do they anticipate for relationships between these islands? And today's third roundtable will examine these questions, examine nationalism as a way of conceiving of the constitutional future and of doing politics in Wales, Ireland and Scotland, how different visions, uh, different nationalist visions of the post-Brexit political and constitutional future interact with each other as well as with competing unionist conceptions. Today's event offers, I think, uh, perhaps slightly or to or somewhat, I don't know how big I want to make this claim, but I think a somewhat rare opportunity to interrogate the overlaps and conflicts between different projects seeking to shape the political and constitutional futures of these islands. Um, every participant in today's discussion has been invited because they have had a great influence on my own thinking about constitutional politics. And across the three panels, there is, I hope, a good cross-section of established and emerging scholars and people engaged in the business of actually doing political and constitutional change. Without much further ado, I'm very keen to get the show on the road and hand over to Paul, who's going to chair the first panel. But uh, before I do that, one final uh, sort of shameless act of self-promotion. I'd just like to flag the imminent publication of um, Mary Sue Murphy's and my new book, A Troubled Constitutional Future, Northern Ireland After Brexit, uh, which is coming out in the early part of next month um, uh, with Agenda Publishing, which explores or at least asks many of the questions that we will examine in more depth here today. So I will hand over now to Paul and thank you all again for being here and um, you'll hear from me again when I chair the third and final round table and offer some concluding remarks after it uh, this afternoon. So thanks very much and over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And uh, in, in your short time with us, you've made a, a remarkable uh, impact on our work, which is communicated, in, I think, in the enthusiasm uh, that we, we heard from you there. And I'll also say uh, greetings to Dr. Roland Gajoni, who, who is the first um, fellow uh, and who, who, who's, who's, whose work is proceeding uh, uh, on comparative aspects of constitutionalism uh, in Ireland and in, in, in Albania, Kosovo. Um, now, uh, we, the big question we have for this panel is, what do we talk about when we talk about constitutional futures? Uh, and the aim is for a discussion which centres around uh, that question, what does it mean to talk about ch constitutional change on, between and beyond these islands? Uh, and these islands is a really important dimension to this discussion. Uh, so much of our discussion in Ireland about constitutional futures is focused on unification uh, for or against and whether it's indeed uh, a good idea to talk about that subject at all rather than about uh, what we share on the island. Uh, but whatever change is happening here is in part, in, even in large part, being driven by change on the larger island and the larger union uh, that uh, our, uh, some of Ireland is still part of. So we need to take that very much across the island's perspective into account. What then also are constitutions, what can and can't they do? And what can and should processes uh, of constitutional change seek to achieve? Uh, uh, it's a very big word, uh, but it may be overestimated uh, what, what, it can, what it can play with. Uh, and thirdly, what is at stake in processes of and conversations about constitutional change and what principles should underpin them? Now, to address these questions, we have two political scientists and two uh, legal scholars from UCD. Uh, and that uh, juxtaposition and, and dialogue between political science and law is going to be, a, I think, a really interesting uh, dimension of, of our discussion today. Our first speaker is Professor Jennifer Todd, who is Professor Emeritus in the School of Politics and International Relations here at UCD, a member of IBIS and a fellow at the Geary Institute for Public Policy uh, and the Centre of Constitutional Change at the University of Edinburgh. Her work uh, engages conflict and settlement and processes of political and identity change. Uh, and uh, we are all aware of how distinguished a scholar she has been over many, uh, over many years. 
Dr. John Walsh is an assistant professor uh, in politics and international relations uh, in UCD and is the director of the Institute for British Irish Studies here. Her work explores the role of institutions and particularly commissions in conflict settlement and resolution and processes of political change. Thirdly, we have Dr. Liam Thornton, who is an associate lecturer in the School of Law at UCD. He has a strong interest in social justice and law and researches refugee and migration law, uh, welfare and housing law and human rights, and is also a coordinator of the Feminist Constitutions Project. I look forward to hear uh, 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 about that also. And th fourthly, uh, Owen Carolan, Professor Owen Carolan, uh, is Professor of Law at UCD and a Director of the UCD Centre uh, for Constitutional Studies. He is also the Principal Investigator uh, on the uh, ERC-funded Foundations of Institutional Authority Project and he'll be joining us online. So we have, uh, first of all, the speakers will address us. We then take uh, questions uh, from uh, uh, ourselves and from within the room here and then we go online for questions. Uh, so I first ask Jennifer to speak. Thank you Paul and thank you Jonathan for inviting me. Paul, do you, are you happy for me to speak from here or would you like me to stand up? I, I, I think it's okay for me from here if that's what you um, Okay, so again thanks to Jonathan for inviting me, thanks to Paul. The ideas here I'd go on from some new projects that I'm undertaking with Dr. Joanne McAvoy, University of Aberdeen, Dr. George Walsh, and UCD and colleagues. And there's more details of these projects on the IBIS website. Um, I'm going in particular on an article that all three of us have written and that is in press in Irish Studies and International Affairs. And I'd like to acknowledge the Department of Foreign Affairs Reconciliation Fund for their funding of our Multiple Voices and Constitutional Debate Project, and the IRC, Irish Research Council, for their funding of my new project on negotiating difference. So, what are we talking about when we talk about constitutions? Constitutions are the foundational principles of governance. They move beyond the concerns of current politics to give a framework for political contest. And there's a general and compelling argument that, as founding principles of political procedure, constitutions are to be kept clear of the particularist group interests and antagonistic identities that populate political debate and political bargaining. Otherwise, they lose their authority to moderate ongoing political conflicts. This argument is made most clearly in the work of Hannah Arendt, for event politics and constitutions are the sphere of creative action, freedom, and plural communication, not of interest or identity. Now, of course, one set of constitutional questions isn't easily divorced from issues of interest and identity. <coughs> state boundaries and state sovereignty are central issues for constitution making. They define which state is in control over the given territory and which people, which demos, is to decide on its procedures. They affect who makes decisions, how group alliances are formed, what demographic patterns result in matter, and which material resources, whether it's oil or river, will be at hand. Boundary change thus immediately affects particular group interests, who stands to become a minority or majority with new alliances with boundary change, who stands to win influence and who to lose it. But of course sovereignty, boundaries and boundary change also impact more general interests. They affect general socio-economic interests, economies of scale, resource complementarity, as Andreas Wimmer points out, they incentivize group formation and solidarity, either in oppositional form or in more permeable forms. Territorial politics, as the US founding fathers were aware, territorial politics, as the US founding fathers were aware, can create or prevent factionalism, um, defined by Madison as 
citizens who are united and actuated by some common impulse or passion or of interest adverse to the guts of other citizens or to the presumed and aggregate interests of the community. Now, we shouldn't get too worried about what is the community because conceptually, at least, it's possible to transnationalize the sphere of constitutional discussion and discuss which of a number of possible places and forms of state borders will lessen group antagonism, lessen group opposition, maximize democracy and autonomy, minimize conflict and authoritarianism, and allow the authority of fair procedures. That would indeed be creative, agenti in political discourse. And in this sense, constitutional debate in Ireland is an opportunity to look at public goods beyond any nationalist or unionist interest or identity, how to maximize democracy and autonomy, minimize oppositional corruptness and conflict, and allow for the authority of fair procedures across the island. And of course, the island was the unit, the main unit for such discussion in the Good Friday Agreement. It's all the more important after Brexit. And indeed, one might generalize the question across these islands. And thus, it's fascinating and welcome to have our, our Scottish, Welsh, and English and Gothic partners here. Now, of course, that's not the way the constitutional question in Ireland is normally taken. Rather, it's been a source of polarization, power play, and identity politics. Irish and British governments, all too aware of its polarizing potential, have attempted to avoid it altogether. When it's discussed, the agenda is carefully controlled. There's only two permitted choices in the Good Friday Agreement, a united Ireland or a united kingdom. Discussion such as there has been, has been largely dominated by issues of self-determination and right, identity, some issues of institutional design, whether United Ireland will be a unitary state or with continued autonomy or devolution for Northern Ireland. Now, of course, those are crucially important issues, but they also echo historical debates and may encourage a groupist response and group anxiety, especially among unionists. For many people, indeed, they're simply not very salient questions and they prefer to avoid them. The debates have so far failed to engage a majority of the population in either jurisdiction on this island, um, and especially those who are disengaged from traditional nationalisms and unionisms. If these people vote in a referendum, their votes will make the difference to the outcomes. If they remain detached, the outcomes will be less legitimate, less vibrant, arguably less viable. It's at this point that our recent research project and multiple voices in constitutional debates becomes relevant. And again, I'm happy to thank the Department of Foreign Affairs Reconciliation Fund for funding and the ongoing IRC project on negotiating constitutional discussion. Um, we set out in these projects to investigate what the disengaged, those that are disengaged from traditional political parties thought about the emerging constitutional debate in both parts of the island. Are they disengaged because they don't care about them? Or is it because they care too much, but about issues that are not now being prioritized? Surveys give us a snapshot of their views, but without the rationale or the assumptions underlying them, and without the chance to engage them in discussion. In recent projects, we interviewed and conducted focus groups with community groups whom we knew were disproportionately likely to be disengaged from these debates. Disadvantaged women, gender activists, young people, migrants in both parts of Ireland. We also interviewed politicians and altogether have engaged with about 70 people to date. Our method was highly participative. We asked what they thought about ongoing debates, did they participate, what prevented them from doing so, and how the discussions, constitutional discussions on their team might best proceed, and what issues should be included. The results were surprising. Those we talked to were disengaged from party politics, but not from the general constitutional issues. They were interested in debate, but whether North or South, Unionist or Nationalist background, they converged in wanting to change the agenda of debate. They were, were, one said, silenced by the traditional language of constitutionalism. 
they could no doubt participate if they wanted to, but they didn't want to, they told us. They wanted to speak from and to experience, to focus on what they called organic linkages, gender gods, bread and butter issues, not ideology. And surprisingly, this focus united our grassroots participants and a significant section of the politicians we also interviewed. They converged in their desire to remove what some people call the triggers of, of um, conflict, the discursive triggers of conflict, what they themselves called the knee-jerk responses. And they wanted to, to remove these triggers by beginning discussion with what they called experiential issues that arise, what they said, organically in social practice, not what they called ideological issues. And these words recurred. And our pleading, this wasn't simply a focus on particular interests as distinct from common values, but it was rather a focus on structured experience that links people across a range of social and political perspectives. The implication, particularly clear among the focus groups of border women, was that these pre-conversations would lead organically into a constitutional conversation. Our participants didn't produce, propose, they didn't propose to reduce the big issue to smaller ones, but rather they proposed to approach the big issue through smaller issues, thus bypassing knee-jerk responses, short-circuiting polarizing political meanings and countering identity politics with experiential politics. Now, some important questions remain unresolved. Three readings of their discussions are possible. The first places bread and butter issues as an alternative to constitutional discussion, a way of avoiding it. We don't actually think that's what, when you, when you read the interviews and folks put curtly, that's what they meant. Second reading, place these discussions as a key part of the process of constitutional deliberation, where the pre-conversation leads to a reformulated conversation about forms of governance. That leaves a big question how the two conversations are connected, and that's what we're talking about and researching in our present research. And the third possible reading is seeing um, what they're talking about as a key part of the outcome of constitutional debate with socio-economic rights provisions in the future constitution. I think this is part of what Dawn's going to discuss in a minute. But I want to end on a general note. I think we can see our participants' insistence on discursive shift as a form of resistance to the divisive identity politics which has become such a feature of the common current age globally. Their antidote is experiential politics, beginning at the local level and linking together localities through their own transversal networks. They have gender activist networks, they have women's networks, they have migrant networks. There are echoes here of those in the USA who see local democracy as an antidote to party polarization. We might go farther again and see the identity politics which our participants opposed as a function of the mutual disengagement of public and politicians of which Peter Mayer wrote. Even from a different angle, we can see it as um, an antidote to Arendt's feared privatization of the public realm. Of course, it's also supposed to be an antidote against the weaponizing of the language of politics and the social media. Our participants counterpose to this the language and politics of experience. And thinking about this, it's indeed a radical approach. It demands new processes of dialogue between local actors, policy makers, and politicians, so that everyday political norms can be informed by and inform wider decisions and processes in institutionalizing such constitutional dialogues. Deliberative democracy is the beginning, but far from the full answer. We need mechanisms by which issues can be redefined and new linkages created between grassroots, deliberation, and party political constraints. The challenges are clear. Our new IRC project is experimenting with some of them with many deliberative cafes in local areas over a three-hour period linked together 
by women's and, and youth transversal networks. So please um, keep your eyes out. You'll all be invited to our conference on the 27th, 28th of June, um, somewhere in Dublin. To conclude, our research suggests that more participation in constitution making requires changing the agenda and process of debate. This is the benefit of leading to less polarization, less emphasis on zero-sum identity politics. It's not a distraction, or not necessarily a distraction from properly constitutional issues, but can give a better angle on them, and it has significance for policy. Any formal process of constitutional deliberation should provide opportunities for the public to help set the agenda for that deliberation and discussion. And Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll move directly to Dawn, Dr. Dawn Walsh. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and thank you, Jennifer. So I think that your contribution leads uh, quite naturally onto mine. So again, my contribution is drawn from this article that myself and Jennifer have written with Joanne McAvoy from Aberdeen, which as Jennifer noted is in press currently, so please do keep an eye out. And so the article was so large that it really um, had enough in it to kind of, for both of us to draw on it to um, inform our contributions today. Um, and so I'm kind of taking up that third point that Jennifer made in terms of, so we had these focus groups and interviews and these so-called bread and butter, butter issues that kind of directly relate to socioeconomic rights were the issues that our participants were really passionate about and wanted to form the, or the, the agenda um, for discussion on constitutional futures. Um, so what I want to do today is to talk a little bit about what it looks like or what it might look like if we were to constitutionalise socioeconomic rights um, after any constitutional change on this island. So what I want to do first is to have a little bit of a look and see what is the current position both in Northern Ireland and in the Republic in relation to claims about socioeconomic rights and to highlight a very kind of different experience um, on these two parts of the island and how this might lead to contestation and uh, requires discussion if it is to be part of uh, potential constitutional change. Um, and then I want to do something a little bit odd and um, a little bit unusual um, and quite a step from my, from my normal research is I want to uh, take you on a very short journey of the South African and Indian constitutions. And um, so the second half of our paper is comparative um, and it looks at two different ways in which socioeconomic rights have been incorporated into constitutions and it looks at some of the strengths and the weaknesses um, of these approaches. And um, so there's often a lot of um, enthusiasm from certain quarters about constitutionalizing socioeconomic rights um, and kind of an assumption that this would lead to certain outcomes. But I think a look at these two cases suggests that maybe it's a little bit more complicated or complex um, than we might initially think. Um, so, so I might be trespassing a little bit into the legal scholar um, realm, but I'm sure that my colleagues um, will forgive me. Um, so the first thing to think about is to think about the fact that con so how socioeconomic rights claims have been dealt with on these on two parts of this island have been very different. And um, so the Good Friday Agreement actually provides for the harmonization of the human rights regimes on both parts of this island that has not come to pass. So it's one of the, one of the many of the parts of the Good Friday Agreement that have not been realized over the last 20 plus years. Um, now, in Northern Ireland, there's a strong history of making claims about socioeconomic rights. So this dates back to the civil rights claims, uh, the civil rights movement, and their claims about the need for fair housing policy. And when we've also seen um, claims around fair employment uh, rights um, that resulted in legislation in the 1980s. Um, what we also saw in the Good Friday Agreement was provisions for a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. And despite the work of, of many people, including colleagues, this Bill of Rights has not been adopted in Northern Ireland to date. And, but interestingly, despite the fact that the Bill of Rights hasn't been adopted, what we do see is that there's an awful lot of popular support for a Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland. So um, a survey carried out by uh, Colin Harvey and colleagues last year found that over 80% um, of people in Northern Ireland support the um, adoption of the Bill of Rights and that these rights will be legally enforceable. And then when you look at particular rights, you actually see even stronger support. So for example, um, you've got over 88% support for a right to education, 84% of support to, um, for a right to an adequate standard of living, 86% um, support for the right to uh, 
to food. So you see that there is um, substantial support in Northern Ireland for um, legally enforceable rights around these socioeconomic issues. And then I think what's profoundly interesting as well for the debate is that this support reaches across different sectors of society. So the support is equal among men and women, um, among different age groups, um, and among different social classes. Um, and also what's very notable is that the support is also um, across the divide between those who identify as nationalist and those who identify as unionist, um, as well as those who are Catholic and Protestant. And this might be surprising to some, as one of the kind of main barriers to the adoption of a Bill of Rights has been unionist uh, politicians' opposition. But we see if we look actually at ordinary people, that there is widespread uh, support for the principle of creating a Bill of Rights and including socioeconomic rights in an enforceable way in that Bill of Rights. Of course, there will be debate and there's disagreement as to what's an adequate standard around certain socioeconomic rights, about how exactly they would be enforceable, and then how, when they come into conflict with each other, that tension or that balance would be received um, or achieved. Um, but I think that one of the major achievements um, of the Good Friday Agreement and of the, the period post that agreement is that we can see that there is widespread support uh, for rights. Now, this kind of um, history of, of claims making around socioeconomic rights um, in Northern Ireland is in kind of sharp contrast to a more a stronger constitutional um, tradition in the Republic of Ireland. And so obviously it's a very different context with a written constitution um, which provides for, for rights. However, if you look at the Irish constitution, um, you can see very clearly the imprint of its very conservative and its Catholic origins. Um, and while there has been kind of growing claims that socioeconomic rights, so so-called second generation rights should be incorporated into the constitution and also minority claims that ter so-called third generation rights so gender and reproductive rights should also be included in the constitution as part of radical constitutional transformation um, and, and I guess that, that's the kind of transformation that, that gets me intellectually um, excited um, these have not yet come to pass um, and we actually have seen a number of steps over the last almost 10 years now where this has been on the political agenda so it actually occurred to me when I saw Aline that I recognised him from somewhere. And where I recognised him um, from was a previous life when as a, a doctoral student, I acted as a facilitator at the uh, Convention on the Constitution. And one of the topics the government had asked that convention back in 2014 to talk about was whether economic, social and cultural rights should be incorporated into the Irish Constitution. And Liam acted as an expert and um, making all of this complexity and um, very accessible for the citizens. Um, and on that weekend, the citizens actually did vote in favour of incorporating economic, social and cultural rights into the Irish Constitution. Um, now, it, it, it's important to note that that wasn't an overwhelming majority and that actually over 40% of them actually favoured um, delegating further discussion on the implications um, and the consequences of doing so to another body. And um, so while they did vote for doing it, they, they were kind of, um, a, a, they were aware of due to, to wonderful expert um, kind of uh, information that it wasn't something that was straightforward and perhaps that the ideas that they had come to that weekend with that this would solve our health and housing crises um, were maybe a little bit more complicated. And um, in 2017 and again last year in 2021, we've seen private members' bills debated in the Oireachtas about incorporating economic and social rights um, into the Irish constitution. But these bills have not progressed, unsurprisingly, given their nature as private members' bills. Um, so you can see that social uh, and economic rights are on the political agenda in Ireland. And as the housing crisis only sharpens um, and the COVID pandemic has highlighted the weaknesses um, and the disparity in access to healthcare and the problems with our health system, particularly housing and healthcare as socioeconomic rights is a very live political issue. That said, there has been a reluctance to incorporate substantial rights into the constitution. Um, and one of the kind of issues cited when this is brought up is the unforeseen consequences or the difficulties that arose from the Eighth Amendment um, to the Constitution. Um, and this is, so this is one of the reasons given um, for not including further substantial rights. But we also see kind of a great degree of judicial reluctance to becoming involved in adjudicating these kind of cases in Ireland. And so what we have had is rather than a constitutionalization of issues over socioeconomic rights, it, this has remained very much in the political realm um, as a battle between left and right. And so what we can see is 
You've seen very different approaches to and histories of socioeconomic rights on the two parts of these islands, um, unsurprising given the very different social and political contexts, but also the different legal um, and constitutional traditions. Um, however, given these different experiences, it's very likely that those ordinary citizens and those politicians from these two, the two parts of this island um, have very different perspectives and very different um, expectations in terms of what socioeconomic rights might look like on this island after potential constitutional change. So as a result, it's very important and um, that we engage in a discussion as to what that might actually look like so that we can all, so to speak, get on the same page. And it's also an important question as to whether judicial reluctance to becoming involved in adjudicating these issues would continue um, in a potential United Ireland. And because I think one of the issues is any potential United Ireland would need to provide strong reassurances to the unionist community that it would be able to protect minority rights and equality arguably better than a post-Brexit UK. And I would say that potentially the constitutionalization of additional rights would be a way to do this. Um, but whether this is feasible in light of judicial reluctance is another question. So having looked a little bit at this island, I'd now like to take you um, to sunnier climes uh, to South Africa and India. So why did we choose these, these two cases? They're um, definitely not on these islands and, and they're very different contexts. So we chose the South African case because in many ways this is a seminal case of constitutionalizing socioeconomic rights. Um, so it was one of the first uh, constitutions to include socioeconomic rights and does so in a very extensive way. So it includes of lots of um, rights and it includes them in a way that makes them uh, justicable or enforceable in the courts. And, and then we looked at India as an alternative model. So rather than including socioeconomic rights and as enforceable in the courts in the Indian constitution, they're included as directive principles of state policy. And so this is a really different model. Um, and in some ways this model, and I'll talk about it, comes closer to what we currently have in the Republic. But the implications and the consequences have been very different due to slightly different framing and radically different judicial interpretation. So chapter two of the South African constitution provides for a bill of rights that includes socioeconomic rights. So this includes a number of rights, including the right to property, housing, healthcare, food, water, social security, and education. Um, and these rights were included in the constitution in the context in which it was written. So the logic behind the inclusion of socioeconomic rights, even though it's by no means the norm at the time, was that the South African post-apartheid constitution should be transformative. And the justices themselves have noted this in judgments where they have relied on the inclusion of socioeconomic rights in the constitution to say that whatever the situation in the US or elsewhere, that their constitution is to transform South African society to try and change the legacy of racial discrimination and that the inclusion of socioeconomic rights is part of this program. However, even with this kind of quite lofty aim to constitutionalized socioeconomic rights as part of transforming society, the rights in the South African constitution are subject to a number of key qualifiers. So it is only access to these rights in a, um, a progressive realization, um, and it's only to be done so within uh, the available resources. Um, and also it is, there's only a requirement on the government to take reasonable legislative and other measures to ensure citizens have are able to um, avail of these rights. Now, these qualifications are not unusual. Um, you see very similar ones in the International Covenant and Social and Cultural Rights. Um, and then if we compare this kind of South African model of incorporating socioeconomic rights to the Indian constitution, um, as I said, so the Indian constitution um, incorporates socioeconomic rights as part of directive principles of state policy. Um, and we see these in part four of the Indian Constitution, and they're treated very differently than those fundamental rights that are in part three of the Constitution. So why, why did India go down this path of adopting uh, socioeconomic rights as directive principles of state policy rather than enforceable rights? And so this was a compromise position between those who felt these rights should be enforceable by the courts and those who felt they didn't have a place in the Constitution. So Article 37 of the Indian Constitution um, is very much a compromise. Um, and it, while it states that they are directive principles of state policy and are not 
enforceable through the courts. It also says that they're fundamental in the governance of the country and that it should be the duty of the state to apply these principles in making law. Um, and while you might say, well, this is actually in some ways quite similar to Article 45 of the Irish Constitution that similarly sets out kind of principles for social and economic um, policy, um, there's a few kind of key differences. So there, the Irish Constitution, the article states that this is general guidance and that they shall not be cognizable in the, any, under any court. Um, so while the, the kind of approach to include socioeconomic rights but to not make them directly enforceable is similar, um, how this has been interpreted perhaps because of the approach of the justices or because of the slightly different language um, in the two kind of countries has been very different. Um, so for example, the Indian courts have made direct reference to the need to respect the directive principles of state policy in a number of their decisions in terms of rights cases. Um, so one of the things they've done also is that they have incorporated a number of the socioeconomic rights and said that while these are not directly enforceable in and of themselves, they actually come under the right to life, which is a right that's directly enforceable in the Indian constitution. So rights such as the right to healthcare have actually become directly enforceable. The other interesting thing is that in the Indian case, we've actually seen the courts use these directive uh, principles of state policy to limit some fundamental rights um, in the Indian constitution because they say the achievement of these aims of state policy are key. So this shows us that while the approaches may initially seem um, to be similar in Ireland and India, that the consequences have been radically different. Um, if we turn back to South Africa, while it is a seminal case and there's extensive provisions for socioeconomic rights in the constitution, even if there are these um, key qualifiers, what we've seen is that the impact in South Africa in a number of key cases has not been as far reaching in terms of people being able to realise these rights as one might have expected. So I'm now going to try and pronounce um, some South African case, uh, legal cases, so please do forgive me. Um, but so, so a key case um, is called Grotheboom, and it's a, in this case the Constitutional Court rejected um, an argument put forward by a, a gentleman who was, on, uh, end, he had, was in end-stage kidney failure and was getting dialysis, and he claimed that under the right to access to healthcare that the hospital system should continue to provide him indefinitely with dialysis. Um, and the courts rejected his claim. Um, and one of the things they said in rejecting his claim is that um, the courts would be slow um, to interfere with rational decisions taken in good faith by political organs and medical authorities whose responsibility it is to deal with such matters. So we actually see some more of the judicial reluctance and um, that really um, is more present in Ireland. And similarly, in another case, which was taken um, by residents um, of a township about the introduction of a uh, charging for water through water meters, and um, the court uh, outlined that it was not the place of the court to outline how much water individual uh, citizens should have access to, and that this again was a decision to be made by the government and that the court would not intervene. Um, so, it's, it's, so we see in these two cases that you might expect because the right to water and the right to healthcare are directly enforceable in the South African constitution, you might have expected that the, the, the courts um, would be more interventionist in allowing people um, to realise these rights through the courts, but that was not the case. Now that's not to say that the inclusion of socioeconomic rights in the South African constitution has never or, or doesn't result in some cases um, in access um, to, to services to allow for the realisation of these rights. So there's another case in which um, the, the, treatment, the treatment action campaign case in which there was a case which claimed that the state was failing in its um, duty to ensure that uh, citizens had access to healthcare because it wasn't making uh, nev nevaprine, which is a new was at the time a new antiviral drug that prevented the transmission of HIV from mother uh, to, to baby, and that it wasn't making this available. And the courts found that it, and, and ordered that it should make this available. Um, and in that judgment, it actually outlined that because the mothers who had HIV and were at risk of passing this on to their newborn babies were already attending health clinic and already getting at health services. It said that it wouldn't actually take that much additional resources to ensure that they were given this drug and that therefore it was a reasonable uh, measure that the government should take. Um, 
So what we have, have seen um, in South Africa, according to some scholars, is a kind of flexible approach and an administrative approach. So they really are looking at whether the state, what the state is doing is reasonable. So they're falling back on this kind of, has the state taken reasonable legislative or other action um, in order to ensure that people are able to realize these rights. And um, however, this flexible approach uh, means that some rights are not being realized, but it also means that implementation is often hard to track. So the kind of court orders that are kind of um, general or a little bit vague that often come from these court cases can be difficult um, to be tracked um, in true implementation and monitoring, um, and implementation is often uh, radically delayed. And um, so, as I said, the, the approach in the Indian Constitution looks like Article 45 in the Irish Constitution, um, but the inclusion of Article 45 has been much more limited. So we look even just at um, rights in the Irish Constitution. What we have seen is like since the 1970s and 1980s that the courts have been um, increasingly reluctant to recognise unenumerated rights in the Constitution, um, and this includes socioeconomic rights. So, for example, in the case TD versus the Minister for Education, um, we can see this playing out. Now, this would have required the courts to um, rule that an unenumerated, so a right that was not specified in the Constitution, a socioeconomic right, and that citizens had this right. So how the Irish courts would treat actually included socioeconomic rights is still a question. So we do have judicial reluctance, um, but at the moment they're given essentially a way out because these rights aren't in the Constitution. Um, so, but there is a concern not only within the judiciary, but also in, in some other circles, that the court shouldn't have an active role in making policy. And that by enshrining socioeconomic rights, you're essentially tying the hands of the legitimately elected government of the state in making social policy and in deciding how to spend um, the, the, the state coffers, essentially. So we need to think if we were to include the enshrinement of socioeconomic rights in the Irish constitution as part of constitutional change and what would be the response from the judiciary and what is our response to those, to those allegations that perhaps this would be overly burdensome um, in terms of limiting the elected government. Um, so we, we've seen that there are deep differences in terms of how socioeconomic rights have been um, dealt with on the two parts of this island. I've also kind of briefly shown you that there are two different ways in which socioeconomic rights can be enshrined in a constitution, either in a very directly enforceable way or in this kind of directive uh, principles of state policy. But I've also shown you that the consequences of these two models in reality may not be what one expects when they choose them. And so I think there is, there is a lot um, for us to consider and to discuss in terms of whether these socioeconomic rights um, which kind of follow directly on from the bread and butter issues that our respondents talked about in our research, how they can be included um, as part of constitutional change and how they might um, be included in a constitution as an end point of constitutional change. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dawn. It's a very good point at which to uh, make the transfer to the next two speakers, Dr. Liam Thornton first, on this question of the realisation, the realisability of rights uh, through legal processes. Yeah. Thanks, Jonathan, for inviting us. Feminist constitutions, um, and as you'll see, feminist constitutions for Northern slash Ireland, is a project between um, um, Mairead Enright, Aoife O'Donoghue, Catherine O'Rourke and myself, sending solidarity to Mairead, Aoife and Catherine who are on strike. Um, and, and we've all contributed pre-strike to these notes I'm about and, and presentation I'm about to deliver. I suppose the fashionable nature of speaking about constitutions, the fact that um, the impact of Brexit is currently the reason we are speaking about constitutions, as Houghton and O'Donoghue remind us, uh, let's not give constituent moments to, too much um, uh, not too much thought, but let's not expect too much from such constituent moments. They will replace the myth-making which goes into all constitutions, be as legal documents, or as Dawn has just said, you know, potentially political documents, because constitutions, as we, as some of us would argue, they're policy manifestos, they're archival documents, they're fulcrums um, of state offices, attorney general, the slightly, some would say, boring aspects, but 
at times extraordinarily essential aspects of state function, functioning, as well as, as Professor Todd had mentioned, constituent power. Who are the people? Um, constitutions are value-laden. They are never value-free. Um, yes, they structure fundamental uh, legal and uh, political um, aims or supposed aims of society, but usually supposed aims and functions of those who have power. Constitutions can act as transformative. That transformation, as we've just <laughs> so eloquently heard, it can often be very unrealized. So the feminist constitutional project, we start our basis, there is no such thing as one feminist constitution, just as there's no such thing as one constitution. Within this project, space is being left for contestation. There will be no end product, there will be an end product as a book, go buy it. Um, we first have to write it. Um, but there will be alternatives to how we think about, we write, we speak constitutions. So feminist con the, the aims of FemCon, as we call it, are to look at new experimental and scholarly, scholarly spaces to explore theoretical and also what we're doing right now is methodological foundations for feminist constitutional design and drafting. And yes, we do want to produce feminist constitutional texts, and that text is plural. What we may have as a feminist constitutional text may be extraordinarily different to what others, and it was interesting to hear about your experiments, um, uh, 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 about kind of, you know, what people might want, and, and from the very brief, I suppose, kind of a proof of concept workshop we did, socioeconomic rights, the bread and butter issues is what have so far featured. Um, so this, we want feminist constitution to be a, 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 a practical theoretical pro project. And while those involved in the project, including ourselves, may have a view and in see, indeed seek to include that view within whatever a feminist constitution is, the unification question or not is not something of fundamental concern there will be all alternate drafts of constitutions which will have some form of reunified Ireland, some form of federal Ireland, or some form of Ireland somewhat maintaining the same constitutional strictures. <clears throat> we want to know, are there any elements of fun uh, 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 fundamental, mandatory to feminist constitutional design? And we're not starting off from a blank slate here. We have decades of, um, of expertise on what is feminism. Feminism is not just the woman question, as so many others see, uh, as so many seek to um, so seek to label it. It is a way and means of doing something and coming to a potential end product, but which and which might scare the lawyers, recognizing the contestation and recognizing there may not be certainty at the end. We're interested in deliberative approaches, not that expert approach to what a constitution is, which lawyers, politicize, and everyone in between. Um, the constitution is that which is lived, which I think has come across clearly from the previous two contributions. So how has that lived constitution, how was that reflective of feminist deliberative approaches? And we can see with the marriage equality referendum and the abortion referenda, not just the most recent one, how the lived experience of, uh, of living under the thumb of a constitution can be felt by so many. And speaking about negotiation and compromise when feminist spaces for constitutional design, that might be a tricky issue to navigate because there will, but, but, but we think by, uh, as I'm sure, as I speak about uh, towards the end, that once there is some agreed uh, approaches as to that a constitutional, a constitutional provision, a document can be feminist even if there may be several iterations of those documents, at times wholly conflicting. 
What place for lawyers, legal culture, and education? None. No, that's not correct. Um, uh, but um, despite my slightly snide remark, we do have to be very cautious. The Constitution is not just for lawyers, as it is at the moment. It is not the plaything of the well-heeled and the non-reflective judiciary whom inhabit and who are the ones who reject economic, social uh, rights, who can interpret lots of rights into the Constitution, but not so much for poor people. Um, where does inspiration and evidence come from feminist constitutions? And that's something that, again, feminist legal studies, but also broader feminist literature provide us with some indication it is lived experience. It is the ability to communicate effects of how not necessarily just law, because constitutions do not kind of maintain as such the co constant political social order, while also kind of trying to potentially dissenter constitutions that would feature so much within, within so much uh, literature. And what's interesting about this project is that we are within Ireland, where we have a codified constitution, Northern Ireland, where it's an uncodified constitution, and, and we can fight about whether we should even call it that, but, but that there are currently different constitutional versions of constitutionalities within both jurisdictions. And member passed. Acknowledging past, yet not letting it be the guiding uh, principle towards the future, and we see that within, China, you know, within Spain, how how, how how constitutional pasts very much inhibit and smother societal, ongoing societal um, dis discourses and engagements. We do want some plausible, some credible, concrete contributions about what constitutional reform, constitutional change from a feminist perspective can deliver. <clears throat> what can writing constitutionals from scratch, a lot of the very fascinating citizen assembly, constitutional convention, and, and currently the Ch uh, Chilean constitutional uh, convention that are uh, ongoing, um, and the most interesting, I think, in, in terms of this project, how do we write a new constitutional text from scratch that is not inhibited and that uses legal imagination, and not only legal imagination, but personal imagination, to look towards what future potentials could be? We've had a proof of work, a proof of concept workshop, looking at the woman in the home provision of the Irish Constitution. And in, and, and we did make a submission to the Citizens' Assembly, not saying this is how Article 41.2 should either be abolished or changed, but actually there are multiple ways in which Article 41.2 can be talking, uh, spoken about and can be written about, which is care, the value of care within society, the value of state obligation to those who care. And there were several housing also in, came up within an article that you may that certainly I would not maybe have immediately thought could be rewritten in that way, and that this was done by generally non lawyers. No, that's not to say the the the, the proof concept workshop we we did find, and maybe just speaking for myself here, is that the participants constantly attempted to get reassurance of what would judges do, what would judges do. Because Article 41.2, in my loyalty analysis, is constitutional fluff. But why haven't judges utilized? Because there have been potentials to utilize that to provide positive obligations upon the states to value the work of mothers in the home, and we can disagree with, with its wording, and they've decided not to. So kind of that issue of legal political culture, um, we've had four workshops. Uh, the evil lawyers did, did dominate those, those workshops, um, but also global feminist academics, including persons with experience of, uh, of enabling and, and debating constitutional change, 
um, those beyond law and artists, beyond thinking of constitution as text, how can we maybe think about the reality of a constitution? Can prose, can poetry, can dance movement feature as part of a, con not so much a constitutional text, but as a constitution? And we currently have um, uh, final, final version five at the moment. I'm sure I'll probably go up to about version 10, a dra or draft kind of design um, or uh, feminist constitutions, imagination, drafting, and designs article, which we we are hoping to get out for review very very shortly. And the one thing that we remind ourselves of in the project, but also something that uh, that we are reminded of, is that it cannot just be a project about human rights, fundamental rights, which at times can be, in particular because of just the expertise established within feminist legal studies, rights often is the focus because it is the most immediate in uh, thing necessitated in order to, uh, to respect um, individuals. But feminist constitutional and drafting a feminist constitution needs to be beyond rights, even though that may be a key focus for persons due to that lived experience under present constitutional frameworks on these islands. Um, and so, going back to what Professor Todd, Todd said, something that has come up significantly was that post-Westphalian state model. Can we speak about constitutions and a feminist constitution for the island of Ireland, both jurisdictions within Ireland, or whatever the the uh, framing shall be, um, you know, can we move past Westphalian models of state and also away from idealized citizens? Even the language of citizenship may now seem very alien uh, within constitutions. Um, the monumental pasts has, has been something that throughout kind of the workshops we've held have really did, did, did what is memorialized, what is mo monumentalized, where is the mention of the state architecture of confinement for women, working class boys and girls within state and in essence de facto state slash religious institutions. Um, acknowledging that law never will be, never is and never has been neutral just as those who make law, and that not necessarily is a bad thing, by the way, that's not necessarily a critique, but just simply bringing that to realization. Judges are not neutral in how they interpret the Constitution. Politicians are not neutral in how they legislate. That is the essence of law. Law is only as good as those whom we uh, uh, elect and, and who participate in society to change. Um, legal fictions, law in itself, can often be based on a legal fiction. So. We, we don't mind engaging with, with long-standing, but often ignored feminist approaches, speculative fiction, sci-fi fiction, utopias, magical thinking, because Theophement with delivery of season, everyone in the room is looking at me strangely now, that's a legal concept. It's just as magical as anything else that can be created. And given that judges seem to manage that concept, they can manage much more. Um, and there will be compromises. There is no one feminist constitution. It can guide in potentially a nation towards its dreams. Constitutions as experience, and just talking about the 37 constitution here, has been a nightmare for many, many, in particular women, over the last number of decades. So, we need to clarify our values. Something that we have been very conscious of is we're almost reluctant to speak about the other jurisdiction that we maybe not be, we are not used to, you know, in terms of speaking about the jurisdiction in the north of Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland, and, and even my phraseology there, I immediately kind of corrected and got anxious about who have I offended. Um, it, it, we need to kind of clarify and just discuss those issues as I'm now going red because I, 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 I fluffed up the name. Um, we're going to have a number of brainstorming events. We just want some indications. We have recently engaged with um, a number of non-governmental organizations um, who will at least have a contribution of 
uh, a financial contribution for giving us their time, which is very important to this project, that academic labour and activist labour deserves payment. Um, and, and what might those kind of constituencies bring from kind of uh, uh, migrant communities um, and, uh, and others who experience law, legalities, constitutions very differently? Um, participatory workshops with activists will also help us uncover and discover our lack of knowledge as to what might be pressing, what m we might need to be mindful of in at least proposing some form of, uh, of alternatives, of engaging and preparing those who may wish and may have to engage with com conversations on what constitutional futures will hold, preparing them to make interventions and to be, uh, to be strong in making those uh, interventions and to ensure that those interventions matter. Because ultimately, a constitution is not like legislation. A constitution can be written by anyone, which is a fundamental principle of this project. Thank you. So over to you, Owen, uh, on that note of, 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 of what the function of a constitution is. Thanks, everyone. And um, I say apologies, I can't be there today. I had knee surgery earlier in the week, so I'm still kind of mobility limited um, and may still be on various painkillers. So that's my excuse if I say anything <laughs> too controversial today. Um, um, thanks for the invitation to speak today. And uh, thanks for the panel. It's been really interesting. I'm conscious of time, so I won't take too long um, because I know there's probably a lot of questions. I was going to speak a little bit today just about the role of constitutions, the non-legal role, and I was going to talk in particular about the role of constitutions as a kind of grammar of disagreements that helps to maintain disputes within the system. But, but given the discussion that we've had I want, and, and some of the comments today, I want to move on a little bit, maybe talk a little bit about challenges and the challenges of constitutions and constitutional change. And there's been some really interesting papers that, that I like a lot. And I, and I think I'm going to be... In raising the challenge, it's not necessarily being a skeptic. It may seem skeptical um, and it may seem critical. But I think just from a legal point of view, to think about some of the practical problems and the challenges that are around changing constitutional cultures, building on constitutional cultures, and implementing constitutional change. So uh, constitutions function, as people have said, in many different ways, beyond law, beyond rules, beyond establishing institution structures. They're a symbol of who we are, who we want to be. They're a signal to citizens. They're a signal to state institutions like the judiciary, like government, as to how they should act and, and what they should, what values they should emphasize. And as I say, they're, they're, they're a way of articulating our disagreements and our disputes by having a common language that we can use. But they're also a source and a foundation of a culture, a constitutional culture, a body of norms and beliefs about our social systems, our relationships, and, and what we hold dear. And... The project that I'm that I'm working on separately is about I think what what you might call small C constitutionalism, that local organic understanding of and beliefs and values that I think lawyers and, and political scientists would recognise as constitutionalism, but that individual citizens may not recognise that themselves. But beliefs about identity, beliefs about values, beliefs about narratives, national narratives, unionist narratives, whatever they may be, beliefs about citizenship. Um, I know Liam touched there on the notion of whether citizenship is essential to constitutions. I mean, I think certainly in a traditional sense it is, because there's a sense of what the state stands for and what it means to be part of the state. Um, and even for most citizens who I think it's always difficult for academics, who have a kind of rational disinterest in the nuances of law and politics, people who say, I don't know anything about law, I don't know about politics, I don't know about constitutions. They do, in fact, when you speak to them, that rational disinterest is not at the expense of holding what are recognizably constitutional views about the state about the origin stories about the stage of what the values it stands for and what it should achieve. I mean, one of the most striking things you see in a practical sense in Ireland and elsewhere is, you know, the, these bodies and um, organisations and people who don't accept the state. Um, I mean, in Ireland, you have free men, um, sovereign citizen movements, and you see them in court sometimes, um, thinking the courts are corrupt, the judiciary are corrupt, everyone's corrupt, everyone's against them, and they're still waving the blue book around. They're still waving the constitution around and saying, but judge, does the constitution love and I think that speaks to even people who don't accept the legitimacy of the institutions of the state still sometimes have a belief in the, in the legitimacy of the constitutional system as they perceive it. And that's a recursive relationship. Um, constitutional culture is obviously a foundation for constitutional practices, but it's, but it's shaped by those practices. Um, there's lots of examples. 
problematic examples over the last 10 years of how political norms and language impact and legitimize kind of divergences from accepted constitutional cultures. And then with the political language change, that enables people to say things that wouldn't have been acceptable in the constitutional culture 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, but there's also that relationship as to how the, the text is implemented. Um, but there's also a relationship there between the text, the constitution, and how it's implemented. Um, sometimes it's, it can be protective um, of the society to say it's the constitution's fault, it's the text's fault, when in fact it was the institutions of the state that implemented that text, that took a view, that took a choice in relation to that state. If you look at the concept of family under the constitution, it's not defined. In the 1960s, the Supreme Court assumed it was the married family. That's been the case. The Supreme Court now are very clearly giving signals that they're going to change that and say it's not a married family. Um, there's always choices within the text. Um, and it's not simply the text, it's, it's how it's operated it's how it's and how people engage with it um, that dictates that culture. So I want to just very briefly think about some of the limits and the challenges of constitutionalism. Um, constitutional change is also a positive thing. People are very interested in, they talk about it a lot, it's, it can achieve a lot of good things. But what I want to talk about some of the, the, some of the potential pitfalls with it. The first and obvious one is imposed constitution. So, so the difficulties and the limits of an imposed constitution. What happens when you change a constitution and, and, and don't change the culture? Um, or the culture doesn't doesn't fit with that? Um, Hungary is arguably a good example of that. You know, If you look at Hungary in the 1990s, you had the liberal constitution. Um, a lot of constitutional academics and international academics were writing about how wonderful the Hungarian constitution was and decisions of the Hungarian Supreme Court. They were very right protective and saying it's great, you know, they're doing all these they're doing all these very interesting things. And yet it collapses almost immediately um, when someone comes to power and challenges it. Um, and there's an interesting some interesting anthropological work being done at the time that tells a story of an alternative constitutional understanding that was very widespread in the rural areas of Hungary that rejected that constitution that, and that favored a, a Catholic um, exclusionary version of Hungarian identity. And that that was what Orban drew on, and that legitimised Orban's movements. Um, you know, and that's and that's a story that that I think points to some of the difficulties and some of the challenges. There's a problem. So the second problem, I think, the second challenge is the problem of elitism and representation and constitutional change. Constitutional change processes, are just like constitutional texts, are never neutral. Um, and any form of change process necessarily represents certain viewpoints. Um, you know, even one that is based on citizen assemblies and citizen assemblies, who comes to the citizen assemblies, who's invited, who's likely to turn up. Um, you know, these are these are challenges for them. Um, ones that are run by academics, you know, as, as Liam said, you know, and I, I think recognise that in that in that discussion there. You know, even if you have global experts in kind of feminist feminist theory, you know, that, that has its own representation and and, and it's an exclu- it's been a voice that's been excluded for too long. But when you represent that, who else is not in the room? You know, and, and you can't get away from that, but it's just, it's, it's, it's an important point that by representing something, you're necessarily not representing something else and we're excluding other things. And um, that goes to, I think, to a third point, which is a larger point in a, and a difficult point that does, come, I think, come into it about constitutions. Constitutions are inherently exclusionary. When you tell a story of who you are, that necessarily tells a story of who you're not. Um, now, you can tell the story in different ways. It can be told in terms of values, and there's very positive ways you can exclude. You can say, we, we, we have inclusive values. Um, but traditionally, obviously, a lot of constitutions have told that story in, in a nationalist sense. Um, and one may not necessarily be more successful and more effective and more stable or better than the other. But by definition, when you define something, you exclude the things that are not part of that definition. Um, so the constitutional project is exclusionary. Um, and that... And that, I think, leads on to the fourth issue that I want to talk about, which is the, the problem of optimism, over-optimism, over-claiming for constitutions. And I want to talk a little bit here, I think, about Don very interesting paper um, on socioeconomic rights, because this is the a real, I mean, I think as obvious, this has been a long-running debate in Irish constitution law since the decision debate, and it's been long, many campaigning groups campaigning for socioeconomic rights and, and advancement of that. And... To some extent, I, like, while I have a lot of sympathies, I, I think it's worth thinking about the challenges of, of socioeconomic rights. Because um, rights are easy. It's the trade-offs that are hard. Um, when you confer rights on someone and rights on something, you necessarily confer privileges within the legal and the political system. That's the point of conferring rights on someone. But taking the step of conferring a right is okay. You have to think about what that's going to mean in practice. And if you think about it from the political point of view, who is most likely to assert those privileges within the political system? Certainly at present, um, from the work that I do on the practical side, what you see an awful lot are rights are articulated by those who are already privileged. So, you know, we 
I was involved in, you know, you have you have corporations asserting rights and going to government and government are considering policy and saying, you haven't considered our rights. We have a right to be consulted in this process. That causes delays, that causes engagement. Then you consulted in the process, that creates fair procedures issues because the government has to be able, arguably, to show that they've taken on board those views. Um, then you get to court and they say, well, we're, we're entitled to special protection, and special treatment. Then a proportionality doctrine that says minimal infringement, you know, which human rights academics are justifiably very, very um, keen on, suddenly is turned around as a status quo, a protection status quo, where the government are told you can't do this thing um, because you've interfered with the rights of someone who you might politically regard as already privileged and you could have excluded them from the process. So there's an issue around on the political side, the conferral of rights, because you have to think about who will assert them. And on the judicial side, there's a problem of practical impact. If, and it's similar to some extent. If you confer rights on someone, there's going to be beneficiaries and there's going to be losers. And who are the winners, who are the losers in that conferral? Um, when I'm discussing this with my students, there's a case that I think is always worth thinking about, which is a UK case in the healthcare area, because um, the Irish cases are contentious for other reasons. But it's a case in the mid-90s where a, ch- a father had gone to support on behalf of his very sick child who had a rare disease um, with a terminal disease and the child was likely to die very soon. It was an experimental treatment um, which offered a 5%, I think it was, or 6% chance of success, but it was very, very expensive. And he applied to the local NHS trust and they said, no, it's, it's, too, it's too expensive for the value, um, the value trade-off. And he went to court on that and Hyper found in his favour and he appealed in court of appeal. And the court of appeal essentially said, and I think it is a point that's worth considering, they said, obviously everyone would have sympathy for a father in that situation, but what we don't see as courts are the other people who that money is going to be taken from. So there's a healthcare budget. We don't see the other children or the other families who will not get something because this is paid for. Um, And that's an important structural point. People think a lot about the court system. But the court system is a binary system. It's a bilateral system. You see one person against one person else. You don't see the other people in the system. Now, that may be an argument for changing the system, but I think it's it's too easy to think about socioeconomic rights just in terms of there should be a right and someone can go to court and enforce it. Um, because if you think about it in those terms, you don't think about who's most likely to go to court. And certainly in the healthcare context in Ireland, the people that I see most often in court are, are articulate middle-class people um, articulating behalf of their families. Um, you don't see the underprivileged people who don't have access to lawyers and who don't have access. Um, so there's questions about who accesses the courts, who gets support, who gets the benefit, what information the courts have before them, what information they don't have before them. Um, and that, I think, it goes partly to you know, the reference that was made earlier on to judicial reluctance and adjudication. In fact, I think in Ireland, it's probably, probably strictly more, arguably more accurate to say it's a judicial reluctance on enforcement. Um, the courts are happy to look at these cases and they're happy to express views and they're, they're reasonably happy to tell the government they've got it wrong in an individual case and go back and do it again. But what they're reluctant to do is take the next step and say, we're going to make you, do, we're going to make you give this person whatever they're asking for. Um, and arguably, they see that and it, it, do, it does go to the legal culture, as Liam said, um, but arguably it's also linked to the institutional issues. Um, and I think if there's a conversation about enforcing socioeconomic rights and then having them, it needs to be part of a bigger conversation about the institutions and the structures um, and how that impacts on both the political and the legal process. Because if you don't do that, I think there's a bigger problem and it's a systemic problem with the loss of faith, a loss of faith in constitutional promises. Um, if you look at South Africa, one of the really fundamental cases, the group room case about housing, where they took the first step in saying you need to enforce housing and you need to get housing. The woman who took that case died in the same shack she took the case from. You know, if you look at the Central Eastern European countries, one of the big stories about the difficulties there was a systemic disappointment with the promise of the 1990s constitution. They were promised a post-communist, um, you know, wonderful system, and they ended up with kind of Western-style American privatization. And that led to a significant loss of faith in the constitution systems that were created there. Um, so that's a challenge, I think, when you're talking about constitutional change. It's good to be optimistic, but I think I think there's a risk in being over-optimistic and looking solely at text and not at system structures and how things are implemented and those difficult practical choices of that impact. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Owen. On to, to end on that note of realism about what constitutionalism can achieve is, is very salutary coming from uh, the, a lawyer. Uh, we have space now for questions. Uh, we have 
uh, people in the room here and uh, they will ask a question coming to the mics uh, that will allow them to be heard by the people online. And the people on, if you're tuning in online, if you want to ask a question, uh, you can do so via the YouTube chat function that's there. So we'll first ask uh, for, uh, for questions from the room. Uh, and I think this theme of, of, of law, and law and politics uh, has been really interesting through the, through the discussion. Perhaps these will... Uh, uh, so is, do we have questions here from the room? If, let, me, let me sort of toss this question back to you. Um, the, the, um, the research that you've done uh, uh, with focus groups uh, identifies a, a demand for, for change perhaps more for political change than constitutional change, and an, an antagonism to the language of constitutionalism, a, a, a willingness or a w desire to translate that into more experiential language. Uh, is this, is, in some case, in, I mean, is one conclusion we should draw from this discussion that the faith in constitutional change or constitutional moments may be misplaced, that actually the transformation that people are looking for is more political than constitutional? Um, that isn't the way I took the discussions, Paul. Um, they, they don't like the language, but they like the idea. So the question is how to get to the idea of changing power structures, changing the rules of the game, without talking about Irish unity, as one of them said. As soon as you say that, Jennifer, you know, needs, so, you know everybody starts to get angry. Mm -hmm. Um, and we don't even know what it means anymore, they say, because A, we haven't discussed it, and B, um, there's so much anger and fear around the concept. So they want to discuss it in language that's different from that. That's partially, I think, because the demos, um, unlike some other cases, um, who the people are is um, unclear and in contest. And so we have to find a way of discussing it that gets all the potential people in there to discuss what institutions might be best. Okay, sorry. Yeah, and I mean, I have very little to add to that, but just that why I would see this as constitutional change, not political change, is it's about change of the rules of the game of politics. And like while I focused on, on socioeconomic rights in my discussion, actually my, my own research tends to focus on the other aspect, which is how constitutions set out the institutions. How do you elect your TDs? how are differences between the judiciary and the legislator uh, resolved. So I think people want more than just kind of day-to-day -day political change. They want to change to the rules of the game. And I think that's what constitutional change can offer. So there's an opportunity here. If, there's a, if we're living through a constitutional moment, I, that is a moment of accelerated change, an, op an opportunity to change the agenda uh, and, and to... Uh, but if you change the agenda and if you concentrate only on constitution, and I go over to Owen here, um, uh, you're left with the realizability of, uh, of constitutional change through judiciaries, for example. Uh, so you may, you may find then this disenchantment uh, with constitutionalism arising from that misperception about the, way, the mechanism of change. So Owen and, and, uh, uh, and, um, and Liam perhaps might comment on that. The internet, the Yes, Owen. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. I mean, I think I think I think that's right. I mean, I, the one thing I would say is I think I think constitutional moments. I like the theory, and it it, it 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 certainly it's true that there are times of accelerated constitutional change. I mean, my own supposition is I think the process is is, is you can have short term accelerations, but there's a long term process. So you don't ever get I think a constitutional moment where everything changes just then. It either builds on something that's already been going on in the background, or it's a signal of something to come. I mean, I, you know, I, I think the Eighth Amendment, the repeal movement, is a really good example of that. Um, where I don't, I don't think that changed in 2018, 2019. You know, it, it changed over a period before that, where views were changing, the lived experience Lean referred to was becoming more more obvious, um, and a younger generation was growing up. Narratives were changing. You know, these things were all changing. I mean, housing is another good example. I mean. The debate in Ireland on whether we should have a right to housing in the Constitution um, is one that I think is, is an important one, but is also one that I think is already being overtaken by developments in legal and constitutional culture. I mean, 20 years ago, when I was started doing constitutional law, 
all you heard about was the importance of property rights and how property rights are very important and you couldn't infringe them. Um, the, even the judiciary themselves have already moved away from that and are already recognising interferences and, 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 and recognising the capacity of the state to interfere with property rights in a way they wouldn't have 20 years ago. Even the same individuals who 20 years ago were lawyers who you know, kind of would have had a view that as judges they were, have moved because they recognise that the culture has changed. The political culture has changed. The social culture has changed. So I, th- I, I don't think you can ever fully divorce them. Um, I think the risk with the constitutional moment is where sometimes if it, it gets ahead of the culture um, and it goes too far out of the culture, and that's arguably what happened in kind of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, but that was partly because, and this goes back to the point made about constitutional change and elitism, it's partly because they brought in people from outside to design their constitutions. So they brought in experts and academics largely from America um, to sort of say, like, tell us how to write a constitution, and they wrote a constitution which reflected what works or worked at the time in America um, and didn't reflect the culture on the ground, um, which I think goes back to what Dawn and Jennifer are saying. The important point, with however you're doing it, is to ensure that it matches and corresponds to what's actually going on on the ground and what the beliefs and views and values are of the people who that constitution is supposed to represent. Liam? Yeah. The issue of constitutions is bringing legal certainty when that is not what, at least at times they cannot do that, but also the emphasis within public but also political debate that we need legal certainty from whatever constitutional document. When uh, law, and, and I'd argue, and, and feel free to disagree with me, um, and constitutional structures are, uh, and interpretation are never as kind of certain it will all depend on the, you know, on the beholder and, and something and sl- slightly off, I hope I'm not going slightly off topic, but um, nothing prevents the Oireachtas, and, and apologies for going just Republic of Ireland focus for a moment, from protecting economic and social rights. Um, and one thing that, you know, and just bring Northern Ireland and, and Ireland in, there's a significant level of economic and social rights protection already. It's called the welfare state. It's called social welfare law or social security law, a bit more in, 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 in NI. Um, but it's the adequacy of that that is at times the key question. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm kind of getting, as I older, kind of Angela Davis, uh, Professor Angela Davis, you know, law, should you give it that much power? Probably not. Um, and, 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 and I do think kind of just... Oof, but, but, but also as lawyers, we have to say, well, actually, legal certainty doesn't have to be the prime aim of anything. There can be contestation, there can be confusion, there can be a lack of certainty as to how things will, will work out, how they'll be interpreted by the judges. Um, Jonathan, I think you have some questions from the audience. Yeah. I do. Um, and I've got a couple of questions that are both pertaining to... Um, issues around socioeconomic rights and the impact of constitutionalizing those rights. So Louis Lines, who's joining us from Denmark, um, is interested to hear the panel's or for, to hear more on the panel's thoughts on the unintended consequences of constitutionalizing socioeconomic rights and the potential impact um, that this might have on constitutional legitimacy, which we've already heard something about. And uh, Paul O'Dwyer has, has posed uh, a number of, of questions and comments. I think some we might come back to in later sessions. Um, but he's also interested in um, social and economic rights and the impact that putting social rights into a constitution. Um, his argument is that that has to have regards not only to political judgment, um, but to the likely future affordability of doing so, and I think he'd, he'd, you know, welcome kind of commentary from the panel on, on that. So two questions there from the chat, um, from those joining us online. Good. Anyone like to take up first question? Um, I'm happy to go first if nobody yes. else has a burning desire to. So, so the kind of taking the second question first, and um, I think there is always a question of affordability, and I think that was raised by Owen very clearly in that kind of case in terms of using a lot of NHS resources in that UK case for an experimental therapy versus 
how that those resources could be used um, otherwise. But what I would say is what I think is interesting is that you have to remember the context in which we're operating. We may have financial restraints, but Ireland is an extremely wealthy country, as is the UK. So I think the question of affordability for me is more a question of, of values uh, in terms of how much disparity in terms of access to things like housing and healthcare um, we want to, to provide for. And I think Liam has referred to that. I think constitutions are about values and they're about value judgments. So I don't think that there's a lack of uh, financial resources within the states. I think it's a question of who gets to control those resources and in whose kind of um, interest uh, they're used. Um, on the second, uh, on the first question, the unintended consequences and the impact on constitutional legitimacy. And I think that that is, you know, a very important thing to consider. And I think that's why we have to have these conversations. Um, so by their very nature, the unintended consequences are, I guess, the unknown unknowns. And um, so we don't know what, what they will look like. And I think it is important in terms of constitutional legitimacy. And I think that was a concern that was raised by citizens, if I remember back to 2014 at the Convention on the Constitution was that if you make these promises, and you already see them often in preambles of constitutions, these really lofty promises, um, but then there's no ability to realise them. So I think that there are some legal scholars that have talked about the kind of de, de facto de jure gap between what your constitution promises and what it provides. And the bigger that gap is, the kind of bigger the question about the legitimacy of the foundation of your state. So that is a fundamental question and something we have to consider. But how we think about things that we don't know. So how we think about the unintended is maybe something future studies uh, might be able to help us with. Jennifer. Um, just two things. First, about disenchantment with constitutional change. We have to feed in the disenchantment with the present, including the very dangerous disenchantment in Northern Ireland um, at the present. Um, among some unionists, even with the Good Friday Agreement itself. So there's the serious disenchantment at present. Um, I wonder about the consequences of constitutionalism um, because I think of this also in a Northern Ireland context where there isn't a written constitution and where perhaps Good Friday Agreement itself and things like equality legislation in Northern Ireland are quasi-constitutional. They um, trump other interests. They, um, at the same time, they don't require mega um, constitutional referenda to, to ultimately change. So I think when we're talking about possible united Ireland, we should keep the models of things like equality legislation, which gave people in Northern Ireland, I, I, I would argue, great um, confidence that rights can actually do something but these were guides that were legislated for in a particularly strong way. Just on a broader point, because um, constitutions, yes, and there are all those debates as regards the affordability, as regards economic and social rights. Yet, Civil Legal Aid Act, Special Educational Needs Act, Disability Acts, these are all acts of parliament which, you know, there's very clear processes and procedures to be followed, yet we can all probably identify fairly precise uh, where kind of the state does not meet its legislative obligations. So, I mean, it, it, this question of unintended consequences, I, I think, well, look, even when we have legislation that sets out the rights, it, depending, and going back to Owen's access to the courts, depending on how well healed you are so that you can access your rights, you may not be able to. It just becomes illusory, whether they're constitutional or legislative. And I might leave at that. Owen, is there anything you want to say? Yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, just just very briefly on that, on the affordability point, I, I agree with the points made. I mean, I, I think it, I know I've been speaking largely about the symbolic value of the constitution, the cultural value, and I think that is very important. On a purely technical, more legalistic affordability point, um, constitutionalizing and making something legal is an extraordinarily inefficient and expensive way to achieve an outcome. So, and I think this goes to Liam's point about kind of like the social welfare legislation, you're know, doing something through a properly functioning social welfare state um, or a proper administration is a far more effective and far more efficient way of doing something. I mean, who wins when things become constitutional and subject judicial education? Well, the lawyers win because they get paid for it. Um, and they're the ones who make the most money out of the process because, you know, 
And if you have individuals going through lawyers to vindicate rights to court, from a basic affordability point of view, leaving aside what the individual gets at the end of it, for the state, that's an extraordinarily expensive and inefficient way to do it. And so I think that's an important point just to think about think about in terms of when, when you're constitutionalizing, how is it going to be enforced? Because if it's going to be enforced through the courts, that's not a, that's not a, it's not a comprehensive way and it's not an effective way and it's not an efficient way. And um, on the legitimacy and the unintended consequence point, the one, one thing, it's not necessarily an unforeseen consequence or an intended consequence, but it may be an unarticulated consequence of some of these debates about social rights. And that's the question about unpopular winners. So people are going to win from constitutionalizing these rights. What about if those winners are people who are politically not popular? Because you know the role of the courts is not to make those judgments on who's popular and who's not popular. So you may end up in situations where it will lead in individual cases to people winning through the system who maybe the public don't want to win through the system. Um, and that's just something that I think is, is very discussed, but arguably has the most potential to impact on the public sense of legitimacy. Um, if people and the public see people they don't want to benefit, um, benefiting from the change, um, that argument may lead to the quickest loss of faith um, in the system. Jonathan, you have a question. Yeah, yeah um, uh, I, I, I've got. I'm mic'd, so I'm cheating. But um, uh, I have one. I suppose one question uh, for all of the panelists. One final question before we uh, our, our soup is, is rapidly getting cold. So um, I, I just wondered if each of the panelists could kind of give the one take home that they hope um, people take from. Um, their, their remarks, uh, their contribution to, to the panel, which I've really enjoyed, by the way, um, in terms of informing the current debate about constitutional change across these islands. What's the, the kind of one critical implication that you think your, um, your remarks or observations or analysis um, might make to those debates about constitutional reconfiguration across the islands? Jennifer. When you're talking about United Ireland, the United Kingdom, look at what, what and how it's going to lessen conflict, increase permeability, increase discussion, increase democracy and autonomy. The constitutional change isn't just about the border and that even if the border remains where it is, there's still an opportunity for profound constitutional change within those two constituencies in a way that, as Jennifer said, um, lessens conflict. Ever. Sorry, uh, deliberative, uh, sorry. deliberative approaches to drafting need to be maintained across constituencies and we need to involve those who do not see themselves wanting to engage with, with the question of constitutionalism. Yes. And Owen? Um, what well, Liam said, but also think about the systems and um, what happens after the what happens after the text. Uh, thank you very much. Look, we have we're drawing to a conclusion now. Our time time is up. Thank you very much. I think there's so many questions raised um, ab about what is involved in constitutionalism, what it connotes, what what it means to people. We've heard. Uh, uh, reports on the forthcoming research which uh, it will be accessible to uh, people who've attended and uh, really draws uh, directly on, on citizens, on focus groups uh, in a very rich way. And I think that uh, really opens this question up uh, in, in some of the ways we've heard described. And we've heard scepticism about constitutionalism and the opportunities and challenges that it poses. Uh, it's not a substitute for politics uh, and I think that's a, a very interesting um, lesson. Structures of power, structures of privilege, structures of equality come through. Legislation is still there and politics remains no matter what you do with constitutionalism. Uh, and we also have heard uh, that constitutionalism doesn't have to involve simply uh, the old polarities of unity or United Kingdom. There are many other issues running through uh, the politics uh, on the island uh, and between these islands uh, that we must take account of. So at that point, we'll take it, leave it uh, to our next session in an hour's time. Thank you.
so welcome back to this, our second panel of today's event. Um, so I'm going to be chairing this panel and we have four very distinguished speakers. So um, I'll just interview, introduce our speakers. Um, so starting on my far left, we have Professor Michael Keating. Michael is Professor Emeritus at the University of Aberdeen and a fellow and former director of the Centre on Constitutional Change at the University of Aber Aberdeen. His research encompasses nationalist, territorial and regional politics and his most recent monograph, State and Nation in the United Kingdom, The Fractured Union, was published last year by Oxford University Press. Um, next to Michael, we have uh, Dr. Corrie Brown-Swan. So Corrie is a lecturer in comparative politics at Queen's University Belfast. She's a fellow and former uh, deputy director of the Centre on Constitutional Change at the University of Edinburgh. She specialises in territorial politics, particularly in Scotland. Um, and next to Corrie, we have uh, Professor Carwin Jones. Carwin served as leader of Welsh Labour and First Minister of Wales from 2009 to 2018. He's a professor in law at Aberystwyth University and a leading thinker on the union and its reform. Um, and last but not least, we have just next to me, Sarah Creighton. Sarah is a lawyer, housing rights activist, writer and political commentator. She specialises in critical analysis of the state of the union and of unionism in Northern Ireland. Her writing has appeared in The Guardian, The Belfast Telegraph and on, Slugrow to, on the Slugro Tool blog, um, among others. And she contributes regularly to media in Northern Ireland and beyond. Um, and for those of you joining us, I should just reintroduce myself. I am, I'm Dawn Walsh. Um, I'm a lecturer here at University College Dublin and director of IBIS. Um, so without further delay, what our uh, speakers are going to talk to in this panel is that the aim of this discussion is to explore unionism as a way of conceiving of the constitutional future. The panel will seek to bring into dialogue different ways that union is conceived of and experienced um, on and across these islands and beyond, and its various overlapping and conflicted meanings. The emphasis will be on the future of the union and unionism, the kinds of constitutional futures imagined by and available to unionism, and the principles underpinning these. Um, so, Michael, if you'd like to go first. Thank you, and thank you, Jonathan, for organising this seminar and giving me the opportunity to come back to Dublin, which is always a great pleasure. Uh, I gather from the preceding sessions of this seminar that it's in order to plug your latest book, but Don has already <laughs> done that for me. So I'm going to make some remarks on this book, The State and Nation in the United Kingdom, The Fractured Union. Sorry, it was on your coat. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, is that okay now? Yeah. Uh, and published by Oxford University Press last year. Unfortunately, Oxford University Press like publishing books. They just don't like selling them. So it's an exorbitant <laughs> price. But if you've got access to a university or other library, you can get it as an, an e-book. Uh, and in this work, I would try to rethink what we mean by political union. It's a term that's thrown around a great deal and has come back into fashion, but there's very little analysis about what political union actually means and how it might differ from other forms of polity, not, not, not notably uh, a state, a nation state, whether federal or unity. And I got this down to a series of key elements, which in true rhyming form I call uh, the demos, the telos, the ethos, and then the sovereignty. Then my colleague Neil Walker says, you could have said nomos, and we would have had four rhyming words. But these are the, the, the key elements which might discriminate a nation state from a political union. The demos applies to the people. Who are the people? Who are the constituent people? Is there a single demos or multiple demoi? Telos is a story about the past, where we came from, a historical story, a myth, of course, that we tell ourselves, but also a shared vision of the future a shared vision of where we're going to in the future. The ethos is about shared values, the extent to which we have shared values, and sovereignty is about the ultimate locus of legitimate authority. And in a nation state, the ideotype nation state, if there ever was such a thing, these are all the same thing. These all coincide and they're uncontested. Whereas in a union, they're all contested, and they don't have to be unitary. Now, it's in this sense that the European Union is a union and is not and never will be a state. That's a complete misunderstanding, and much of the literature on the European Union thinks of it as a state-like formation. It's not. It's a union in which these things are continually contested, never resolved, but contested within a constitutional framework that allows these things to be debated, even when we don't have foundational agreement. 
Now, as we're all familiar, there is one interpretation of the United Kingdom that sees it in that way. And there's another interpretation of the United Kingdom, the Westminster Doctrine, who says, no, it's a, it's a unitary state, it's a nation state. Uh, and as recently as last year, the UK government issued a white paper on the internal market saying, after all, we're a unitary state. You know, has that actually resolved the matter? No further argument is needed. Uh, but this other interpretation sees the United Kingdom as a plurinational union. Uh, and of course, that played into the Brexit debate in a very important way, because Brexit is fundamentally based upon the premise that the United Kingdom is to an extraordinary degree a unitary nation state based upon the principle of parliamentary sovereignty and therefore any form of supranational political order or supremacy of law is impossible. It's just impossible. We're the only European country that actually takes it to that degree, but that is the logic of the Westminster Dicean kind of argument. Whereas if we see the UK as a plurinational union, then actually it's got an extremely good fit with the European Union. They fit together very well. They're the same kind of polity, which is fundamentally why Brexit plays out so differently across the various parts of the United Kingdom, because they reflect different understandings of the nature of political authority. If that's the way one can conceive of the United Kingdom uh, as uh, a union, it reorientates the way. It doesn't answer a lot of questions, but it changes the nature of the questions and reminds us of what kind of a polity we're dealing with. Now, as for unionisms, which Jonathan very cleverly puts inside these postmodern parentheses, you know, unions and so on, uh, he's right to do that because unionism is something different from union. And I, I'm half Irish and the other half is Scottish. But particularly on my Irish half, I, I bridle at the notion of union because it comes with so much historical baggage. All these terms do. So unionist, well, that's, that's, that's a bit much. Uh, and that's problematic for a, a, a lot of people who are happy with the notion of union, the concept of union, but unionist. But if we think about unionisms, if we can say, try and say what unionism has been, to some degree it's an ideology. Above all, it's a form of political practice. And it is polyvalent. It comes in multiple forms. So we know that being a unionist in Northern Ireland has a very different meaning to being a unionist in a Garden, conservative garden party in the home counties, as they like to call it, or being a Scottish unionist or being a Welsh unionist. These are very different things. But even within those nations, there are different conceptions of union and unionism. So I try and trace a number of these things. And this is not a taxonomy by saying you're this kind of unionist or that kind of unionist. It's just a way of, some people articulate these different forms of unionism all at the same time. In fact, most people do. But again, there are ideal types. So firstly, we can think of this assimilationist unionism, kind of Jacobin project. We are a single nation state. That's been important historically across these islands, especially on the left and especially in, in the Labour Party. Uh, and uh, with my colleague, Welsh colleague Barry Jones, I did a lot of work on this in the, in the 1980s. Uh, and that notion of assimilative unionism wasn't hegemonic on the left, but it was very important and probably quite dominant on the left. There's another form of unionism, which I call patriotic unionism. I, I didn't invent that term. I pick it up from debates in Ireland and in Scotland and, and later on in Wales, where the notion of union comes in. Which is to say that I'm a patriotic Scot or you're a patriotic Irishman or Welsh woman. That's our primary identity. But we express that identity through the union. Not a unitary, through, 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 uh, through union. That is very important, particularly uh, in, in the Scottish Conservative Party of old. That was a very important strand of thinking. And therefore, we become British, if we become British, in multiple different ways. There's no one way of being British. There are multiple ways of being British. And then there's a conditional, contractual form of unionism that is articulated in Northern Ireland, but also in, in Scotland. And it comes from, well, one can locate it in the covenanting tradition of, of post-Reformation Scotland, about the, we were in a contract with the, with, with the crown, uh, and we will only be loyalty to the king under certain conditions. But it also picks up uh, other notions going back to the Declaration of Arbroath, and that comes to Northern Ireland, of course, through Protestantism, through the notion of covenant, and the Ulster Covenant, and so on. 
that, that, that covenanting contractual notion says we will be loyal to the union under certain conditions, but it's conditional on you fulfilling those conditions. So we've seen that continues to be alive in Northern Ireland, and there's a bit of that in Scotland as well. And now that the Scottish Conservatives are beginning to beginning to recover their identity, even their voice, that's, that's being articulated increasingly in, in Scotland. Where we don't, we're not necessarily going along with the leadership of the Conservative Party, whoever they might be. Uh, so there are different ways of thinking of the nature of the union, and that politicians play around with these. It's not a single set of doctrines, play around with these in various different ways. But the one thing that unionisms would never concede of uh, really is the notion of parliamentary sovereignty at the end of the day. The sovereignty belongs in the institution of the monarch and in Parliament. And so we may think of ourselves as being, we may have multiple demi, uh, we have our own different histories, they come together. We had at one time the Whig narrative, which is an attempt to synthesize history. Uh, yes, we may have different visions about the future, um, but when it comes to sovereignty, that's the one thing that locks the whole thing together. Now, the doctrine of sovereignty is, in one sense, a very powerful doctrine, because it says we have all the trump cards. But at the same time, it's an utterly empty doctrine. It's a tautology, because it means Parliament is sovereign, because by virtue of its parliamentary sovereignty, it says it's sovereign. Ultimately, that's, that's what it boils down to. But as long as the mystique is there, as long as people believe in it, it becomes powerful. But when the mystique goes, when you lose it, it's got to fall back on something else, some other kind of justification. Once we're in a secular world, people no longer believe in the magic. And so this is what's happened in recent years in the United Kingdom, because unionism, historically, resisted not merely secession from the Union, obviously, but also the idea that you could have legislative devolution within uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, we, this, this was the big issue of British politics in the late 19th, early 20th century, notably in Ireland, but also echoes in Scotland and Wales. Unionism said, no, that's a line too far, because you would combine what we freely accept, namely multiple nations, with political authority, and that fatal combination is fatal to the Union. So ultimately, everything must come back to parliamentary sovereignty, right until the very end of the 20th century. And suddenly unionism say, well, it's okay to have subordinate legislatures. What, what was that all about? <laughs> what were those Gladstonian debates all about? What was that argument about in the 1970s? Because of course, um, and indeed, home rulers uh, always said, no, this is not separatism, uh, but unionists uh, didn't believe them. So once unionism make that key concession, you can have legislative devolution or some kind of federalism, it is possible. Unionism is then obliged to change itself, to reinvent itself. And then you get a, a, a neo-unionism. So what does unionism mean once you've conceded that principle, which is the one thing that united all the varieties of unionism across these islands? And they haven't found it. Unionism is, is in serious crisis because they haven't found that new synthesis. Uh, it's, it's there waiting to be found. I'm not saying it can't be found. Uh, uh, but, but, but what is the new story? And we've seen unionism then floundering uh, since devolution, and particularly, of course, since Brexit, but never to the point that the United Kingdom is going to break up because peripheral nationalisms themselves have their shortcomings. They've not articulated a clear counter narrative to this. So we have both sides in this argument losing out. So what do unionisms do? Uh, one thing they do is go back to the notion of unity of the demos. Uh, so in the face of Brexit, Theresa May says, the British people voted to leave. Now, what does that mean, the British people? What does that mean in Northern Ireland or in Scotland? It doesn't mean anything. It's an assertion of this notion of the British people, uh, which certainly has been mobilized in the, in, in the face of external threats in the past, in wars, of course, and, uh, but, but, but never domestically as a definition uh, that we are a single people. Uh, so that is asserted in the face of nation-building projects in the periphery, which have been rather successful in, in recent years. And then we get the, uh, the, the telos. Well, what is it all about? Now, 
This is partly, as usual, an argument about history, because all political arguments end up in arguments about history. Uh, we, we no longer believe the Whig narrative, so what are the alternative narratives? So we get these historiographical wars that you're getting in all plurinational states, but also about the future. And so we get constitutional reformers, mostly on the centre-left, but not exclusively, who say, well, let's have a constitutional convention, and then we'll all agree about the destination of the Constitution. We'll agree on the foundations of the Constitution. And I keep on saying, you have a constitutional convention, the only thing you'll agree on is that we don't agree. Because we never have had a shared foundation or a shared telos. And you don't need one for a union. If you need that one, then Europe wouldn't work, the UK wouldn't work. And so a lot of effort put into this founding moment, a new founding moment, the kind of constitution uh, and, and, and so on. And I say to them, well, look, you, know, you can't even get agreement between the two communities in Northern Ireland. How are you going to get agreement across these islands about the shared future? It's just, but you don't, you don't necessarily need it. And then ethos, what about values? We have this debate about British values, which keeps on coming back, uh, and uh, which nobody really understands. But these are the values that bind us together. Now, the problem is not just that these are universal values, because you can build national projects on universal values. The problem is those are exactly the same national values as their nationalist rivals, increasingly so. And this is true right across Europe, because of secularization, there's a convergence of values. And all the data we have from surveys in the United Kingdom shows that social and economic values have been converging. They've not been diverging. That's not why there's nationalism in Scotland at all. Uh, so what is all that? Both sides are trying to appropriate these values. And so, well, you've got the National Health Service. Now, that's, that's a British thing. Well, it just isn't anymore. Uh, or, or democracy and, and, and freedom and so on. Now, the fact that nationalism and unionism are sharing the same values doesn't mean they're on the way to agreeing. In fact, it makes agreement even worse because it's more difficult because that trying to appropriate exactly the same values. They're fighting on the same normative ground, uh, 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 which is more difficult than saying, well, we all have our own distinct cultures and we'll get on with living our lives differently. Uh, it's about the, lo the locus of social solidarity and welfare and important issues like that, the locus of democratic expression and democratic fulfillment. And, and that, that makes it an extremely difficult thing. And then we have sovereignty. Uh, the uh, doubling down on sovereignty, because it seems to have escaped unionism. Uh, how can we put it all back again? Well, we'll do it by assertions of sovereignty, but you just can't do that anymore because the spell has been broken. People just don't believe it anymore. Uh, and because these counter-assertions of, sometimes it's counter-sovereignty, sometimes it's assertion, no, no, sovereignty is not indivisible. Sovereignty is divided. That's how Europe works. You should have learnt that in 40 years of Europe, but you never did. Uh, so, 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 so doesn't work. It just becomes empty rhetoric. It becomes empty talk. And it sometimes underpins efforts at re-centralisation, but there's no way that the UK government is going to be able to run Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland in the way it didn't. It just doesn't have the logistical capacity to do it. Uh, so unionism is caught in those... Uh, traps. Well, now, wh where do we go from here? I hope that Carmen is going to um, take it up at this point because he, <laughs> he, has, he has many ideas. But, but I just want to finish with one, one, one comment. Uh, that they're, they're worrying about too much. They're worrying that you're going to lose universal values. You're not. We'll still have a national health service if Wales becomes independent. And they're worrying about the dissolution of effective ties amongst the people of these islands which is still extraordinarily strong and still, uh, still, still, still we, uh, will be there. So, so when I talk to you, Ines, I keep on reminding them this. You're, you're worrying, you're inventing problems for yourselves. You're approaching this from the wrong direction. And there's some echo within unionism of this. Some people really understand that. But what we're getting from the Westminster elites, I think, is really a doubling down on that old Westminster supremacy story, which just isn't going to work anymore. Thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> Um, and as Michael said, uh, Corey will take it from there. Oh, s sorry. I don't think it's me yet. Oh, sorry, I thought we had to work in the order of the mics. <laughs> but no, if, if I can go then, Sarah, no, I, I, said, I, said, I said that Carwin was going to take it. Up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so who would like to go next? We'll do it democratically. Um, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'll do it. I'll go on then. Go on then. All right. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, um, Gormagat, uh, Jonathan and uh, Jadich, to uh, Broner, Tommy, I'm Fulham Gael Gannis as far as I can go at the moment, learning learning Irish. But uh, I will say a little bit more in Welsh. When Bessel Marie Vogel actually gave him a heavy, a heavy Roy, a guy called Kevlay Roy, to back of Varen or Gumry, a heavy thing Lena, so that's like Gumry and Lena are in deb. I sit here somewhat uncomfortably as somebody who has been branded a unionist, which is not what I call myself, I have to say, uh, because it carries certain connotations, which I'll come to in a second. But I think it's hugely important to understand that the debate now has to move on from being quite a sterile debate between you are either a unionist or you are a nationalist. There are gradations uh, between the two positions that need to be looked at, and it's particularly true in Wales. The UK is a very odd state in the sense that it's multinational, we know that, but it's also probably the only state in Europe where if you ask people what their nationality is, they will not give you as their first answer the nationality of the state that they live in. Two thirds of people in Wales will say, well, I'm Welsh. That's my primary identity. I suspect it's even more so in Scotland and it's the same in England. Um, they wouldn't quibble with being identi with identifying as British as well, but that's not what their primary identity should be. If you ask me my nationality, I'm Welsh. That's the way I got, that's the answer I'd always give you, because that's, what I, that's the, what, what, I, what I feel. And Britain has moved on from what it was in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, you have a far greater assertion of Scottish and Welsh identity within Britain than was ever the case before. Uh, you know, for example, if you saw a Union Jack flying in Wales, you would assume it was the British Legion Club, or you would assume it was somebody who was a Conservative voter, because that's a, it's associated now with Conservative voters more than anything else. Uh, and identity has changed as a result. If you look at Wales, Wales should not exist. It should not exist. We were incorporated into the Kingdom of England in 1536 and left in 1967 to become part of Britain. Our language was banned at a time when everybody pretty much spoke it as their only language. Our legal system was abolished. The last courts that, we, that were separate went in 1830. Our currency disappeared in 1908. Uh, we had nothing. We had no trappings of statehood. We were never a state. We preferred to fight each other as warring principalities. There is a saying in the Welsh language, Galen Cymro, Eu Cymro, a Welshman's enemy is expressed in the masculine, is another Welshman. And that pretty much is true of Welsh history. And Wales should really have just been part of England and, and thought of as part of England. And it was for a long, long time. What really kept the flame of identity alive was the language, which was the majority language until 1911. Uh, which had 900,000 speakers in the 30s and has between 550 and 750,000 speakers now, depends how you count it. Uh, it was that language that kept uh, really alive a sense of Welsh identity and everything that came with it. The nonconformist chapels and preaching in Welsh that went with that, the uh, Welsh language media that existed particularly strongly in the 19th century. And really, Welsh identity has built on that. It then encompassed the English-speaking majority as they became, and now people don't make the distinction you know, as to what language you speak in terms of what your identity is. And yet, it was slow. In 1990, in 1979, first of all, we had a devolution referendum. It was rejected four to one. Uh, people asked me how I voted. I was 12, so I can't tell you. <laughs> 1999, we had another referendum. Just by 6,000 votes, people voted for a pretty weak assembly that looked more like a county council, if I'm honest, with very few powers, and it squeaked through. In 2011, we had another referendum for a primary lawmaking parliament, and it flew through by a mile, two to one. And that showed how much Wales had changed. In 1999, we had this assembly, couldn't make its own laws. Uh, it, had a, it didn't have a government, didn't have a cabinet. And then we find ourselves now in a country with a primary lawmaking parliament with tax varying powers which has come a long, long way in a, short space, far, in a short space of time. In fact, a greater journey in a shorter space of time than Scotland in many, many ways. But the debate in Wales has not polarised into independence or union. The reason why I wouldn't describe myself as a unionist, there are many reasons. I'm married to a North Belfast Catholic, and so a unionist has, a, you know, she sees a sash and a bowler hat when, when you talk about unionist. And unionism tends to be associated with a desire to remain within the UK no matter what, what it looks like and to accept the supremacy of the Westminster Parliament 
which is not something I do. I don't, I'm not a believer in parliamentary sovereignty anymore. Nationalist means you want an independent state. You want an independent Wales. Passport says, Cymru on it, Wales, and you have a seat at the, at the United Nations. Those, those are the two polarised uh, views. If you look at the opinion polls, but a quarter of the population is devo-sceptic, mainly older generation, 65 plus. A quarter of the population is pro-independence, between a quarter and a third, younger people. In fact, amongst younger people, 18 to 24, there's a bare majority for independence. So there's a huge difference in terms of the generations as to the approach to constitutional futures. But in the middle, you have probably the majority of people who are happy to look at something in between. Those people who want to see as much self-government as Wales can get without actually becoming an independent sovereign state. The question is, how do you satisfy the aims of those people? The first thing we have to avoid is to look at Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, completely separately, as if they weren't related at all. The problem, and Northern Ireland is different, you know, there's no question about that, but the problem with devolution from 99 onwards in the UK is that instead of looking at how the UK works as a whole, and what it means for England particularly, it's basically been a question of Westminster saying, how many powers can we lend to various groups of Celts in order to keep them quiet? That's it. And I use the word lend because parliamentary sovereignty dictates that those powers are lent because they can be legally taken back at any time. Politically, of course, far more difficult. Rather than thinking, how does this all work within the UK. And one of the phrases I've used in the past is that Brexit carries with it the seed of the UK's own destruction, largely because of the way the current UK government operates. We've just had uh, legislation, uh, the Internal Markets Act, that basically says we want the UK to be an internal market without barriers. Brilliant. Everyone agrees with that. No one wants to, we, we don't want barriers for Welsh lamb going into England. Of course we don't. But the arbiter of all this is the UK government, which is also the English government. There's a subsidy control bill, which is even worse, which, for example, gives Whitehall ministers the ability to prevent subsidy payments in Scotland and Wales, but, but in England, the reciprocal uh, power doesn't exist. The Welsh government can complain about a subsidy in England, tough luck. So basically, and the UK government will say, oh, but of course, we're the UK government. We can, you know, we, we can be fair across the whole of the UK. I don't believe that. One second. Uh, and that is one of the paradoxes that you've got the UK government and the English government being exactly the same thing. So how do we deal with this? To my mind, if the UK is going to work in the future, and there are, you know, there are, there are good things about the UK. The fact that there is a common tax base, we benefit from that in Wales. Uh, common border policy, the fact that the welfare state distributes money around in, a, in a quite a fair way. You know, there are advantages in the same ways for me. There were advantages of being a member of the EU as well. Mostly people didn't agree with me in Wales on that one. So there are advantages in being part of something bigger if you're a small nation. But that doesn't mean you have to be part of a unitary state. And that's where, to my mind, the UK has to change. One of the models that you could look at is, is to say, right, what we need really is to, is to say, look, England, Scotland, Wales, and I suppose Northern Ireland, they are sovereign. They decide whether they, whether they want to be part of a union. And if people decide to be part of that union, fine. Then we agree on the establishment of a union parliament that has defined powers, not a supreme parliament that can do what it wants. You know, the irony of the UK constitution is you have a parliament in Westminster that claims for itself the ultimate power to create laws, but is itself lawless, because it's not subject to any laws or, or the jurisdiction of the courts. And you say, there sits the Union Parliament. It deals with the issues that we think are best dealt with at that level. Defence being one example. And then we have symmetrical devolution to four parliaments, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Now, England's a difficult problem because it is so big, but you could say, well, within England, England could decide what devolution looks like within England. Uh, and where devolution goes, how much devolution, doesn't have to be symmetric, it's symmetrical in England, but at least then we know we have four entities with equivalent powers, legally, economically not, let's be honest, and then of course there is, there is an agreement to be part of something bigger where powers are given to that, uh, to that union parliament, uh, and everyone agrees that, 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 that those are the powers that, that should be dealt with there. That's one way of doing it. The biggest obstacle to all this is parliamentary sovereignty. 
uh, which, let's face it, has only existed since the 19th century and is the view of one man who said to the Westminster Parliament, I think you can do whatever you want. Surprise, surprise, they said, we agree. Of course we can do whatever we want. We're not subject to the rule of law. We're not subject to uh, any kind of restriction over what we can do. And so we have the situation now in the UK where there is a Supreme Parliament elected by a minority of the people that is not subject to the jurisdiction of any law or any court. That's not democracy, in my view. Now, how do you create the process to go about looking at constitutional change? At the moment, there isn't one. The current UK government isn't interested. It's just not, and it's, it, it just doesn't think that way. So it would be some time before um, such a process began. But I, the, the, the tragedy would be uh, if we were in a situation where the process of creating constitutional change in the UK only happened because there was a threat to the existence of the UK itself. It's too late at that point. It needs to be done now. The thinking needs to be done now. And in terms of my party, Welsh Labour, that is where we are. Uh, how, I say my party, I don't lead it anymore. Uh, but the current leader is, is, is much the same as mine. We are an autonomous party. We're not a unionist party. We're not a nationalist party. But we believe in seeking the greatest, the most appropriate amount of autonomy for Wales that is, that is possible. And the reason why Welsh Labour has been so successful uh, over the years is because we, knew, we saw what happened in Scotland, where, to my mind, Scottish Labour moved away from Scottish identity. And as a result of that, the SNP moved onto that ground, and people who were very Scottish but not in favour of independence moved towards being pro-independence. That, that, you know, that, that, there was an abandonment of the ground, to my mind. We never did that. We always took the view that you know, the vast majority, the red-shirted patriots, we call, we call them, the people who wear their, wear their Welsh shirts and the rugby and football internationals, very Welsh, but not in favour of independence. They are the people you have to appeal to. And even though as a party, we're a party that, that promotes social justice, not identity politics, we knew full well that if people didn't feel you shared their identity and outlook, they wouldn't listen to you when it came to um, the policies you wanted to put before them. And that's what we've done. Uh, and the result in Wales is that the debate on what the constitutional future of Wales is, is not polarised. You don't have people saying, right, Labour there, Plaid Cymru there, that's it. There is no common ground. That's not the way it is in Wales. You know, a substantial number of voters, Welsh Labour voters, would vote for independence. There are candidates who stood in the last election in May who openly backed independence, who are Welsh Labour candidates. So you don't have the same kind of polarisation as you've got now in Scotland. You, know, you don't have people in, in Scottish Labour saying, well, actually, we back independence. That's, just, that's gone. Uh, it was the case 20 years ago, but it's no longer the case now. And the debate in Wales is, I think, deeper because of it. And you know, the Welsh Government has been particularly proactive in putting forward proposals for constitutional change across the whole of the UK. Uh, and that's something certainly that I, I very, much, uh, very much welcome. So I hope I'll give you some idea of, uh, of where we are. And um, I'll just leave you with one thought. Arlene Foster could never understand why I would not support David Cameron at the meetings that we had of uh, the Council of Ministers. And I said, Arlene, look, there's one thing that winds me up is the fact you keep on referring to me and to Nicola as heads of regional administrations. We're national governments. And she just couldn't do that from her perspective. She just couldn't see that at all. Uh, and, you know, that... that it was a different way, a different way of looking at the world. But you know, doing nothing is not an option. Doing nothing will see fragmentation uh, and uh, losing a lot of the things that actually work very well across the UK state. Uh, and if action isn't taken pretty soon, I think we're in danger of seeing that fragmentation becoming real. Thanks. Sarah, I have you next. Excellent. So next up on my list is uh, Sarah. So if you'd like to go. Yes, Northern Ireland, it's time to, <laughs> time to get complicated. Um, where to start? Um, yes, I suppose everything about Wales and Scotland and everything, it's just Northern Ireland is just a complete kettle of fish, to put it lightly. Um, unionism in Northern Ireland is a completely different kettle of fish. Um, I suppose I'd start by saying, so I'm from East Belfast come from a Protestant family, Protestant Unionist family, Unionism in Northern Ireland. Um, so completely different from the rest of the UK because it is very much associated with a communal identity, has a long-standing history going back hundreds of years. 
it's associated with ethnic nationalist considerations. Um, I would call myself a unionist, um, pro-union, whatever you like to call it. Um, unionism in Northern Ireland is always kind of seen as the unruly child of, of the union, which isn't an entirely unfair association, but um, really unionism in Northern Ireland gets a bad rap, a bad rap um, again for some good reasons, but also for some very unfair reasons. Um, there's this kind of belief that you know Northern Ireland just followed Britain home one day like a stray cat, and mm -hmm. now you are stuck with us somewhere this big burden. <laughs> Where you know I think really the reason why people don't like unionism in Northern Ireland is because they don't like looking in a mirror, and the reason why they don't like confronting us unionism is because it would mean confronting history that um, people in this country are not really willing to confront, to be quite frank. Um, so there's quite a lot to talk about. Um, I may not cover everything because there is just so much. Northern Ireland is just this this whole kettle of fish. Really, um, I would say the unionism in Northern Ireland really isn't treated with the nuance it deserves. The same is also true of loyalism, which is also very different from unionism. Um, unionism in Northern Ireland has always had very different branches, different multitudes. Um, you know, you were saying about you know the sash and the voter hat. That is the very traditional view of unionism, and I don't want to diminish it. But that's not where I've, I come from. That's not how I was raised. Um, you know, my unionism doesn't come from James Craig and Edward Carson. <laughs> I have very strong views in both of those men, and they're not very good. Um, for me, the union is home. Um, I think that's really the easiest way to describe it. When you're in school, in primary school in Northern Ireland, you're taught an acronym for the six counties. And if you go to the Protestant school, you're taught the acronym F-A-T-L-A-D. And if you go to the Catholic school, they'll, you'll, they'll teach you um, fat dad. And you can figure out what the, what the difference is in that. Or you're not taught the six counties at all. <laughs> um, you know, you, you're taught the parts of the UK. You know, it's Northern Ireland, England, Scotland, and Wales, and that is your country. And that, you know, I was born in 1987, and that is basically, that, that was it. You know, there was no question in my mind that that was my country and, and the Republic was just this other place. Um, I didn't have, I didn't dislike it, didn't hate it, but it was just another part of the world really. Um, you know, the same is true of my family. Um, you know, my parent, my grandparents were very pro-union. My parents, um, I think more in the persuadable camp now, but very much during the Troubles were very pro-union. Their views are very complicated now. Um, coming back, you know, about unions not being nuanced. You know, my dad said to me, you know, during the Troubles, it was entirely logical for people to be pro-union because the South was this conservative Catholic country. It had no divorce, it had no condoms, and the provisional IRA said, well, well, we'll murder you and kill you and drag you into the United Ireland against your will. And that was why they were pro-union. And, you know, I, I was never taken to the 12th of July. You know, my, I have this, this memory of me when I was young. It was during the Drum Cree um, crisis, and there was a girl across the street from me, and her daddy was an orange man, and she said to me, oh, Sarah, we're one. And I repeated the same phrase to my mum, and she took me to one side and said to me, don't you ever say that again. So there's always been these multitudes between unionism. There's very much the Ulster nationalist uh, conception of unionism. And then there's also being unionism, which very much connects with wider British identity. And you were talking about, you know, different identities. You know, I would have no hesitation in saying that I'm British, but I'm also Irish. But, you know, to add to the complication, I'm also Northern Irish and I'm also an Ulster woman. So, you know, Protestants in Northern Ireland, we all have these, these multitudes of identities. Some people don't. Some people are just, they're British and that is it. Um, some people are Irish and unionists, you know, it, it's very, very complicated. So it's, um, it, yeah, it, it's a very, very complicated issue. Um, but for many people in Northern Ireland, the reason why they were unionists is because the union aligned with their identities and their values. So, you know, coming back to, you know, the troubles and where my parents were coming from, you know, they looked at the Labour Party, you know, my parents, we sat around the table, we discussed Blair and Brown and, and the Tories who we didn't like. And, you know, my parents would have looked at Britain, which had, you know, abortion rights and were very progressive thinking and they debated real issues. And that's what they would have associated themselves with. That's what they, they said. That was, that was where my values aligned with them. And I'm not saying that the union is a, is a liberal project, because, of course, that's a whole other conversation in itself. But, you know, the European Convention of Human Rights, the European Union, you know, the, the Labour, Labour Party, all, all the history of that, that's what they very much identified with. So in the past five years, I think... Brexit, the B word, the huge B word, you know, I voted remain, my dad voted leave, my brother voted leave, um, my dad's a bit of a socialist, so he's never liked the European Union, um, I don't think he thought they would win. Um, for me, I took one look at the people leading the leave campaign and thought, no, thank you. And I think what has happened with Brexit really is for, specifically for people from a Protestant Unionist background, it has disrupted everything they know and care about in the union from, from different points. So, you know, for people who voted Remain, Brexit was just like a shock, you know, and, and they were wrenched out of the European Union where their identity was pegged to. And 
that association with these very liberal progressive values and now they look at Boris Johnson and that's what they think when they say of the union. For a unionist who voted leave, and I think it's important to point out that the majority of unionists in Northern Ireland did vote leave, but the Remain would not have got a Remain vote without the votes of unionists, I think. Um, for them, you know, they voted leave for very different reasons. You know, I think the leave vote is much more nuanced um, than people give it credit for as well. But that hasn't worked out very well because obviously now Northern Ireland has the protocol um, and people feel like they didn't get the Brexit that they voted for. And then the Remain side, they think like they're lumbered with this now and, and the, you know, the long term consequences of Brexit, you know, I, I think are going to be with us for a very, very long time, essentially. Um, and I think for many people, Brexit has made them think about the union for the first time. You know, they've, they've started to think, oh, hang on a minute, what, what do I want my country to look like? What do, um, what do I want to see in my future? And because there's no violence now, because you don't have, the bombs aren't going off, people aren't being shot, because obviously people in Northern Ireland were killed for being unionists, for being Protestant, and were killed for many other reasons as well, obviously. Um, they don't have that baggage with them, and particularly for my generation who grew up after the Good Friday Agreement, they don't have that baggage as well, and they're thinking very, very differently about um, about the union and their unionism. And in fact, you know, for many people, unionism um, is very backwards. It's seen as like this old man's ideology. You know, um, when I started doing commentary work and someone described me as a unionist, my mum was like, "What, really?" You know, and I said, because in her mind, unionist is is was Ian Paisley. It was David Trimble. It was it was all all that stuff that she just could not stand. Um, but for me, it's something very different. For me, as I said, it, it, it's just, I, I think Northern Ireland belongs in the United Kingdom. I think that's where we're best placed. It's where I feel my sense, I feel a sense of belonging, you know, and, and, and you know, don't disrespect the public of Ireland, but I don't feel any, I don't see my, my identity and my values reflected in the state, and that's not a criticism, but that, that's the reality. Um, so it's, we're in a very, very difficult place at the moment, really, um, and I think with Brexit and the protocol, the, the problem at the moment for many people is political unionism itself. So very often make the distinction between the DUP and the Ulster Unionists and ordinary unionist Protestant people. And there's always been this divergence, even during the troubles when, when the, the, the Ulster Unionists and the DUP were doing very well. You know, people had very complicated reasons for voting for those parties and for, for supporting them and for supporting the union at that time. And now, really, with, with Brexit, and you know, a friend of mine described like, like the fall in the night. She said it was like a jolt in, the, in her sleep. She went, oh my goodness, what is this? Political unionism is seen as toxic, it is seen as backwards, it is seen as conservative. And again, that's not always unfair because there are unionist politicians that are much more progressive. You know, I always say, you know, David Irvine in the PUP was pro-choice before, before Sinn Féin were pro-choice, you know. Um, and now, really, for many people, for many young people, I think, and when you look at the opinion polls, you know, there's quite a significant majority of young people are, would be open to United Ireland and would vote for it. Um, they look at the DUP, and they think, oh, no, no, thank you. And um, they think, you know, I, I'm not really sure that I want this. Now, Northern Ireland's had self-government for many, many years. Obviously, it's had devolution much longer than any other part of the United Kingdom. But for them, it's, it's I've, I said this in an article I wrote for Sogo Rotilla a long time ago, when unionists come to sell the union, they're not only going to have to sell the union, they have to sell Northern Ireland itself. And for many people, that is the problem. And that is the problem that unionism is in at this point in time. You know, you've got Geoffrey Donaldson and Arling Foster and who made this catastrophic mistake. And I, and I don't think it was in backing Brexit because again, as I said, I, I'm sympathetic to that, but it was the, the Brexit that they backed, the fact that they pegged themselves to these Tories who didn't give a damn about unionists and didn't give a damn about Northern Ireland. And you know, people often think that people in Northern Ireland don't know. <laughs> they always come out with a statement like, you know that they don't care about you. We know, like people don't care. You know, it's not about validation from England that people care about. But they've made this catastrophic mistake. I think they know they've made a mistake. And now we're lumbered with the protocol, which most people aren't that enthusiastic about. But most people are willing to accept it, I think, and are willing to kind of work with it. And it needs mitigated, it needs changed. And because um, some people within the DUP really have really think they had this idea that if, if Northern Ireland all left together and we all left in the same terms, that would strengthen unionism. It has actually weakened it because unionism has these multitudes and it fights among itself. And, and you know, you're we have the term in Northern Ireland, Lundy, which I don't think exists in other part of the United Kingdom, which is the word, it was a word for Protestant trader, but it is also used for unionist, of the unionist trader. And if you do not conform, if you do not get into line, then you know, you're, you're a bad unionist, essentially. And because one section of unionism has dominated for so long, and it's the conservative side of unionism, um, it, it is unable to grapple with these nuances and multitudes that are coming through. Um, I, I suppose the big, big issue at the moment that people are talking about is the middle ground. So in Northern Ireland, we have you know, the unionists and the nationalists, and then we have this big group of the middle called the neithers. 
who are a very complicated bunch, actually, and, and I often rant about this to Jonathan. <laughs> They're often pro pro portrayed as this big liberal progressive block. It's not, it's not um, that straightforward. Um, they're made up of people with very different identities who vote middle ground for very different reasons. But this is, the, this is the group that is going to decide the future of Northern Ireland. This is the group that has to be won over in a border poll. The narrative at the moment is that we're on a trajectory towards United Ireland. That's not true. Um, the opinion polls, there's maybe one or two polls that show a majority, but it's very thin. But most of the polls show the rise of the neither bloc, the drop of the unionist vote and, 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 and a slight rise in the support for United Ireland, but it is not the case that I think that we're on this pathway, that it's inevitable, it isn't inevitable. What is happening is that people are frustrated, they are angry. I describe it as a holding pattern. People don't know what is going to happen in the future. They're waiting to see what happens with Brexit and the protocol. They're, they're voting for parties like the Alliance Party and the Green Party in Northern Ireland because they, they want to consider something new. Um, you know, I say my parents would probably be in the persuadable category now, but they're, they love Northern Ireland. They love, you know, they have a lot of affection for the history of the union and that cultural attachment. You know, I don't think they like Boris Johnson. God no, but um, you know, they, they, if if they, I think they would vote for United Ireland if the terms are right. But equally, if you said to them, you know, if we if we, you know, fix the NHS and got rid of all this nonsense now, would you be happy enough? They'd probably say yes. Um, but this group in the middle, you know, um, it, it, it's. It's about this frustration and this, ang this, this anger. Michael, you were talking about what is the story of unionism, what story is unionism telling? The story that, that nationalists and Republicans are telling is about a, a new Ireland. What they are telling people is, you know, you don't like this, well, here's your ticket out. Here's your ticket into United Ireland and you will into this lovely progressive forward thinking country and you can get rid of Boris Johnson, you can join back the European Union and it's about change and it's about, about fighting for change within. It, it, they're almost selling it to people as in, well, you don't like the DUP, we'll vote for United Ireland. It's not, it's not even, there's, there's definitely nationalist Republican narratives in some of this and in some of the, 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 the conversations that are going on. For some of it, they are literally going to people and saying, you know, oh, you don't like the DUP, we'll tell you how you can piss them off, you can vote for United Ireland. And for some young people, particularly, you know, I've got younger siblings, that's how some of them will say it. Now, for a lot of them, it's a, it's a straight up, um, what is best for me and my family? But for some of them, they like the idea of sticking two fingers up to the DEP. It's very, very attractive. So, you know, the story that unionism is telling, well, what is that story? I mean, <laughs> you open up the newspaper and it's, it's Jeffrey Donaldson saying, well, if the protocol isn't fixed, we're not going to bring the assembly back. The waiting lists in Northern Ireland are atrocious. They are, if it was any other part of the United Kingdom, it would be front page news every single day, you know, with, with mental health crisis, food bank use. And that's not just confined to Northern Ireland, that is across the United Kingdom. And that's another thing, you know, going back about the history, about, about you know, what has been done to the United Kingdom over the past 20, 30 years and the, the welfare state and the NHS and these institutions that we take, that we have so much pride in, that have just been dismantled. The story that unionism is telling is, is basically the story of the DEP. And, you know, the also unionists are trying, uh, going in a wee bit of a different direction now, and they're trying to talk about a better Northern Ireland, which is what they have to do. Finally, someone is doing it. And, you know, you're saying doing nothing is not an option. You know, that is absolutely what has to happen. And... Unionism really has to grapple with its own history, its, its mistakes, historical mistakes, not just in the past five years, but the past over the past 100 years. And that's not just like the other side have their own thinking to do as well, obviously. But the, a different story has to be told about Northern Ireland and it's, they have to come forward with a vision for Northern Ireland and the union itself. They have to make people think, this is where I can be at home, this is where my values align, I, this is where I belong. And obviously there's a section of people within Northern Ireland who, for, for very obvious, understandable reasons, don't have a lot of a connection to Northern Ireland and the Union. And I think for a lot of them, they were quite content for a long time. Um, always, I think, had an aspiration for United Ireland, but now a lot of them aren't. You know, and I, I think on the, on, from the Protestant Unionist side, you know, I think things are a bit complicated. But for my friends from a Catholic nationalist background, you know, any one of them that was content with the Union, that is gone. Like, not a single one of them now would tell me that they would vote for the Union. And unionism needs to win those votes back if it can. And you look at the current leaders, you know, as I say, I don't, I'm not sure they're doing a very good job, <laughs> to put it lightly. Um, you know, this current crisis with the Assembly, this, this, the, this, the, the, the protocol, which now just is this festering wound in Northern Ireland politics now, and this inability, they're just talking past each other, this, this lack of concern for everybody else. You know, the Nationalist Republicans don't want a hard border because they don't want a hard border. The unionists don't want one down the IRC. And the answer really is through each other, is really to try and make compromises and work together. But it's easier said than done, but the damage has been done. And I think over the past five years, really, we have, it, it, 
I can't believe that I would say that it has gotten worse, but it just the political discourse is so toxic in some cases. It has gotten so narrow um, and really the ability to understand and reach out to each other that, that was sold in my generation under the Good Friday Agreement. It's very hard. I don't know if the Good Friday Agreement would have passed <laughs> in this day and age, you know. So, you know, how do you fix this? Which is, I, I think it is about within Northern Ireland, reform of the Northern Ireland institutions. You know, I'm, I'm getting a bit fed up with mandatory coalition. Obviously, in Northern Ireland, we have the power share and assembly. People do not feel like they can get rid of their government. They do not feel like they can vote DUP and Sinn Féin out. Basically, everyone's going into this election and, and the most you can hope for is that they'll get a bit of a bloody nose, which I think they've given them for the past couple of elections, but not enough to lodge them. Um, I think unionism itself needs to be more accommodating to the nationalist and republican traditions in Northern Ireland. It needs to do a lot of self-reflection. It needs to be a bit more positive instead of being constantly negative. And then in a wider case, I, I think we do need to talk about more wider constitutional form within the union, about within the devolved settlements. And I know that Devo scepticism is, we've talked about the book, um, you know, some of the unionists are now, do evolution is a very bad idea. And you, you know, it's too late now, you know, here we are. And I mean, you know, most people, you know, for not a lot of people now, particularly from some unionists now, that some people I hear are starting to go, I really don't like it that England has so much of a say. You know, you would never have, that never ever would have been said years and years ago. People really are thinking about the imbalance and the, 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 the ability of Northern Ireland to assert itself. And really, you know, the unionists need to be a bit more, they need to stand up to the British government more. They need to be asserting more, a certain sense of more Northern Irish identity, Irish Ulster identity, and just trying to cater to those multitudes of identities that come within Northern Ireland and being more accommodating and be more inclusive. And, um, and going back to their values, you know, and if, if, if I have my way, they'd all swing to the left, but <laughs> goodness, I mean, that's not going to happen. But um, unionism just needs, it is at a crossroads. I hate using that phrase. I use it every time I talk about this, but that is it. There's, there are two paths that unionism can go down. It's gone down one path for 100 years and it hasn't worked. Um, the other path is the only path that can go down and that's what they need to do. And they need to think differently you know that unionists i think find it very uncomfortable to be on the to, to agitate and to, to to stand up against the british government and be on that side that's always been traditionally for the other side to do i think that's what they need to do you know they need to to be more assertive and you know have a bit of common sense really um and i think you know we are at a very critical juncture i think whoever utilizes this moment effectively i think could be successful i'm not ready to say the United Ireland is on the way out because I don't see it and it is it is so complicated in Northern Ireland but you cannot deny that we are in a moment and if that moment is not dealt with effectively then I, I do fear disaster um, and you know I never thought I would say that and I think the strangest way to explain it is I was in a taxi a couple of years ago with the taxi driver who voted leave and I was talking about the constitutional question and I said oh, it'll never happen it'll never happen and I said, but you know, you voted for Brexit and Brexit happened. I mean, you know, my dad didn't think Brexit was gonna, the Leave vote was gonna win. And he said, oh, it'll never happen. And it, there's a generation of unionists in Northern Ireland that grew up in the troubles, that went through all the, all the, the hell and, and the trauma that they've been through. Um, and for them at that time, as my dad said, you know, nobody would have, that's, nobody ever would have pictured that the United Ireland could happen in that environment. And I think they, they, they hold on to that belief even now you know, the older generation who just honestly think this can never, ever happen. Nobody would do it. It's just not logically possible. And I think they need a good shake up, really. So, yeah, for me, I think um, unionism needs to have a good, hard, long look at itself, grapple with its history, inclusivity, positivity going forward. But that is going to require a lot, um, a lot of self-reflection, I think. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Sarah. And then now last, but by no means least, Corrie. Hey, thank you so much. Um, and hopefully this, this presentation picks up on some of these themes. And um, Sarah said that unionism needs a story, needs a narrative, needs to be able to sell itself. Um, and so the work that, that I'd like to present today um, builds off work that I've been doing with my colleague, Daniel Satra. And we were interested in the unionist story, particularly at a moment of a prolonged crisis or protracted crisis, perhaps at a moment of reckoning, um, one precipitated by the independence referendum, Brexit, by COVID as well. Um, and really what we looked at here was how these narratives are used by parties. Um, so I'll just begin with kind of speaking to, to that understanding of, of unionism 
um, and then move to these narratives. So we can understand unionism as a, as a policy platform or initiatives and, po and policies in support of state integrity, um, but also more, more of an identity construct, um, a sense of an ideology and ethos providing that broader sense of identity. But as we've seen with pulling on some of these themes and, and Carwin saying, I wouldn't define myself as a unionist. I did this series of, of interviews with, with um, labor officials throughout the UK and so many of them said, well, I don't see myself in that unionist label. I'm not a unionist. I am I'm an internationalist, I'm a socialist, um, I believe in the UK, but without this kind of professing this ideal of the union. And we can see indeed that the unionism of Boris Johnson is very different than the unionism of the DUP. Um, so we can speak of, of unionisms in that sense. And I think the reason we're here today is, is a sense of a union, unionism as a mo at a moment of crisis. We saw this with rising attention paid to the union with 2014. And this was very much, this was centered on Scotland, but very quickly moved beyond it. And um, we can recall David Cameron's um, speech the morning after the independence referendum, um, pledging to extend devolution in Scotland, but also Wales, um, restore devolution in Northern Ireland, or ensure the functioning of devolution, the functioning of the assembly and the executive in Northern Ireland. And, the, and then also implement the, the quite um, unfortunately acronymed and now defunct English votes for English laws. Just two years after this, we saw these debates over the union reignited by the Brexit vote, which laid bare tensions within the union, but also the failure of the constitutional structures, the political structures of the UK to adapt, to uh, manage relationships between the devolved governments, the devolved nations, and the center. And then we can turn to COVID, and, and we wrote this paper in, in 2020, kind of in the, in the early days of COVID, and I've since gone back and revisited it and looked at how or whether, whether COVID could be considered an opportunity for unionists or those in favor of state integrity um, or against independence, or was it a liability? So I was really interested in how, at moments of crisis, the case for the union was made. So we looked at unionist parties between 2016 and 2020, 2020, and then I came back to this. What we see broadly is variation between parties and between families of parties. The, the narrative of the union advanced by Welsh Labour is very different from that advanced by Scottish Labour and Labour at the centre when they speak particularly under Corbyn's leadership when they spoke about the union at all. Um, so I'll highlight some of these, these themes before turning to speak to the future of unionism. So what narratives did we see? What was the story? We saw d dominant legitimizing claims, which were very much instrumentalist defenses of the union, quite pragmatic, quite technical defenses of the union, rooted in economics and welfare, the National Health Service, the strength, the economic strength, of the UK as a market, as an economic entity. So I'll turn first to, to the economic union. The, econo the union was very much seen as a guarantor of economic security, of prosperity. Here we see a distinction between the quite static vision presented by the Conservatives and the DUP. This was quite assertive and confident about the union's economic future. Theresa May described the union as a huge source of economic strength. We saw a more dynamic vision from, from Labour, um, partially because outside of Wales, they were a party of opposition, so they had to focus on change, stressing renewal and reform. There was an argument around um, the risk of independence, the risk of disunity, mm -hmm. and the current economic disparities, current, the current economic situation would be exacerbated by independence. We saw a quite rare intervention by Corbyn in 20, 2017 on the question of Scottish independence, where he warned that if Scotland became independent, it would face a turbocharged austerity. So this is quite similar lines to, to the 2014 
focusing on this narrative of risk. We see these two different arguments here, kind of two different two variations on this theme. I think underpinning them where we can ask the question, what sustains the union? What might sustain the union when it doesn't deliver, when it's unable to deliver the desired economic and political outcomes as we've seen as a result of Brexit and the continued pandemic? We can then turn to the welfare and, and the social union. And this is a hallmark of, of British unionist discourse. Um, cast your mind back to 2012, the opening ceremony of, of the London Olympics, in which the NHS, in which the welfare state quite literally took the center stage. And this consistency is quite remarkable considering the rollback of services, the, the kind of continued policies of austerity. And it also overlooks the devolved nation nature of these services, that the UK doesn't have a single national health service, it has national health services. Again, we see Labour um, using a narrative which focused on the establishment of the NHS delivered under a Labour government and the need for the renewal or restoration, as well as a commitment to social solidarity, that people within these aisles should be sharing, which should be um, should be pooling resources, should be helping one another. Gordon Brown focuses, and he has quite an interesting um, discourse around nationalisms, that nationalism is not, is not rooted or the support for nationalism within the constituent parts of the UK, um, which he describes as English, Welsh, Ulster, and Scottish nationalism, and Brexit nationalism, is not rooted in identity or a desire to be a part. It's rooted in austerity, rooted in the weaknesses of the welfare state. Again, the Conservatives have a much more static defense of the union, um, with May describing the NHS that holds the glue that holds the union together. A slightly less salient theme, um, but one that, that's quite important, is this idea of a social union, the union as a family, um, that there's this familial ties, a shared history and shared identity. And here we see, we see a discourse around, which I think I described at dinner last night, as, as dad's army unionism, um, <laughs> with this reference to that we fought together, that we, we've had this history together, and it's rooted very much in this, these historical events. But as we sit here in 2022, these events are increasingly distant from, from the lives of everyday people. And the third narrative, um, which, which speaks to, um, which Michael kind of beat me to the punch there, um, was one of British values. Um, and these values were largely universal, um, universal values of freedom, of liberty, of fair play, appropriated in service of the union, with seemingly no recognition that these same values were also espoused by substate nationalist leaders in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. There was a creation of a dichotomy between an open, inclusive, democratic, outward-looking unionism or state nationalism um, or Britishness against a closed, exclusive, insular substate nationalism. There was an emphasis as well on layered identities. And um, former conser Scottish Conservative leader described the messiness of Britishness in which people could quite happily be both British and Scottish or, or British and and Welsh or Irish, and those identities were also com compatible. Again, there's this persistent conflation between plurinationalism, the, the states, the nations which made up the UK, and multiculturalism. So often you would see Scottishness or, or Scots listed on a list with, with people from Pakistan, or this idea that this is a melting pot, or there's a plurinational multicultural society. So how has this changed um, in the last two years in which, in which COVID has very much defined our, our political, social, and, and, and economic lives? These narratives were very much adapted to COVID, the economic might of the UK, the broad shoulders, um, as Michael Gove described, of the UK, supporting both individuals and businesses. The NHS was also used as a shared asset um, and a symbol really very much of Britishness. There was also this, this social element or historical element in which there was this kind of narrative, particularly by the conservatives, of, around the blitz and the experience of the Second World War and conflating the, um, the pandemic experience to a wartime experience, um, something that brought 
the UK together. But as we see in many ways, the pandemic has highlighted differences between the nations of the UK, how they've managed the pandemic, and also some of those issues around intergovernmental relations, how they've worked together, um, but also how they've failed to work together. So where, where stands, um, stands unionism at this moment? In 2019, um, Michael, as, as part of a project, um, sent a colleague and I off to Newcastle to attend this conference on unionism. Um, we were the youngest people in the room by at least 30 years. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I could not get my questions answered, um, but I'm <laughs> still quite bitter about it. Um, but Henry, Henry Hill of Conservative Home um, began the conference and said, we know what we are against and independence, but we know less, um, less what we are for. And this seems particularly, three years later, this seems particularly acute given the realities of a post-Brexit world and a world very fundamentally changed by COVID. Um, so what is, what is left if we make these very pragmatic, instrumental arguments in favor of the union? What is left once the NHS is, is undermined? The memories, that collective sense of, of identity, the collective memory of the wartime experience is no longer there. The economic case for the union is perhaps uh, diminished. So we can see unionism as remaining in quite a def defensive posture. Um, and you can also see parties which compete in, in Great Britain struggling to deal with the question of Northern Ireland. And um, it was something that, that there's a discomfort where, there, that the solutions for, for the union or re reconstructing the union fail to deal adequately with, with Northern Ireland. And we see this continued reliance on instrumental arguments and pragmatic arguments. And there's really a question about whether those arguments are sustainable going forward. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Corrie. So I think my first duty is to see if there are any questions in the room. So if anybody here present has any questions, and if not, Jonathan, is it you that I come to for online questions? Um, it is, but um, I want to ask one first, um, okay. obviously. Um, my question is specifically for Sarah, really, but I mean, I'm interested in, <laughs> in kind of reflections across, across the piece. And well, you said something really interesting at the outset, which is that there's a discomfort in talking about and to Ulster unionism because it's like holding up a mirror. And I just wondered if you could maybe say a little bit more about that. And then I guess... And, it, you know, Corey, at, at the end of your uh, remarks, you spoke to the discomfort that exists in the place of, or dealing with the place of Northern Ireland in this thing called the Union. And I, I just wonder whether there should be any more discomfort now in thinking and talking about that vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, Scotland or Wales, where um, questions of... Um, identity certainly but of constitutional preference are live uh, in a way that they certainly um, in the case of Wales were not in my earlier political lifetime albeit that Carwin you've said in very interesting ways that the, the debate is not as polarized in Wales and so perhaps there are lessons there for I just it strikes me that there shouldn't be any comfort about any part of the union <laughs> having a long-term future in this kind of in this particular political formation and is there something that we can learn perhaps from the Welsh example about how we discuss what a future might look like both within but also perhaps beyond and now with the union so I started with a quite a, with, a, <laughs> with one question and it's become several but um yeah yeah, sir. yeah um how do you unpack what I meant by that statement of what because I don't I don't want to do the community I come from down, you know, um, it, I guess the easy way to describe it is, you know, when the DUP entered into the confidence and supply agreement with, with, with the Conservatives, it was just, it was almost like people had just <laughs> discovered the DUP existed. And, you know, you, you got all these comments on Twitter and online about, oh, look at these unionists with their bonfires and look at them with their, they fly all these flags and aren't they, aren't they stupid idiots? And you thought, you know, I thought to myself, well, where do you think that came from? Where, you know, where do you think, 
you know, the fact that I've, I've, I'm very proud to call myself British, where did that come from? You know, what, what's the history that goes with that? And it was, a, you know, as I say, people seem to think that Northern Ireland just popped up out of the sea one day and just latched itself onto Britain and now you have to pay us a, 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 a subvention. You know, that, that's not what happened. There's, there's hundreds of years of history that, that come with, with Northern Ireland and unionism in Northern Ireland. Um, unionists in Northern Ireland have been, you know, they're often used by the British government when they want to get something and then they're tossed to the side when it happens. You know, as I said, everyone's very aware of that, unless you're Ian Paisley Jr. apparently. But, um, you know, but people look at the Australian and they say, oh, they, I don't like what they're doing. And you think, well, you know, I'm talking about colonialism, obviously. I'm talking about the history. And I'm not saying that, 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 that my people are, are colonizers. I'm not using that type of language because I don't like that at all. But there's the history that comes with Northern Ireland and, you know, we're in this period now where the British government is um, trying to impose this legacy legislation that is going to essentially stop victims in Northern Ireland from getting justice, either from the state, it's going to stop people, uh, prosecutions against the IRA and the loyalist paramilitaries. And, and you know, the, 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 we, we recently had the anniversary of Bloody Sunday, we have the Sean Graham report about collusion. You know, there's a history that comes with Northern Ireland that, that the British state has been involved with. and. I think that's what I mean, you know, when the people kind of make these jokes about, about unionists and loyalists and look at them, aren't they stupid? And you think, you don't really know your history. You don't know what's going on here. And you're, you're judging them for how they are. And you haven't, you haven't lived through what they've lived through. You haven't gone through what they've gone through. So I suppose that's what I think, you know, it's just, it's so easy to make jokes about unionists in Northern Ireland, but you know, we are you, <laughs> probably more than, than anybody else. Um, even though people like to think of us as just those wee, wee patties, you know, but it, it, it's, I think that's what I meant. There's, there's it, to confront us unionism and talk about it honestly, not only with, with critically, but also with empathy and respect, I think um, is to confront the history of, of the country, of this nation, <laughs> essentially is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would anyone else like to come in? I think Jonathan made comments to, to all of you, really. Carol? Yeah, I mean, can I say, first of all, how refreshing it is to hear Sarah's viewpoint? Because it's not one that I hear, I have to say. Um, I hear the viewpoint of my wife's family, uh, and they have a particular viewpoint. And you're quite right to say people who remember the Troubles have, are much more polarised yeah. than those who don't. And you made me feel very old, thanks for that. Because I, rem I, remember, I remember Belfast when it, in the early 90s and what, what it used to be like. Uh, and from my perspective, you know, the, the, the viewpoint I heard was always from the DUP. Mm. Always, that was the narrative. And it, and it was just completely odd, alien to my way of thinking. It was, it was so strange. It was like something that, that existed 400 years ago rather than something that existed now. To hear your viewpoint and to hear you articulate it, I think that's, you know, th the more people hear that viewpoint, the, be the better, I think. Because it is, there is a tendency, you know, it's certainly amongst many people in the nationalist population to conflate unionism with the orange order. Mm. And that's, that's why I, you know, I, I, I said what I said earlier on. And as you rightly pointed out, that's not what it's about. I'm not saying it's unfair yeah, but it's a, but it's a like generalization, yeah. and, and it, 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 Northern Ireland has changed. You know, if you, you'd have said to me 30 years ago, it would be as it is now, I would never have believed you because it was an armed camp. There's no other way of describing it. I think th there is, the DUP keep on believing what they're told by successive UK governments. I've never seen them like it. Um, whereas, in fact, most people in GB are just indifferent to Northern Ireland. They just don't think about it. Uh, it used to be, it's a place where there used to be trouble and now they just don't think about it. To the extent that I remember being five years old in 1972, when Northern Ireland probably had its worst year of violence, you know, Bloody Sunday had taken place, then Bloody Friday, everything was, you know, it, it was on the news every single night. And I had no idea what this was about. And I asked my father, I said, what's all this about? He said, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a fight between Protestants and Catholics. I said, what are Protestants and Catholics? Because I came from a country where only 4% of the population was Catholic. I didn't know any. And my father obviously paused because he didn't know how the hell do I explain this. And the only explanation he could come up with was, ah, right. I said, we said, well, we're Protestants, he said. Okay, what's the difference? Mm, well, when you go to chapel, which in Wales means a non-conformist yeah. church, uh, we worship Jesus and Catholics worship Mary. And that was his theological explanation for the whole thing. But it, it does show how much ignorance there was then and still is about Northern Ireland elsewhere in the UK. You know, people still have this idea that, that when they see unionism, they see the sat, that's, that's what they see. And if you're my wife's generation, that's what she sees. There's someone in the mid fifties and remember when she left Northern Ireland in 85, when it was, 
as bad as it ever was. And I do think there's tremendous, there may be, from what you've said, there may be scope now to get away from that polarisation, that it's all about the orange and the green and nothing else. There is absolutely nothing else in the middle and it's like that. Uh, and to hear different voices on both sides that actually would want to, to, want to move on those important issues, those important social justice mm -hmm. issues, rather than focusing entirely on constitutional issues. And I think you're right. The DUP made a huge mistake in collapsing the Assembly. It's done nothing for their support. You know, both Sinn Féin and the DUP have lost support since the last um, Assembly election. We've seen people with the Alliance and the UUP has positioned itself as the most socially liberal mm -hmm. party. And, you, and you've got, hopefully, there will be a change you know, along the lines that you suggested in Northern Ireland politics, where, you know, if you're a, a centre-right Catholic, you have a party to vote for. And if you're a centre-left Protestant, you have a party to vote for. And that just doesn't happen at the moment. Mm. And, and a move towards politics that, that looks more, I mean, it's never going to completely disappear in terms of the constitutional question, but that looks more like a traditional left-right split. Michael, do you mm. want to come in? Uh, yes, on this question of discomfort about talking about Northern Ireland in, in the Union, and I find this talking to the unionist think tanks, and I push them, well, is Northern Ireland part of your union? Well, maybe it is and maybe it isn't. And it's crystallized around this debate about a British Bill of Rights. And first of all, it comes from Westminster, British Bill, completely ignoring Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, completely, just about England. And he said, what about Northern Ireland? How does that fit into it? Oh, well, we'll maybe just leave them out. Oh, okay, not a British Bill of Rights. Well, what about Scotland? <laughs> well, what, what, yeah, what, what, what about Scotland? Okay, that's a bit different too. <laughs> so, so what about Wales? <laughs> and suddenly, suddenly it's no longer a unionist project. It disappears. So, so what is, is, is that? And I keep on telling them, you don't need a single pan-UK unionism. You don't need it. You don't need to drill down to find a common foundation. That's not what a plurinational union is. These are different realities that we've got to live with each other. That's the important thing. And if that means a form of union, but unionism, I mean, not the way you've expressed it, but it's, it's historical unionism, can't, can't get their minds around that. I mean, I'm, I'm particularly talking about unionism at the centre, because we hardly ever talk about unionism at the centre. We talk about the peripheries, but the, the centre is the reconception of the union. And it, it's just not there, it seems to me. Um, just, just kind of from an empirical perspective, it's, some, it's something that I've heard kind of quite consistently as well. I, I think um, there was a report commissioned um, under Corbyn's leadership to look into the constitutional structure and, and uh, of the United Kingdom, and and I think and I, I was meeting with the authors and, and and I said, well, what about us? I'm there to talk about Scotland, but but meeting with authors, and I said, well, what about Northern Ireland? And they go, Northern Ireland's much too complicated. Um, it's, it's somehow set apart, and I, I think that's the, the, the problem. We, it's the media is separate, the debates, the par parties are separate, and so there's a reluctance, a discomfort in, in engaging, and perhaps because people don't have a strong understanding of, of Northern Ireland at all, and beyond, this, beyond that association with the Troubles, and so it was quite, quite interesting. Paul, I saw your hand first, do you want to come in? Um, Lisa, do it from a mic. Sorry, no, I still be here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, a question to Michael and to Carwin. Uh, and what interests me is what's driving the um, uh, the dynamics, if you like, of, within the union. And Michael, you 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 fall short of saying that uh, uh, the union has failed. And I'm not sure what you see as um, as something that might revive it short of breakup or alternative to breakup um, because it seems to me the centralist force uh, uh, and the reassertion of so sovereignty coming from the Tories is being reinforced and they've just opened a, an office in Belfast which is a direct representation of London and Belfast similar to what they've been doing elsewhere uh, there's a, a great devil scepticism amongst, uh, amongst that brand of, 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 of conservatism. Is that not driving the, the system as a whole? Uh, I mean, it's the very opposite of the plurinationalism you describe towards uh, a breakup uh, in the absence of an alternative. Uh, but, and to, but to Carwin, perhaps the most constructive alternative is being created in Wales as a kind of vision of unionism. But how does it resonate with the Labour Party in Westminster? And does it have purchase there? How credible is the Gordon Brown uh, formula 
uh, in relation to your formula in Wales as an alternative uh, that might give heft to Michael's pessimism? Uh, we're a little bit short in time, so maybe I'll collect a few before I come back to the panel. So, Sarah, I see you had your hand up as well. Um, my question is for Sarah. Um, I'm really interested in the, the relationship between unionism and, and gender, and you kind of referred to the, the way in which at least political unionism has been quite gendered. Um, and obviously, um, you know, in the literature, um, there is this idea of, um, you know, unionism and um, sitting particularly uncomfortably, I suppose, with feminism. Um, do you think that that is, at the, at the grassroots level, at the more informal political level, do you think that is something of a misrepresentation, particularly you know, in recent years you know, with the, um, the, the movement for, uh, for abortion rights, etc., that, that there has been in, you know, increasing space claimed for feminism within unionism and do you think that has to be, that gender I suppose has to be part of the broader debate and the, the uh, transformation or self-reflection within uh, unionism that you've, that you've talked about? Thanks Sarah. Okay. Jonathan, do you have a few you'd like to I do. Um, I do have a couple of questions. I have one from Sam Parry and just want to say thanks to Sam for tuning in. And who was wondering whether anyone uh, could talk to or has views on the material or, or economic foundation of, of well, we'll take the part of the question that's about unionism, uh, the unevenness of capitalist development between the nations of, of the United Kingdom um, and its role in the foundation of, of union and of, of the union and of unionism as it's practiced. Um, and uh, Louis Lines would like um, to know, would be interested to hear the panel's thoughts on why uh, the pro-Brexit narrative of sovereignty, deregulation and free trade has played out so differently across the constituent parts of the United Kingdom, the, four, the, the different nations of, of the United Kingdom. Uh, very interesting. So do you want to start at the near end? Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, so uh, feminism and gender and unionism, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge issue. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to demonstrate it. Obviously, there, there are lots of feminists, um, unionists and loyalists. Um, you know, we talk about the, you know, the Repeal the Eighth campaign. I mean, um, you know, Danielle Roberts, Don Purvis. You know, lots of unionists heavily involved with that. I suppose with, with feminism and, 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 and socialism and all these other ideas, you know, Don Purvis, I remember her actually explaining it once really well. She said, you know, these concepts were always seen as being for nationalists and Republicans. And, some unionists and lawyers thought, well, oh, it's not for me, I, I don't fit in here. And then obviously the women's movement in Northern Ireland, there was obviously during the Troubles, there were lots of complicated issues because some of the women's movement was aligned with the Republican movement and the provisional IRA, which for many unionist and lawyers, women was unacceptable, obviously. Um, and there was, it, but uh, Eileen Avason um, writes in one of her books about how, but lots of Protestant unionist women were engaged in the feminist movement, but they maybe weren't doing it as unionists or loyalists. There were lots of common issues and women have always worked across gender lines, I think, in Northern Ireland. And you see that with the, the abortion rights campaign. You know, I've been to the Alliance for Choice stalls and I mean, there would be Protestants, Catholic unionists together and, you know, it's, it's just not a part of it, really. But definitely, you know, uh, unionism itself is very much stale, pale and male, really, for quite a long time. Um, and that's not to erase the unionist women that have been involved, by the way, but just that's, that's always, it's always been very patriarchal. And you go back to the Good Friday Agreement negotiations where they would have mooed at the Women's Coalition. So I, I do think for younger generation, I don't think it's as difficult as what the older generation find it. I think many young women, I quite happily call themselves feminists and, and unionists, you know. Um, my friend, Gillianne Cor Johnson, she's running for the Ulster Unionists, you know, Gillianne, she should run Northern Ireland. Um, you know, she would quite happily, you know, um, but she's also talked about, about as a loyalist woman and how she hasn't felt that much of a connection with the feminist movement. And I was really pleased to see that um, some of the loyalist women groups were at that event yesterday down in Loch Garn, you know, and I, so I think there's been a real, I think there's a real change going on in terms of the femini feminist movement. And I think that outside of in the peace times, I think it's a lot easier for people to, to do that. Um, the pro-Brexit agenda, I think that's, that's, that's fascinating about why it, it hasn't, I don't know, I think part of Brexit, I think was about anti-globalization. I think that's, that's what's going on here um, in some level and about sovereignty, but I think the people who are leading Brexit aren't really cared about people who are left behind by globalisation, I think, and they're, they're trying to take us, they're just basically trying to double down on what, what the issue is. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Carwin? Yeah, I mean, first point, I don't think the UK is a failed state, and I think most people who live within it wouldn't see it that way. 
I think, however, it is in danger of fragmenting, uh, especially given what, it seems to have stalled a bit now, but the determination of the UK government to impose its uh, definition of Britishness on everyone else. And I'll give you one example where this happened. There's a UK government office in Cardiff. It's mainly a tax office, right? Which they don't advertise much, but it is mainly a tax office. They wanted to put an eight-story high Union Jack on the side of the building. Uh, this went down badly, and they haven't done it, mainly because the building is, is between the central railway station and the Principality Stadium, which are a few hundred yards apart, and, the, and supporters would walk past it to get to the ground when they were at their most Welsh. <laughs> and I think there was a realisation that some people might take badly to seeing a Union Jack in front of them as they were going to watch Wales play rugby, particularly when, when they were playing England. And it never happened. But you can, ima can you imagine in Ireland if someone said, we're going to take a building in Ireland, put a, put a trickler on it, it's, and people say, fine, no problem at all. It couldn't do that. You just couldn't do that in Wales with the Union Jack. Couldn't be done. If it had been a Red Dragon, no one would have batted an island. Uh, and that is an example of the the cloth eared sort of approach of the UK government in that sense. You know, they, they, they seem to have it in their heads that people are desperately trying to get rid of their governments in Scotland and Wales. And yet we had a, a, an election in, in May in Wales where more than 70% of people voted for parties other than in favour of independence or more autonomy. A party stood on a specific platform of abolishing our parliament and got 4% of the vote. You know, they, they, they've completely misread the view, this is not the 90s, they've completely misread the view of the public in, in, in that regard. And the greatest danger to the UK's future is the insistent attitude of those who want to turn the clock back and who are not prepared to accept that the UK is a multinational state where people are content, and COVID has only magnified this, people have been, you know, COVID has, has, has seen support for devolution rise even further. Uh, that's the trend and they're trying to fight against that and the stronger they fight the more danger there is that they will actually undo what they're trying to preserve. Corey? Great. Um, I guess I, I can speak to a bit the to some research on the partisan dynamics or the internal labour dynamics between between London and, and Scotland and, and Wales. Um, I kind of went around went around um, the UK doing interviews in 2019, which was was a difficult period for for the UK Labour Party, um, and and was very much struck by by a sense of distance, by the sense that the UK Labour Party was consumed by its internal battles over Brexit, over anti-Semitism, over over leadership, and a sense and very much defined a sense perhaps that that Scotland is is a bit of a lost cause for. for for labor and, and for Scottish labor, which I don't think is, is true at all over the long term, um, and that Wales can, can be counted on and perhaps taken for granted to deliver seats, to deliver votes. Um, so it was, it was a really interesting, interesting sense. And then there were allusions to, to, and I will have to use it, otherwise Jonathan will be upset with me, this idea of federalism, um, but federalism <laughs> very vaguely defined, <laughs> and, which I have, have at points called jazz hands federalism, because federalism is very much a, w without, a without a basis, without an understanding of how, it would co how you would deal with England, how you would deal with Northern Ireland. Um, so it was interesting to sit in interviews with people and say, well, we'll, we'll have a federal solution for the UK. And, and there might be federal models or federal innovations which could be adopted, um, but an overall thinking on the union or reform of the union um, seemed to be lacking. Um, yeah, I think we, we've all got our stories about these UK hubs. And whenever I got a foreign visitor in Edinburgh, I went to send them to see the, uh, the Edinburgh one, huge building, UK government in Scotland, with the biggest flag I've seen outside the United States huge lettering and it faces over the regime directly at St Andrew's house, the headquarters of the Scottish government. The symbolism is extraordinary. It's just, it's just power, domination. You know, this is we are, we are big and you're small. That's, that's, the, that's the thing it's given. I don't know who had the idea of putting that thing there. But I'm not surprised they do the same in Belfast and, and Wales as, as, the economies as well. But the second question was about the economics of this. And one thing we haven't really talked about is another important element that we've talked about historically is about territorial management. How do central governments manage these complex unions in various ways? And the economic dimension is a very important one. 
whether it was free trade versus protectionism in the 19th century that had a strong territorial dimension or regional policy in the 1960s and 1970s. And that had a twofold effect, regional policy in the 60s and 70s. On the one hand, it integrated the peripheral nations into the United Kingdom. On the other hand, it created them as economic units. So Wales was some, uh, a planning unit. You could talk about a Welsh economy. The economists always said no such thing exists, but it did exist because that's the way the government framed economic uh, policies. That was completely run down. In the 1980s, 90%, the regional development funding was cut by 90%, and the only bit that survived was the bit that we were obliged to do to draw down European monies. And now the UK government has sort of discovered this, and I read the levelling up white paper uh, the other day, just, just uh, the beginning of this week, and in the middle there's the jumble of every economic development theory I've ever heard of, with no, without no attempt to integrate them. It's, it's odds and sods and talking about Renaissance Florence and <laughs> really weird stuff. And then on the other hand there's the practice, which is pork barrel politics. A little bit of this, that and the other. There. The, the refurbishment of Perth City Hall. You know, you go up to £100,000 to do that, so we would be grateful to the UK government. So there's that realisation, together with the total unwillingness to do anything about it, seriously. Uh, and, and the other thing is the, the, the neglect of the periphery after devolution. It's not that Whitehall is continually down to doing them down, it's that they forget they're there. And I remember back in the, in the 70s when devolution was going to happen, I used to teach a course in the Civil Service College in Sunningdale in London. You've got to know about devolution and all the upcoming civil servants had to learn about it. They didn't do that after 1999. But what does happen is every couple of years I'm invited down to Whitehall to lecture them about devolution. And the last time I went in there, they gave me a big, you know, one of these things you put around your neck, what they call it, lanyard, saying devolution in you, and a big mug saying devolution matters. And they said, you can take the mug home with you. I said, no, no, you can keep it. <laughs> <laughs> <You're not laughs> and of course, all sorts of goodwill, and then they forget about us again. And now we've got the new white paper on intergovernmental relations, and the cabinet office summoned us all for a discussion last week, and I said, I've got an awful sense of deja vu here, because these mechanisms are just the same. So you don't, it, it, it's not there in Whitehall, it's an add-on. You can forget about it, and then when there's a crisis, do something about it. But it's, there's no federal thinking, there's no thinking in Whitehall about the nature of the state. And that's not only applies in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, it also applies in the regions of England, where there's a failure to think about the territorial dimensions. And levelling up is not primarily about Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, it's mainly about what's happening to this crisis within England, which, which are huge. Scotland is actually somewhere in the middle there, it's, it's neither a rich nor a poor place. But, but it's, it's part of a general uh, thinking about how one can create a degree of economic integration within a union, how much is necessary, and how compatible that is with the deregulation, neoliberal competitive ethos that's prevailed in the last 30 years in, in economic policy making. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. And as we've reached time, um, we're going to take a small break now. So you can rejoin us at um, a quarter past three. Um, but before we do that, um, I'd like to thank the panellists for very interesting contributions. And of course, Jonathan, for putting together the panel. So thank you very much. Hi, um, I think we are back for the third and final of our three roundtables uh, this afternoon. And uh, it's my real, uh, I'm really excited, it's my great privilege to be chairing this panel, looking at this roundtable discussion, looking at nationalisms and slash as constitutional futures, um, exploring nationalism as a way of doing politics um, and of thinking about politics, of thinking about and doing political futures in Wales, Ireland and Scotland in a way that very much dovetails with my current program of research um, under the auspices of the Constitutional Futures After Brexit project. Uh, we're going to be looking at how different nationalist visions, uh, kind of broadly defined, of the post-Brexit political and constitutional futures of these islands interact. Um, and I'm thrilled to be joined for this uh, discussion by John Osmond. Uh, John is an author, former journalist, and former director of the think tank, the Institute for Welsh Affairs. 
uh, and he is a special advisor to Adam Price, the leader of Plaid Cymru. Uh, Judith Scheistermans uh, is a research fellow in the School of Social and Political Science at the University of Edinburgh and is a teaching fellow at the University of Dundee. Her research focuses on collaboration, teaching and learning between nationalist political parties. Michelle Gildenew is the Sinn Féin MP for Fermanagh and South Tyrone. Uh, she's a former Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development in the Northern Ireland Executive uh, and has served on Sinn Féin's Ard Corler. Um, and finally, uh, joining us uh, remotely um, um, as, a, as a consequence of the, the, the wild tempest that has raged across these islands um, over the past uh, several hours uh, is Michael Russell, who is the president of the Scottish Nationalist pa Scottish National Party, the SNP, uh, a former MSP, and he's held a number of ministerial positions, including most recently as the cabinet secretary for the Constitution, Europe, and External Affairs, uh, and he is now the political director of the SNP's Independence Unit. Uh, as well as a professor in Scottish culture and governance at the University of Glasgow. So, with no further ado, um, we'll be coming back to me for a few kind of concluding remarks uh, at the end of uh, this particular session, but I'm going to hand over now to John Osmond to kick us off uh, looking at nationalism, uh, nationalisms and slash as constitutional futures. Okay, Good afternoon and thank you very much for the invitation to Dublin, which I always accept with alacrity. Uh, Karen Jones has, has had to leave us, so I have no compulsion really in pointing out that uh, in the session we've just had that he failed to answer the question from uh, Paul Gillespie about how the admirable efforts that the Welsh Labour Party are making to devise a constitutional future for Britain is being conveyed or received by the wider Labour Party, uh, particularly in London. Uh, which leads me really to what I want to say, which is um, I want to offer first a, a kind of critique of various proposals that are being made for constitutional fu futures, um, not least by my own party, <laughs> Plaid Cymru, um, and offer a proposal. We haven't had many of those today. Uh, my proposal may be a bit left field, but we'll see how it goes. Well, um, the latest proponent uh, of federalism um, is a group within, as I say, the Welsh Labour Party that uh, since early last year has been advocating what it calls radical federalism. Now, what the radical word means in this formulation is entirely unclear to me unless it's due to the fact that the federal option is being put forward or being put on the table by Labour, which indeed is probably radical. Um, but there is a long, as many of you will be aware, there's a long tradition of federal solutions being resorted to whenever territorial pressure is exerted upon the British state. For instance, more than a century ago, when Irish home rule was being debated, Winston Churchill suggested that a workable solution would be home rule all round, including for England. And I've got a quotation here, which, there we are. Um, he, he, the way he put it was this, I'm not in the least disturbed by the prospect of seeing erected in this country 10 or 12 separate legislative bodies for discharging the functions entrusted to them by the Imperial Parliament. The United States conducts its business through a great number of parliaments, and Germany has not merely parliaments, and states gathered and grouped together within the German Empire, but has separate kingdoms, principalities, armies woven together in a strong federation of the whole. In the colonies, Canada, South Africa, Australia, they found this federal system the only way in which you can reconcile the general interest of an organized state with the special and particular development of each part and portion of it. Now, there's little to argue in theory with Churchill's suggestion, it seems to me, although I'm reminded of the old joke. Uh, two French political philosophers are discussing the nature of the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom's multinational state system. After much bewilderment, one says to the other, well, it may work in practice, but it'll never work in theory. Uh, of course, the problem with England being broken down into the component regions with different laws being made in Manchester, Newcastle, Birmingham, is that it would never work in practice. 
because the English simply don't want to do it. Uh, not much has changed since 1912 when the Spectator magazine refuted Churchill's ideas, which I've just quoted, in the following terms. Most of us Englishmen, though we do not often talk about it, are proud not of Great Britain only, or of the United Kingdom only, or only of the British Empire, but proud also of England. And the idea of breaking up our country into seven or eight provinces with separate parliaments and separate governments of their own is utterly repugnant of our, to our national pride. Now, of course, sticking with federalism, the alternative approach would be to, to divide the United Kingdom into four units, England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. But this would be unworkable in theory as well as in practice because of the sheer size of England, which contains more than 80% of the population of the UK. There's no federal system in the world, is there, where uh, such an imbalance exists. The nearest equivalent, I think, is Canada, where 35% of the population lives in Ontario, but that is not close. In general, federal systems where the largest unit dominates do not survive. I mean, examples include the USSR, uh, which was dominated by Russia, Czechoslovakia, dominated by the Czechs, Yugoslavia, dominated by the Serbs. And as, it was as long ago as 1973 when the Commission on the Constitution, the Kilbrannan Commission, summed up the case against it, uh, against an English Parliament, that is to say, within a British federal system in what seems to me irrefutable terms. They said, a federation consisting of four units, England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, would be so unbalanced as to be unworkable. It would be dominated by the overwhelming political importance and wealth of England, the English Parliament would rival the United Kingdom Federal Parliament, and in the Federal Parliament itself, the representation of England could hardly be scaled down in such a way as to enable it to be outvoted by Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, together representing less than one-fifth of the population. The United Kingdom Federation of four countries uh, is therefore not a re realistic proposition. Now, my party, Plaid Cymru, has advocated a different approach. Rather than federalism, we talk about confederalism. We see this as a logical consequence of the devolution process that has been developing over the last few decades. It is increasingly, as we've heard more than once today, it's increasingly being acknowledged that sovereignty in the United Kingdom rests not with the Crown in Parliament in Westminster, but with its respective peoples, Welsh, Scottish, English, Northern Irish. They could decide to join together in a confederal arrangement, but this would entail powers, functions, and money being handed up to the confederal level in an agreed way, and with a caveat, of course, that they could always be withheld or withdrawn. Now, a federation, it seems to me, works in the opposite direction. It starts from the position that sovereignty lies at the center of the state, in this case, Britain and London, with powers, functions, and money handed down in ways largely decided by the centre. Uh, Adam Price, the leader of Plaid Cymru, proposed a confederal approach to the future of the UK, drawing on the uh, experience of Benelux in, in the European U Union. That is the confederal relationship between the Netherlands, uh, uh, Belgium, and Luxembourg he said, could offer a template for future relationships between the nations of Britain. He argued that it offers a completely new vision for Britain's future. It is one, he said, where its constituent nations come, to come together to create a new civic sensibility and a new partnership of equals. It is one that is being outward looking as well, that embraces a confident sense of being at ease with a wider sense of Europe. Now, Benelux had its inception as a customs union in uh, 1949. In 1954, the Benelux Treaty of Economic Union was signed, including free movement of people, goods and services. It was the forerunner, of course, of the EU itself. Um, in, in 2008, a new treaty was agreed to deepen and extend the scope of collaboration, uh, including education, joint recognition of diplomas, university degrees, the police, roads, adaption to climate change. The con Confederation has quite an elaborate system of, of institutions, operates through an annual uh, parliament, uh, sorry, annual plans with four yearly programs. Its institutions 
uh, oversee the collaboration has a parliament, the Confederal Parliament, Ministerial Committee, the Benelux Council, Court of Justice, General Secretariat, which serves all these institutions, and so on. Now, this all sounds very fine in theory. I think in practice, there are problems. Um, the first, I mean, when we try and apply it to our, sit, our, our situation in, in the UK, I mean, the first problem is that what is emerging in today's UK is a process opposite to that which led to the creation of Benelux. Rather than independent countries coming together and pooling a number of important functions, what we see in the UK now is nations which have had a subordinate relationship with a larger neighbour over a long period, many centuries, reasserting their desire for greater autonomy. So we're coming at the issue from a completely different direction. The second problem, I think, which is probably more fundamental, is that for such a new kind of relationship to work, there must be a desire for it to happen. In Wales, I'm sure there is such a desire, such a wish for recasting of the relationship between the nations of Britain, not just by Plaid Cymru, but as we've heard, by Welsh Labour as well. However, there's been little sign of an appetite for exploring this in Scotland, where the SNP in particular is intent on prioritising its relationship with the EU. And in England, there simply appears to be no desire for this kind of thing at all. Um, which finally brings me to my proposal. So in confederal terms, what I'm going to suggest is that rather than look east towards the doubtful prospect of what you might call a Britannic confederation, why not look west towards the feasibility of a Celtic confederation? Why not investigate the potential advantages of a collaboration between Ireland, the north of Ireland, Scotland, Wales, perhaps the Isle of Man, perhaps even Cornwall. There are many imponderables in this uh, conception which might appear to be um, for a bit from left field, but um, among the questions I want to put is, is how welcome would such a configuration be? As I've said, I can readily see its attractions from a Welsh point of view, it could provide us with an escape route from being potentially trapped alone alongside our much more powerful neighbour, the elephant with which we might otherwise be forced into bed. So from a Welsh point of view, I think we would immediately um, recognise the potential attractiveness. The Scots might be persuaded that it could provide a plausible route to earlier membership of the EU than might otherwise be the case. Could there be economic and diplomatic benefits for the Irish Republic? I ask the question. Could a, a Celtic confederation provide a more comfortable constitutional landing zone for Northern Ireland than a binary choice between Britain and Irish unification? Could it provide a stronger bargaining counter in relations with England, collectively that is to say, than the other member nations operating separately? I would suggest that it undoubtedly, if it were to come about, and it undoubtedly would. How would a Celtic confederation relate to the EU? On that question, might its creation be a spur to England, reconsidering, reconsidering its relationship with the European single market? Now, these are just some questions that come immediately to mind. There are many others. But uh, I would think that it ought to be a serious proposition which we could put on the table. And might it not be just a project uh, that this institution, this here, the IBIS in Dublin, could embark on in collaboration, perhaps, with the Centre on Constitutional Change in Edinburgh and the Wales Governance Centre in Cardiff? I think it would be um, a fascinating project to undertake and uh, I'd very much like to see it happen. <laughs> Thank you for that provocation. And, uh, any funders out there? Um, uh, watch this space. Um, thank you very much, um, John. I, I have no doubt that others uh, on the panel will have thoughts on and, and, and responses to um, what you've outlined. Um, preliminary, um, though those, those responses will, will undoubtedly be at this Juncture, but we'll move on to uh, Judith.
Um, and um, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, John, for keeping so marvelously to time as well, by the way. Um, Try uh, to keep me to time. I will. Yeah. I will uh, <laughs> you know I can go on. It wasn't meant to be a dig, but I realized <laughs> that it... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so that was a good introduction to what I'm going to talk about, because I was going to say I'm moving to transnationalism, but in fact we've had a, a transnational proposal here. So um, my research is on transnationalism among nationalist parties. Um, so transnationalism is a concept which is distinct from internationalism in the sense that it doesn't involve the state, doesn't need to involve the state. It happens in formal and informal ways. Um, traditionally, you might think about transnational labor movements. You might think about transnational green movements. Um, so today, I'm going to try to convince you that there is a transnational nationalist network, that it is rich and varied. Um, I'm going to try to convince you that it's meaningful. It has some sort of policy and strategy implications for how nationalist parties behave. Um, and I'm also going to end by kind of reflecting on Jonathan's question and suggesting that it can tell us something about the possibilities and pitfalls for nationalist movements on these islands going forward. Um, so before I start with, with that final kind of argument, um, I want to just kind of paint a picture for you of what transnational nationalism means and what it looks like. So I want to look first at the 2014 referendum in Scotland and um, picture yourself in the, in the center of the Yes campaign in Edinburgh um, and then picture some Plaid Cymru activists singing in Welsh as they fold letters um, and some Catalan activists coming in and saying, okay, well, where's the street party going to be later? Um, to which the SNP activist said, there is no party. <laughs> um, and then you can also see that, in fact, if you look further abroad, there were 20 Frisian nationalists roaming the streets of Edinburgh on the day of the referendum, asking questions of voters about how they felt about independence. Um, then bring yourselves to Barcelona in, in 2017, and you can, you're at the street party now. Um, and I'm, I'm with a, an international group of nationalists from all over Europe, and um, we're at the final rally the night before the referendum, and there's a video of Jerry Adams that plays. Um, and so this is the picture of a kind of rich and regular and repeated transnationalism, but which of course kind of came to a head during these two, what I would call for, for this community, celebratory moments. Um, but of course there are historical and cultural links which underpin transnationalist, transnational nationalism, just in the way that each nationalism has cultural underpinnings. So we think about this idea of a Celtic fringe, of Celtic connections. Um, but that, that was also institutionalized. So we had the Charter of Brest in 1972 between Irish Republicans, Occitans, Bretons, Galicians, Welsh, Catalans, um, where they agreed that they were proposing a Europe of independent socialist states. Um, that didn't quite happen. But in 1979, um, with the creation of the European Parliament, there's now a European political party, the European Free Alliance, which kind of houses this motley crew of nationalists in some ways. And as the European Union develops, that space becomes a more and more formalized institution for these parties to engage with one another. Um, so the European Free Alliance began with six member parties and now has around 40 full and affiliated members, although that number fluctuates every year. Um, and then we came this kind of discussion and scholarly excitement as well around the Europe of the regions um, and this idea that these nationalist parties now kind of networked within the European Union could lobby for results they wanted. So we see the kind of perhaps the committee of the regions as a kind of emblem of the rise and fall of the Europe of the regions. Um, and so I remember reading this Europe of the regions literature and thinking okay, it, does this still exist, right? And then seeing in 2014 and 2017 that it exists perhaps in a different way. Um, we still have ideas around independence in Europe and there are still certain people who are committed personally and professionally to the practice of that transnational nationalism. So why, if the Europe of the regions failed, do people keep investing in it? Why, if they have very little lobbying power at the European level, do nationalist parties keep investing their own money in attending such events? So I'm going to argue that there's two incentives and also outcomes for this kind of behavior. So the first being learning and the second being legitimacy. So probably the most apt case to look at learning is the SNP and Plaid. 
So when I talk to members of these parties, they almost always use the phrase that they're sister parties, right? And this goes to the extent that you can have people who are members of both Clyde and the SNP, right? And they, they held this up as a kind of symbol of their sisterhood. Um, and there were clear arenas for them to engage, right? Um, perhaps pre-2015, um, almost weekly meetings in Westminster, um, the European Parliament, as kind of staffers worked together and for both MEPs. Um, one of them said that the applied SNP relationship is part of the scenery of UK politics. So what did they learn? Um, so Adam Price actually commissioned, hired Angus Robertson in 2018 um, to conduct a kind of strategic study for Plaid about where Plaid could go. And this is not the first time that Plaid has tried to learn electoral strategy from the SNP, right? So Plaid tends to say, okay, and this isn't just Plaid, this is many other nationalist parties across Europe tend to say, okay, the SNP is further down a road we'd like to go on. So what can we learn from them? Um, and you have that to the extent of, for example, the Frisian nationalists in the Netherlands saying, ooh, we also, we also need to replace the social democrats in Friesland, right? Um, you also see some sense that Plaid often adopts policies that the SNP has adopted um, and kind of set out in arguments later on. So you can see this with the EU double majority idea. You know, it was a long time ago, but if we remember before the Brexit referendum, this idea that there should be a double majority. The SNP was campaigning for this for months, putting out lots and lots of material about this, and then Plaid adopted it kind of towards the end of the process. So we can see an exchange of ideas about strategy and, poli and policy, but of course that's all changing, and I'm going to come to that at the end. Um, but a close relationship isn't a prerequisite to learning. So then I would turn to Sinn Féin and the SNP. Um, I think it's been a more complicated relationship, um, at least from the side of the SNP, very few statements of uh, a sister party um, in Sinn Féin. Uh, Nicholas Sturgeon recently said about Irish unity, you can guess my general predilection about it. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is the first time I've ever done this to the actual politicians. <laughs> I usually do this over some beers. <laughs> but mostly I... <laughs> but mostly I've heard also stories of distance and kind of neglect or fear um, around relationships with Sinn Féin to the point that in, at the European level there were discussions that if the European Free Alliance did events or related to Sinn Féin that the SNP would leave the European Free Alliance. So quite an intense fear of being too closely related. However, institutional relationships don't always require that friendship, right? So I've kind of told a story of friendship. But um, a quite senior SNP official who worked in the government said, OK, we see Sinn Féin not as a sister party, but as a party in the Northern Irish government. And they said, we learned from Sinn Féin through that. So, for example, they said, Sinn Féin were very clear. You don't want what we've got on the devolution settlement. And we got tax first, and we told the Welsh, don't take this deal. You don't want what we've got. <laughs> so you can see this kind of um, Chinese whispers almost sometimes, right, through this Celtic fringe. Um, so we see that nationalists do talk to one another, that they seek to exchange information about policy and strategy with one another, and that there might be some convergence uh, as a result of that. Now, I think the, the idea and problem of legitimacy has clearly already come up. I've hinted at it around the relationship between the SNP and Sinn Féin. Uh, but the SNP often worries about being delegitimized by these transnational relationships. So um, they have a similar relationship with Quebec, where, for example, the last time a big delegation of Quebecois nationalists came to Edinburgh, um, there was great care taken not to be photographed too much. Um, the relationship with Catalonia, um, between Catalonia and Scotland, lay fallow between about 2013 and 2017. And I don't think that that is a coincidence. Um, senior SNP figures told me they vetted their relationships with other nationalist parties. But whether or not it's reciprocated, transnational relationships can provide legitimacy. So I'll take the example of the Yorkshire Party. Um, you might not know they exist. They exist. Um, so there's the Yorkshire Party, which often talks about its inspirational figures of the SNP and Plaid. And they talk about having a population the size of Scotland, so why shouldn't they have powers the size of Scotland, right? So Scotland used this as kind of image to legitimize whether or not that's reciprocated. Um, okay, so what does this kind of story of learning and legitimacy in the transnationalist nationalist network tell us about nationalism? Uh, for Jonathan, I'll start with an optimistic 
um, analysis of it. So we look at learning, right? And learning might be seen in some ways as a kind of nationalist or niche way of doing politics in the sense that we often assume nationalists are inward-facing or parochial, that they're only interested in what's going on in their small part of the world. But actually, most nationalist parties in Europe and across the world have been deprived of resources, at least until recently, um, deprived of resources of government. And this might have led them to more creative and cooperative forms of doing politics, right? So Hugh Hecklow said about political learning, politics finds its sources not only in power, but also in uncertainty men collectively wondering what to do. And I've always found that idea of collective wonderment as a story that we tell about how we do politics, uh, perhaps a more positive story than what we usually hear. Um, but I think we need to beware that this rosy picture I've told you of friendship, of, of, of Welsh singing, of kind of linking arms in, in Barcelona is only one side of the story, right? While there's this kind of rosy picture of friendship between nationalist parties, there is also animosity and more often neglect between nationalist parties. Um, I sometimes say, the Cornish learn from the Welsh, the Welsh learn from the Scots, and the Scots learn from no one. <laughs> now, that's a bit blithe. <laughs> this, <laughs> a tad, just a tad. The Scots do learn, but they learn from those other parties that they see as being desirable to be related to. So for example, there's a lot of talk about Scottish, the Scottish nationalists were learning from Scandinavians, and in fact, the Catalan nationalists also engage in the same rhetoric around learning social welfare policies from Scandinavians. Um, and I think we can talk about trying to seek inspiration from those most successful or desirable of parties, but we need to recognize that even among nationalist parties, even in this transnationalist nationalism, in this kind of Celtic fringe, that there are power relations which are real and practically affect the exchange of information. Um, and I suppose that this interrupts this, um, perhaps, goal that many nationalists in Europe have of a, of a transnational nationalist fringe. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Judith. <laughs> I feel like Chinese Whispers on the Celtic Fringe is a title for a, a journal article that I'm going to bank um, <laughs> at this juncture. Um, thank you very much. Um, now over to you, Michelle. Um, for a, if you like, a practitioner's uh, <laughs> perspective on, on, on questions of, of nationalist politics, national, nationalist visioning of the, of the constitutional future of, of these islands um, um, from your perspective. Great. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I'm delighted to be here. First of all, I want to give apologies for Lynn Boylan. I'm a last minute stand in and Lynn wasn't able to make it. So um, I'm also not an academic, so if my contribution isn't quite as lucid as uh, the previous speakers, I apologise in advance. But I'm glad you pointed out, Jonathan, I'm a practitioner as opposed to, um, so my work is very much hands-on. And I suppose I could bring this back to, um, to where I came from and my family. Um, before I was born, my, um, at the time, in the, growing up in the 1960s in the north of Ireland, there was a huge amount of inequality. Um, the civil rights campaign talked about one man, one vote. I mean, not the phrase you'd use today, but the fact is that people, nationalist people in particular, couldn't get a house because if you had a house, you had a vote. And the housing issue was a way of disenfranchising nationalists. So when my aunt, her husband and their children came back from England, um, they couldn't get a house. They, they moved back in with my grandparents, uh, desperate overcrowding, the local Republican club, um, the Brantry Republican club, then was campaigning and lobbying on behalf of the residents in the Brantry to get more social housing built. Um, a decision was taken by the then Dungannon District Council that 15 houses, 15 new houses would be built in Caledon, in County Tyrone, just on the Armagh, Tyrone Armagh Manhattan border, and that they would be allocated kind of half and half. So eight would be allocated to Protestants and seven would be allocated to Catholics. Um, until it came to the bit where the houses were allocated and lo and behold, a Catholic family didn't get a house and the local secretary of one of the unionist politicians, a single woman, in her she was 19 at the time, got a house over a Catholic family. So we were, I grew up on a diet of rights, of equality, and, but I also grew up as a Republican, very much 
with an anti-sectarian vibe in the house, with an anti-racist vibe in the house. It was outward looking and it was um, equal, measured by equality. And my, grandpa- my grandparents, my, my parents, my siblings, um, you know, it was very much based on, on equality and on the true meaning of republicanism. And um, I think that, take that forward. We, we're still not where we need to be on housing. Um, we still have, have major issues, but we're in the middle of another political crisis in the North where the DUP are denying, still denying rights here in uh, 2022, where we still don't have a Bill of Rights. We still don't have an Irish Language Act, which was um, advocated for in the Good Friday Agreement of over more than 20 years ago. We still don't have uh, reproductive rights. We are still way behind other nations in terms of our, our rights. And um, I, I think the British government might have made a comment yesterday that they'd, they'd come back to us on a Bill of Rights when the people who were currently denying us the Bill of Rights agreed to a Bill of Rights. You know, that's not how it works in, in my book. So it's been very much, you know, two steps forward and one step back. And um, our rights are still been denied. Equality is still not something that we can, we can take for granted. And um, we are looking to other nations and we have worked with Plaid Cymru and the SNP, particularly in Westminster. Um, I'm a Westminster MP and an abstentionist MP, but a very active one at that. And um, we work very closely, not just with Plaid and the SNP, but I've spoken at a number of events for um, the Catalan region. I've, you know, we, we certainly try to, to take learning and from those Scandinavian nations as well and when I think of breastfeeding legislation for example and think how much better we could do you know there's there's certainly much much we can we can we can do but I suppose in terms of this panel the the definition of of nationalism itself is is often contested but we in Sinn Féin view nationalism as fundamentally civic nationalism in the mold of the United Irishman and that enlightenment period and our nationalism needs to be very much needs to be distinguished from the current growth of the type of narrow populist nationalism which has been advocated by the likes of Donald Trump and sections of the political right wing in England. Roger Casement once said, um, remember that a nation is a very complex thing. It never does consist, it never has consisted solely of one blood or of one simple race. It is like a river which rises far off in the hills and has many sources many converging streams before it becomes one great stream. And that's how I think we we find ourselves and those streams, we could draw from those streams in other other countries around Europe um, that kind of have the same DNA as as we do. And Irish nationalism has generally been very outward looking. Um, As a people, we've traveled the world. Um, That's why it's very important that we welcome the new Irish and newly arrived communities in Ireland. And we have to celebrate the diversity of Irishness. Um, And the the Irish nationalism advocated by Sinn Féin is progressive, outward looking and inclusive. And that's seen in the leading role that our MEPs have played in the confederal group of the European United Left, the um, Nordic Green Left, GUI NGL group in the European Union. Um, and I know in particular, I worked very closely with Martina Anderson. We're down to one MEP now, um, Chris McManus, but certainly those those European linkages and the work we do at that level is very important. But it is ironic that um, that and that it's arguable that the narrow that narrow English nationalism and the rise of it that we've seen that English ideological agenda that has aided the cause of Irish nationalism in recent years and has probably helped the, the cause for, for, for Scotland. Um, this Tory government um, and its reckless pursuit of the hardest possible Brexit has had disastrous consequences for the, for the British Union. I mean, I can't say it lasting for very much longer and Brexit has certainly been a catastrophe for us in the north of Ireland, but, um, but it's been a catastrophe as well, I would argue, for people in, in Britain. Um, we, our majority of citizens in the North voted against it. We were told, suck it up. It's the, the, the will of the people and you have to accept the vote. But a majority of people in the North voted to stay within the, uni- the European Union. And we are dealing with the consequences now as a result of that. And 
the protocol is, uh, to, is, was put into place to minimise the disruption on the island of Ireland. It was put in there to try and ensure that there was no long, there was no return to a hard border in Ireland. And I lived right beside the hardest of hard borders. Um, I lived close to the, the town of Ochnacloy. We had a, a singer, a, a British army post in that town, a, a young fella that was in my own GA club was shot dead, going to the football pitch um, a couple, few decades ago. And we've lived beside the most militarized border in, nearly in Europe. And Brexit, I was very fearful that Brexit would see a return to that border. Now, the DUP obviously backed Brexit, advocated for and, and um, lobbied for it and voted for it. And I think it was to, to harden. They thought it would strengthen the union because we would have to build another fortification along the Irish border. There are, I think, um, nearly 300 border crossings on the island of Ireland. And that's not counting all the fields that you can walk over a ditch or, you know, that's just the official ones. But there can be no longer a, a border in Ireland. There should never have been a border in Ireland. And while I listened very closely to what John and Judith were saying and that Celtic Confederation and all of that. I don't see Ireland and the north of Ireland has been part of that. I see Ireland as part of that. And whatever uh, dynamics that there are globally in the future, I see that in terms of a, a united Ireland, a 32 county Ireland that has um, equality at its core. As long as we are shackled to a British administration as long as the likes of the DUP are given power and control, as long as they can veto progress. I mean, what we're talking about these days is whereby neither the DUP or the Ulster Unionist Party will say that if they're in a democratic election coming up in a number of weeks in May, that if there is a Sinn Féin, if Sinn Féin is the biggest party post that election, they haven't said yet whether they would put uh, whether they would vote to, for their party leader to be deputy first minister. So we've had the, the deputy role since 2007 when the Good Friday Agreement was set up. The two main parties at that stage were the Ulster Unionist Party and the SDLP. They held first and deputy first roles. When we come into the executive in 2007, Martin McGuinness was the, the deputy and Ian Paisley was the, the First Minister. To be honest, the roles are co-equal. You know, you can't write a letter as a Deputy First Minister without having it co-signed by the First Minister. So they're very much co-equal. But the Unionist parties are getting hung up these days on whether or not they're going to be the, the First Minister or the Deputy First Minister. And all of that says to me is that, again, Republicans need not apply. My rights don't count for as much as other people's rights. And I think as long as Ireland is divided, that's how it's going to be. So we'll want to, to work with our friends and neighbours. We want to have good economic relations and working relations with people in England. This is not an anti-English um, rant. It's, it's about saying we have to imbue equality and rights and a rights-based system within the island of Ireland that enables us and if we look back to the proclamation of 1916, it started out Irish men and Irish women, and it talked about cherishing all the children of the nation equally. Well, we're just over 100 years from that. We're a long way from cherishing all the children of the nation equally. And, you know, we're currently involved in a cost of living crisis. Um, you know, the, the climate crisis that's facing us, what's happening in Ukraine, we're looking at huge issues that are affecting us both politically here in Ireland and geopolitically, and yet we're still sitting in a in a in the storm in nineteen in twenty twenty two, where unionists won't say that we're equal. They won't treat us as equal, and they won't. We you know, they'll only drive the bus if we're sitting at the back of it, and that is not good enough. And I think that is where we know we have to break that link to Britain. Um, we support Scotland and Wales in their attempts to bring about their own independence. We believe everybody is entitled to sovereignty. And, you know, you talked earlier um, about, about what we can learn and, and what we can 
uh, find out from other places. We'd love John the Welsh uh, Language Act. Do you know, we're, we're a long way away from it, what has been currently talked about. And, and we're having to get rights for Irish language speakers um, protected in Westminster because they just absolutely refuse to do it in Belfast. We'd love what you have in Wales. What we're looking at is a very poor relation, but it's it's a step in the right direction. And, you know, we just, I can't understand, and I'll bring it back to the start, I can't understand what happened in Caledon in 1960, it happened before I was born. And I'm looking at turning 52 in a few weeks' time, and I don't see that we have moved on that much in terms of equality and rights. And I think without while we are a very outward looking progressive nationalist party and Republican Party, I don't believe that, you know, whatever you want to call it, transnationalism or confederalization or, or confederalism or whatever, we have to start and finish on a 32 county United Ireland whereby people are treated with respect and equality. And I think that's where we want to start from. We'll happily talk about those models post that but let's get there first. So thank you, Jonathan. I hope I didn't let Lynn down too badly, but thank you for having me here today. Fine. And Fine I look means. forward to any questions. No, it was, it was, it was no disappointment, uh, Michelle, that you were able to, 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 to step in um, at, at late notice. And I want to thank you in particular for that and for your contribution. And, and it, you've, you've posed a question already that, that I, I'm going to save for the end. But we'll go um, over now to Michael Russell and his very fine and very asleep uh, pussycat, uh, yeah. <laughs> who is very sweet and I'm very envious. But um, thank you for joining us, Michael. Sorry that you couldn't be here, but thank you for making the effort to, to join us um, uh, remotely. My apologies. Well, my apologies for not being with you, but uh, I judge all the events I met by the reaction of my cat, and so far my cat has been entirely placid during this entire event, so we'll see whether it wakes up uh, once the questioning starts. I want to uh, listen with great care to most of the contributions today, and I want to uh, endorse three of them in particular, Michelle, Sarah, and Carwin, because they've all addressed the reality of the situation that we face in Scotland which is a political reality, which is how we write the difficult conditions and terms under which we live. And, and Michelle was particularly strong on that in what she's just said. And what this is about, and I want to come on to constitutionalism in a minute, but what the politics of this is about is trying to ensure that we find the mechanism, the way to right those wrongs. And they are, they are many and considerable. I mean, we all live with problems, but I was struck by the comparison between what the situation in Scotland and what Carwin was identifying. And I've worked with Carwin before, as I've worked with Welsh Labour, as indeed, just to make the point, I've worked with Sinn Féin, I've worked with the SDLP, I've worked with uh, Pride, I've worked with a whole range of people. And um, there are a whole list of things in which we experience. It's not just massive union flags, and, and Michael Keating reflected also on this massive new UK office in, uh, in Edinburgh. It is the gradual dismantling of the small progress that uh, devolution has brought in terms of, of decision making. It is the rejection of electoral mandates. Um, in 2019, at the UK general election, the SNP won 48 of the 59 seats in Scotland. Uh, it is quite clear that is a massive mandate by anybody's standards. And when I went, uh, and I was then, I was for five years, the Scottish representative on the Joint Ministerial Committee, when I went to the next meeting a, a week or so later in London and said to Michael Gove, look, I recognize the mandate you have because you fought the election, the Tories fought the election on the, uh, 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 to get Brexit done. No one thinks about like that now with some irony. But you must recognize, I said to him, the mandate that the SNP has to hold a referendum. There was no such acceptance and there's still no such acceptance. So it's a blatant disregard for democracy. And of course, it has its effects. It has social and economic effects. It has effects that drive down the prosperity of Scotland and create insecurity in Scotland. And all those things have to change. And the question is, how can we change them? And we have to have an air of realism about how we change them. Uh, you know, as somebody who has had the responsibility of negotiating with the UK government, 
I don't think the relationship between Scotland and, and the UK and Wales and the UK has ever been worse. And I think that's been expressed by Carwin and by John and by, by others. And in those circumstances, I don't think it's possible to try and invent some new idea that the UK will suddenly wake up to and think, gosh, we should do that. The reality is we are facing a choice. And the choice is a simple one. The choice is whether we can to allow decline to take place, precipitated by Brexit, and further undermining of our institutions, or whether we choose a different path. Uh, John Adams, the first American vice president, the, the second American president, talked about the act that the, that the United States colonies then found themselves it, it doing uh, when the, the nation was established. In these words, he said that the task was to begin government anew from the foundation and building as we choose. And it seems certainly to me, and I think to many in Scotland, that that is a task which we must undertake if we are to have not just the self-respect that Michelle was referring to, but actually have the ability to operate as a normal people in the normal world. It is simple normality to expect us to have that. And it leads me to another thought, a different quotation, forgive me, forgive me for this, but from a very different source. You know, people say, well, there is a, there's a compromise possible. We'll find a, a new way of working together, which you know, will, will bypass or change Westminster sovereignty. There's no indication that any UK government, Labour or Tory, at any time in the future would accept that. Um, you know, or we'll, we'll find a few more powers for the devolved administrations, and that they will, you know, will in some way play down the desire for change. Uh, and it was Conan Doyle in, in Sherlock Holmes' um, casebook who observed, when you've eliminated... All which is impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And what remains is a choice between independence and continued dependence and decline. And I, I think the experience, certainly in Scotland, but I would argue the experience in other parts of these islands, tells us that. And we have to recognize it and we have to then react to it. And we have to take a, a decision about how we react. Now, Scotland has been through one independence referendum. We've learned a great Heal from that experience. Uh, we, you know, the, the SNP stood in 2016 on a specific uh, manifesto pledge that if the, Scotland was dragged out of the EU against its will, that would be the grounds for another referendum. That has been put to the people. The people have accepted that. There is a majority in the Scottish Parliament for another referendum. There is a radical government that's looking at the ways in which we can move forward between the SNP and the Greens. It seems impossible to do anything other than to say we must have that referendum. And that is why the policy of the current Scottish government is when the pandemic has uh, has subsided to bring forward the bill that has already been published to, to hold that referendum and essentially say to, to Johnson, to the Tories, to the United Kingdom, you then decide if you are really going to actually stop the will of the Scottish people as expressed in the parliament, uh, as expressed in the election by recourse to law, if you can. And, and that's where we are now. But just to move on to constitutionalism and the, the creation of constitutions. I think we also recognize from the 2014 re referendum, which was a, an invigorating event. I mean, I was the member of the Scottish Parliament where I'm sitting now in Argyll and Butte, and I set myself the task of speaking at, uh, in every village hall in Argyll and Butte. And believe me, there are many village halls in Argyll and Butte. And it was an invigorating, uh, exciting event. But we were looking at that idea that John Adams talked about, the beginning government anew from the foundations and building as we choose. Uh, and But we learned also from that that we needed to be even more inclusive. And we've learned, for example, from, from Ireland, the experience that Ireland had in the abortion referendum, for example, a, a, a choice, a, a, a binary choice that people are, are asked to make uh, needs to be made with a recognition and, and in remembrance of those who do not agree and will still carry on after the decision. So we we have been considering the role of constitutions in that role, in that in that in that task. Um, and in my role as party president, I've been bringing together some of the yes movement to look at a transitional constitution that would give guarantees to those people who did not support independence, who felt reassured, who, which could also carry. Uh, the weight of change from a vote for independence through the process of independence to the process of building a whole new constitution. And you can't do that before independence because there are many issues that need the involvement of those who will not involve themselves at, at, at the stage of the debate.
and certainly the SNP's policy is to have a, a citizens' assembly uh, sourced type constitution process after independence. But I think we will see over the next few months and perhaps uh, longer the emergence of a transitional constitution in Scotland, which will endeavour to reassure, will endeavour, and, and in terms of the first discussion today, will endeavour to guarantee some of the social and economic rights which are not presently guaranteed because there is no formal written constitution in, 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 in the UK, and will move Scotland towards a position where on application for EU membership, we are much more able to address the chapters of accession from a firm legislative and rule of law basis. And of course, you know, that is what we require to do and what is sadly lacking in, in the UK, which is that concept of the importance of the rule of law in settling the relationships between diverse parts of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a union. Um, I think we've got you know, the opportunity now to do something radical and new in Scotland. I think we've got the experience to take that forward. We do learn from other people. We do talk to other people. We do listen to other people. Um, and we will go on doing so. Uh, but I think we've also got the opportunity to um, address political wrongs, uh, which have built up over a period of time, and which we should not be expected simply to accept. But in actual fact, we should do our very best to, for the Scottish people to make sure that they have a better uh, solution than the one that is presently applied. I hope that's helpful, John. I'm sorry I'm, I'm not there to address it in person, but I look forward to hearing what questions there are. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Um, I'm only sorry that I can't buy you a drink uh, to say thank you uh, this evening, but uh, I'm sure we'll have an opportunity for that um, in, in due course. Um, a reminder to those tuning in on, online that you can pose a, a question in the YouTube chat um, and uh, I'll come to, to, to questions from the floor in a moment, but I'm going to um, utterly abuse my position as chair in the first instance to pose a few different questions. Um, my first question... My first questions are specifically to you, John, um, and one of them is... Um, building on, on something that Michelle uh, said uh, in her contribution, to what extent are um, Scottish independence, Welsh independence and Irish unification, reunification kind of necessary prerequisites or um, preconditions for the kind of confederal sorts of arrangements that you're, that you're um, talking about? And, and second of all, um, I wondered if you could also speak a bit to the function of the um, the, the agreement between um, the Labour government and Plaid Cymru in the pursuit of um, constitutional change in Wales. Um, what 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 it signals about how Plaid is approaching the question of of constitutional um, reform, and then my. Um, I have a, a kind of question for uh, the whole panel, really, um, which is the same question for everyone, but it means slightly different things uh, in different uh, for for each of you. And, and the question is about Westminster, and I'm, I'm, I find it very interesting to think about Westminster as a space for doing, for want of a better word, separatist nationalist politics. Um, and and my question for all of the panelists, perhaps less so for Judith, is what are you doing there? Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> for, for Michelle, it's a slightly different question because I'm interested in the day-to-day -day work of, a shin for, of an abstentionist MP, how you see Westminster and its function in Irish Republican politics. And then perhaps for, um, for John and for Michael, um, and, and Michael in particular, given the SNP's role as the third party in the UK Parliament, how that sits with the, um, the, the pursuit of and its function in the pursuit of, of, of independence for Scotland. And Judith, I would just be endlessly fascinated in your reflections on all of these, on everything you've heard from, from the other panellists, but also on, on those questions too. So 
Um, we'll, we'll go in the order of the people presented in, if that's okay. And, um, and over to you, John, in the first place. Well, on, on the two specific questions you, you ask, uh, on the first uh, about the um, development of a kind of the confederal, Celtic confederal approach that I was trying to advocate, um, clearly in, in a, a pure constitutional sense, it, on, a, 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 on a kind of Benelux kind of mm. model, uh, it, it would have to be negotiated between independent countries. Uh, but that is not to say, and it would be necessary, uh, to start building those relationships in a more integrated way now. And indeed, you know, that's beginning to happen. I mean, only last year there was uh, 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 an agreement between the Irish governments and, and, the, and the Welsh government about developing relationships you know, of a trading cultural kind. And, uh, and I think the same has happened in Scotland. So, so I mean, building those, you know, the, 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 it seems to me there's huge opportunity to develop links between our, our different countries on, 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 you know, on, in all manner of directions, which regardless of the eventual outcome can only, only be beneficial. And, uh, and I, I was advocating spe specifically that y you should be uh, trying to pioneer that in an, in an academic direction. So uh, that's the answer to that one. On the question of the, co the cooperation agreement, I nearly said coalition there, uh, <laughs> on the cooperation agreement um, between ourselves and the Labour Party, um, a number of things to say about that. I could say an awful lot, but... Um, Please do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, two, um, two aspects, really. Um, first of all, there is a specific commitment uh, to develop the Seneth itself um, uh, to increase the size of the Senate. Uh, to, we've got 60 members at the moment, which is really small. I mean, it's not fit for purpose. Um, so we've agreed between the two parties that that will go up to somewhere between 80 and 100 to, to be resolved. Um, to develop the proportional system uh, and to uh, uh, increase um, the representation of w women. Uh, so on the, all those three fronts, um, uh, that would be a major step forward and reform of the devolution process, which can only happen constitutionally uh, by a two-thirds majority within the s Senate. So b between us, of course, Plaid and Labour have the two-thirds. So that is guaranteed as a consequence of the agreement. And that alone would be justifiable enough in our view, because it, it takes the devolution process in Wales, you know, a major step forward. Um, beyond that, uh, we've agreed and have established a constitutional commission, uh, which is going to look at the future of Wales and its relationship with the other countries of, of uh, these islands. Uh, and uh, independence is part of the, of the, the remit. That's been accepted by the Labour Party, which again is a remarkable step forward, I would say. And um, indeed, um, Carwin was saying that you know there's there's an awful lot of common ground between Labour and Plaid, uh, which I think he's right. But that has developed over the last twenty years. I mean, we, we, I mean, in a terms of you know broad social democratic approach socialism, however you want to define it. There's not much of a cigarette paper between us. And now on the question of, 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 of the development of our country, uh, again, you know, Labour now has acknowledged that sovereignty rests with the people of Wales. Well, yeah, you know, I can't imagine the Labour Party back 20 years ago saying that kind of thing, the opposite in actual fact. So, so we think, that, and, our, and you know, we, we can only get, we can only win a referendum on independence if a shed load of Labour voters vote for it. <laughs> uh, that's the truth. And, uh, and so, you know, we're about building alliances, building uh, coalitions, building consensus. And uh, that's what we are trying to do. Thank you. Um, I don't know, Judith, if you have reflections or if you want me to come back to you. For... I have reflections. Yeah, great. <laughs> Everyone's surprised. Uh, <laughs> Um, I think just from hearing what everyone said, I think what's really interesting is that there's this feeling, and I think, Michelle, you said it very explicitly, is where we want to work with other people. We are outward looking, but we have to sort ourselves first. That comes from 
first sorting ourselves. And I think I, think I would say the challenge there is um, what if it's impossible to sort yourself unless you face the challenges that you're all facing. I mean, I think if you look at the challenges that Catalonia faced with their referendum, that's a future which I'm sure the SNP is, is um, thinking about a possible future, right? And I think that these are common challenges that all, all nationalists will face when they're trying to dismantle an established state. And so, you know, thinking about learning as a, as a possible uh, tool for that, I think, I think it perhaps has to go hand in hand. It's not first one and then the other. Um, and of course, all parties learn and seek to, to learn. On Westminster, a place I <laughs> hope to never find myself. Uh, imagine that, a, Calif- a Californian. <laughs> um, I think, you know, it's interesting because it's clearly been seen as an, an arena. We can talk about venues for information exchange and learning. Um, and I think, but I think that that's not unusual, right? And then not to um, compare the ideological underpinnings of these two groups of people, but uh, we see far, the far right use the European Parliament as a, as a venue for talking to one another as well, a, a place that they would rather didn't exist, mm-hmm. right? So I don't think it's unusual. I th- think, think the thing being there, and I think discussions which are very live in the parties that that surround me right now um is to what extent do you get too deep into that um institution which is kind of you know the idea of can you dismantle the master's house with the master's tools yeah yeah thank you michelle okay i'll try and and um answer some of judith's questions along with yours john but um i think you're right, Judith. The two, it's not, they're not um, incompatible. Mairead Farrell said at an event in Belfast um, before she was um, gone down in Gibraltar by the SAS, but she had said at an event that we couldn't um, wait until we had the status quo sorted out. We couldn't wait for Irish unity before we started campaigning for women's rights. Mm-hmm. So she was making the point very clearly that we needed those two had to run concurrently. So I think it's the same thing. You know, we can still be outward looking and talking to our allies around the world, as well as trying to sort our problems here at home. And in fact, the Good Friday Agreement was signed in 1998. It came up at a conference I was at yesterday about how the delivery, how the Good Friday Agreement was sold within loyalism. And I made the point that uh, somebody had said it back in the day that after the Good Friday Agreement was signed, um, unionism went to bed and Sinn Féin went on the road. And we did go on the road and we did big meetings, we did small meetings, we did kitchen table meetings. We brought four members of the ANC over at our own expense. We took them into rooms, if it was into a room with one person or it was into a room of 400 people, and we asked them to help us to explain why it was important that Republicans got behind the Good Friday Agreement. And it wasn't a Republican document, but there was enough in there for us to sell it as a, as a move towards unity. And we've never made any secret of the fact that that's where we aspire to be. So it wasn't that we were settling for the Good Friday Agreement and then, oh, by the way, lads, we still want unity. It was very much a vehicle for, for bringing unity about. And so that's how we use London. And it was interesting. I hadn't thought about that in terms of the European Union before, Judith, but that it was an interesting comment. When we come together in London, and London, London's a big melting pot of, of cultures and people, and it doesn't feel like England. It's London. And, um, and I've been, I suppose I've been lucky as a, I was first elected to the Assembly in 1998, after the Good Friday Agreement. I was elected by the narrowest of margins, I thought at the time, in 2001, <laughs> to Westminster. My first majority to Westminster was 53 votes. I've subsequently had another one with less than 100. In fact, it's less than 100 now. But my smallest majority was four votes, which post the electoral court was reduced to one. So so I, for a long time, I was both an MP and an MLA. I, my husband's here today with three children. I drove up and down the road to Belfast. I was back and forward to London. Not London as much then as I am now, but I very much recognised that the answers to our problems lay in Ireland, whether that was Belfast or Dublin or Tyrone and Fermanagh, are the answers to those problems lay in Ireland. What was very interesting is that my colleagues in the Ulster Unionist Party and the DUP 
also would have given that impression in London as well, that London was sometimes a distraction and you really didn't get things done. And I was, I was smiling to myself and um, Michael, don't hate me for this, but in terms of your question, John, about um, as a space for separatist na nationalists, how do we see Westminster and its function and the role of an abstentionist MP? When people were, were begging us to go to Westminster to stop Brexit, we were using the SNP as an example of why it wouldn't work. And we were saying there's seven of us, but there's over 60 of them and they're not making a big pile of difference. And that, that wasn't derogatory, Michael, but we were just making the point that you can have many more than seven MPs and you still really don't make an impact in England because of, the, well, as John had talked about, the disparity between the size of the amount of MPs there are in England and everywhere else. So we're, we don't take our seats in Westminster. We're very proud abstentionists, but we're also very active. And I think that's where you and I first met John was at an event in, in Westminster. But we, we still have to represent our constituents. And I, I think, and I certainly feel that I do it with aplomb. I work very hard for my constituency. I work very hard on issues that are important to me. Just by way of, I suppose, an interesting wee fact, and this might come up on a pub quiz sometime. The first Sinn Féin female MP was Countess Constance Markovich. And the second was me. So it took a long time to get our second Sinn Féin woman MP. I've been there since 2001 with a wee break of two years. And thank God for Theresa May's strong and stable election because then I got back to my, my, my Westminster role. But genuinely, I see the, the issues, whereas we can get lots of done in London. And I've sat in a room and I was very great friends and still am with Lady Sylvia Herman. And we've shared platforms and we have talked about the work we've done together and how well we work together. And, you know, I still want to be outward looking to work with people who mightn't have the same ideological point of view, but with whom we share a lot and we have a lot in common. So we need to continue to work with people who agree with us and people who don't agree with us. We need to work, you know, nationally and internationally. And ultimately, I do feel that the answers to our problems are on the United island of Ireland with good neighbourly relations in whatever form with Scotland, Wales, England, Isle of Man, Brittany, Cornwall, Yorkshire, I don't mind, I'll work with anybody, Catalonia, ANC, Palestine, we will be continuing. And believe me, our role in the United States has been, and our friends in the US have been very, very important to us as well. So our outlook is truly global and when we need to continue to do that. But for as long as people are sending MPs to Westminster, and as long as my constituents still want me to be there representing them, I'll do the job as best I can. But I do want to see more roles for MPs, all MPs in Dublin. We sit on the Good Friday Agreement Committee. The unionist MPs are also welcome to attend that. So far, they haven't done so, but I'm hopeful. And, um, and we need to, to try and get answers to our problems here in Ireland and try and create a country and a nation that we can all be proud of and we all feel respected within. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks. And Michael, We need the, um... I do love Michelle. I do love Michelle's description of herself as an active abstentionist. Uh, I think that's that's it's a wonderful use of language, and I shall undoubtedly use it again myself. Let me just touch on two things before I come to uh, to Westminster. One is John's uh, remark about Labour MPs accepting the sovereignty of the people. I am delighted uh, uh, to hear that they accept sovereignty in Wales. The trouble in Scotland, of course, is that Labour MPs signed the Claim of Right. You know, 30 years ago, accepting what was a constitutional fact that the people are sovereign in Scotland, that is Scottish constitutional law, it hasn't made any difference to their position, and it certainly hasn't made any difference to the position of the Labour Party in the UK. And that is the problem. The Labour Party in the UK is a determining factor in these issues. As far as outward going and outward looking activity is concerned, I mean, I, I, I was external affairs minister well, ten, more than 10 years ago, and again, uh, towards the end of my period as a as an MSP, um, you know, and I wasn't exactly idle. We, we had a very active, outgoing set of um, principles which we've tried to apply. We've established offices in a variety of different places and representation in different places. We have un undertaken bilateral reviews, including with Ireland. But Simon Covey and I were the signatories of a very extensive bilateral review, which has been immensely helpful, I, th I think, to both sides and 
certainly we've learned a great deal from it. So we are active and, and continue to be active. We also spend a lot of time uh, giving information to and, and making sure that uh, ambassadors and others hear from uh, us and, and what the situation is in Scotland and welcoming people who want to, to come to Scotland to see what's, what's happening. And of course, that is also a Westminster role to come onto that. There is a, a role for Westminster MPs to be active advocates where the diplomatic community is, um, and also to, to make uh, points to and give information to other parliaments. And the you know, MPs have the ability to do that, and that's very helpful to us. Um, there are, I have to say, SNP members who ask John exactly the question that you have asked, you know, what, is, what are they doing there? And I can understand that. But you know, we have a duty to represent people at every level of governance, and that's what we do. We don't take part in the House of Lords because it's not elected. That is the reason we don't take part in the Lords. We um, we do want to, we do very much follow that um, Winnie Ewing's remark uh, when she was first elected to uh, the Westminster Parliament in 1967, that she was going there not to settle down, but to settle up. And what we need to do is to keep reminding uh, Westminster that we have another agenda, and it's an agenda we try to, to follow. Uh, we also can draw attention to the issues which are important to us. And we didn't actually set out to be the third largest party, but now we are the third largest party. There are certain advantages in being that in terms of bringing matters to debate. But I can assure you that nobody will be happier than me if they're not still at Westminster. We should abolish an unnecessary tier of government. In Scotland's term, that is Westminster, and certainly substitute those elections for elections to the European Parliament, which we do more importance and more use to us. Thank you very much. I like that. Not to settle down, but to settle up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, are there any questions from uh, anyone in the room? Sarah, yes, if you just approach the mic and... Uh... And thanks for, uh, for a great presentations. Um, I just have a question for Michelle. I was really interested, Michelle, in how you defined Sinn Féin's um, idea of civic nationalism. And um, I was thinking as we move you know, forward in the debate about Irish unity um, about the, the large proportion of people in, uh, who don't identify as either nationalist or unionist. And we heard earlier, I think it was Jennifer talked about how that group will be you know, pivotal to deciding the future um, of Northern Ireland. Um, I just was interested in your thoughts on how that group can be engaged in the debate, uh, maybe work that Sinn Féin are doing, or, or just your own thoughts on, um, on how that, that group can be, um, can be engaged and, and reached out to going forward. Okay, start. Do you want to take that? My yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, no, that's a great question, and I think it's something that you do without really even thinking about it. Um, I remember being very um, innocent and naive, first getting elected and coming across a group in my constituency in Fermanagh South Throne called Women of the World, and that was an organisation that kind of brought together mo the, the women who lived in the constituency who were in that other bracket. Uh, women who were from the Philippines, women who were from India, from across the world. And um, I got involved with them, went to their events and supported what they were doing and developed friendships, really abiding friendships. And one of the women, Anita Rukchari, passed away about 10 years ago. And I'm dealing with an issue in the constituency right now. And I wish Anita was still there that I could talk to and could take advice from. And I think it's, again, it's naturally what we do. We reach out to groups and organisations, my constituency. It's not just, Inniskillen has a very cosmopolitan vibe about it because there's a hospital and there's, it attracts people from around the world. But in the South Throne part of the constituency, for about 20, 25 years ago, we had a big influx of people from Portugal, Portuguese nationals who come over to work in the factories. And we now have a very vibrant, very um, important um, community of people within, especially around Dungannon. So we have East Timorese, we have Polish, Lithuanian, Latvian, Romanian, Slovenian. We, we get our election literature in Fermanagh South Throne translated into six different languages so that we can reach out and connect with people from around the world. And I think. As an as a active abstentionist, I'm dealing with a lot of constituency issues that affect people. I'm constantly writing to the Home Office trying to sort out issues with residency and all of that. But people, wherever they come from, 
and especially women. I find it they, these these past few years, and it's going to get worse. There's an awful lot of poverty. There are an awful lot of issues around access and services for children, whether that's um, diagnosis for autism or whether it's getting special needs education or transport or all of these things. And I find it doesn't matter where you're from or who you are, women tend to have a lot of the same problems. And we mightn't all speak the same language, but I will always try and reach out and support women from wherever they're from. And in that way, I think you're you're nearly doing what you've asked me about how do we engage. We're doing it without even thinking about it. And we're showing people how we will continue to put their priorities first and we will try and ensure that they know. And they're not, I mean, the, the people I know who come from different parts of the world aren't stupid. They know that come July and August will be, the place will be festooned. And Michael talked about it earlier, about his big flags. I said, I'll challenge it, a big flag competition. <laughs> but, you know, people, people come from other parts of the world and they come to the North of Ireland and they, you know, they're getting on the best and then suddenly in, in July and August they think they're in the heart of, I don't know, somewhere in England. Um, Finchley maybe. But, um, but you know, it's, 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 they, they kind of go, what in the name of God's going on here? So I think once you try to understand the background of the place that you're in, the fact that, it, you know, those, it's binary. I, I don't like this whole idea of orange and green, never never aspire to it. I work for everybody equally and I, you know, I'm, I know people can vote for me equally as well. But for me, it's about the kind of country we want to create and the kind of country that people who come from other parts of the world want to raise their children in. And that means that they have to have access to services and access to rights that so far they haven't got. Thanks, Michelle. Um, conscious of time, um, and I'm going. We've, we've got a question on the, the the chat online, and then I'm also going to kind of pose one final question um, to to each of the panelists um, on some final reflections before we move to to, to close the session. But uh, Miley Brennan has posted in my research working with the the GFA generation, the ceasefire babies in in Northern Ireland. Several younger adults who like the idea of a united Ireland are hesitant to identify as a nationalist because of negative associations. And here they men she mentions Trump and Boris. Uh, yeah. um, how does the language of nationalism impact um, on the push away from Westminster? How do you differentiate between Irish, Scottish and Welsh nationalisms and right-wing uh, nationalisms? Do these distinctions negatively affect the political affect uh, political movements for independence and or unification? Um, so I, I think I'll pose that to each of the panelists and also offer you the opportunity for any final um, reflections or remarks um, um, after your response. And perhaps we'll go in reverse order this time. If, uh, we'll start with you, uh, Michael, if, if that's okay. Yeah, so you know, the, the, the question about terminology is a good one. I mean, over the years, there have been debates within the SNP as to whether we should drop the N from it and, and drop the, the word nationalist from it. I think you know, we, are, we are stuck with the name that we have, and indeed the, the history of the party is a strong and good one, and I wouldn't want to change it. But um, we have to make the differentiation. We do it, of course, you know, by the, the, the things we do and the actions we take and the words we use and how we present ourselves. Uh, and we do so, I hope, in a very different way from Trumpism, from, uh, from Johnsonianism or whatever it might be called. Uh, we show that we are inclusive, we are civic, um, and of course we are judged by that too, and we have to be able to do so in government. So I would, I would certainly hope that it is a distinction that's not difficult to make. But of course, for many people, you know, politics is, um, you know, is a minority sport. For an awful lot of people, there is, uh, there's not a great engagement with it. And therefore, they may see things taking place and draw conclusions. We have to work hard against that. And the, only, the only final reflection I would make, apart from thanking you for having me and saying, I, again, I'm sorry I can't be with you physically, is the complexity of these issues. I mean, you know, no one part of these islands and no one nationalist movement can be the poster boy or the exemplar for many, many others. We've all got different tasks to do. We're all faced with different challenges. We all come from different histories. We've probably got different destinations. We can, however, learn from each other, and we do learn from each other. Um, and we can learn many things from each other, and that's what we try and do. But 
in the end, it will boil down to what we do in our individual countries ourselves, how we do it, how we persuade our electorate that our analysis is the right one, and how we then deliver uh, what is very difficult. Uh, there is uh, one of my friends and colleagues, uh, an Edinburgh academic in, in, in politics, uh, Nicola McEwen, who, who some of you will know, uh, reflects that to become independent in you know, essentially the third decade of the 21st century is a very difficult task, much more difficult than the task of faced nationalist movements in previous generations. We therefore have to be thoughtful, brighter, sharper, uh, and more effective than uh, our predecessors in order to achieve the aims that we think in, will be of enormous benefit to the citizens of Scotland. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I'm also, again, sorry that you couldn't be here, but I'll owe you that, that pint, sure. Um, Michelle. Okay, I'll, I'll try and keep it very brief. Michael, you talked about politics being a minority sport. Somebody once told me it was showbiz for ugly people. So um, <laughs> I think um, a couple of things that we need. First of all, we need to see an acceptance of the right to Irish national self-determination, full implementation of the GFA adopted within British government policy. I think that's been a long time coming, has to happen. But equally, um, the British government need to work collaboratively to manage our transition, but the Irish government have to immediately convene a National Citizens' Assembly. Um, that has to cover constitutional change to positively address the key policy areas and the mechanisms for change. And Miley's question was a great one because it's been posed to me before, you know, how do we differentiate between that kind of narrow nationalism? And I think a Citizens' Assembly gives us the chance and, you know, we, we watched Scotland and the debate around independence and your statistics at the start of that transitional period and your statistics at the end and it's arguable another month or two and you'd have you'd been home and dry and you know but we think we need to have those conversations to have those debates in the village halls and on on tv and i think we can we can differentiate between that kind of narrow nationalism and the kind of outward looking um spirit of um globalism and not in a bad way because I'm a farmer's daughter, globalism isn't always a good thing. But um, the, the fact is that we need to recognize that we're a small island. We're on the very Western seaboard of, of Europe, but we have huge influence around the world and we are, our diaspora has a far reach and we need to, to, you know, for people to understand that to be Irish, an Irish nationalist is a proud thing and we'll never treat other people. When I think nas English nationalism, I think of, football hooligans and, and maybe that's not fair but but that's the kind of the narrow uh, perception that we have and we need to to take Miley's question on board and try and ensure that we answer it properly so Gormila Mayoga for having me Jonathan it's been a pleasure thank you thank you very, thank you for being here um and Judith yeah yeah I think it's a great question um, and something which is a very active issue among nationalists when they speak to one another. Um, and as scholars, I'm sure we all know, we can't always use the word nationalism when you're approaching certain certain places because it's seen as being incredibly negative. Um, I think, you know, um, Michael said there are no poster boys, but I think there are older siblings. And I think um, uh, the SNP is the kind of older sibling of the nationalist, um, the nationalist family so to speak. Um, and I think the one thing that, one of the things that is learned a lot within the network is this idea of the SNP's great success in presenting themselves as a desirable kind of nationalist. Um, and it's a, it's a, the SNP has developed a kind of vocabulary, which is part of the political party and kind of radiates throughout the party. Um, and when I first moved to Scotland, someone said to me, a Scot is a person who makes their home here. And I think that that's something which is, is actually kind of part of something which is taught within the SNP as a party and something which is taught within the nationalist community in Europe. Um, and so if, if we want to return to this idea of civic nationalism, um, I think civic nationalism and, and having that vocabulary of civic nationalism is something which does radiate throughout the transnational nationalist family, so to speak. That's great. Thank you. Um, I could, I could hear a, a kind of audible <gasps> in the room at that um, idea. Um, everyone who is here is from here. I think it's a potent, powerful one. Um, 
And last but by no means least, um, John. Your uh, Jonathan, could I could I just make a, a point? Oh, sorry, that Michael. Up. Yeah. I just want to make a point to follow that up because it's not just the vocabulary and the language. I'm glad it's been drawn attention to. But then, you know, in government, you can put that into effect. I, I took through the the last uh, franchise bill that we had in the Scottish Parliament, which gave the vote on the basis of residence. Uh, it, it broke the link with citizenship. And it, indeed, in terms of, of, of ability to vote, is one of the broadest franchises in the world. And that's what will apply to the next independence referendum. So it's not simply about language. It is then about converting that language into actions that show a very different type of approach from that from populist nationalists. So I, I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. No, that's a valuable contribution. Thank you. And, and now, last but by no means least. <laughs> well, following on from that, I mean... Uh, uh, with all ideologies, it's, it's, uh, it's as well to look at what people do rather more than what they say. Uh, people's actions are the, uh, uh, are, are the essence of it, are they not? And I mentioned the coalition, uh, the, co the cooperation agreement. So, and I mentioned, uh, I mentioned, you know, the Senate reform and the constitution and so on. But top of the list in the co cooperation agreement is uh, free school meals for all primary school kids in Wales. Free, uh, uh, free uh, nursery care for two year olds upwards, and uh, reform of the social care by creating a national care service for Wales, and and bring, give it, bringing parity of esteem, uh, parity of esteem to people who work in in social care, as in in in, in the NHS. So you know that says something about the socialist credentials. I mean, we're a party to the left of the Labour Party in Wales, and, uh, you know, we're moving them to the left. Uh, as to nationalism, nationalist, I mean, and I, having arguments with the Labour Party over many years, they say, oh, we are not national, we're an internationalist party, they'd say. Well, I used to say, well, how could you be an internationalist without being a nationalist? You've got to have something to be into with, you know. And then my final point, I suppose, is a plea for the small, the small battalions. You don't get the large countries threatening to invade their neighbours. I mean, you don't get the small countries, rather, threatening to invade their neighbours. Um, so I think there's something about the virtues of scale. Um, and uh, just a final note, I remember Brendan Hannigan, who was... Uh, of these of, of this parish, um, who sadly I heard last night has passed away, but he came to Cardiff uh, for a conference I organised, and he, he made a speech about the virtues of of, uh, of the small small battalions in the world. But he said, "If you're going to be small, you better be smart." <laughs> <laughs> someone who's neither. Uh, <laughs> um, I just want uh, to thank all of the panellists um, for this uh, third roundtable session on nationalism and the constitutional future. So if we could give them a final round of applause. And uh, according to the running order now, you're scheduled to listen to me for another 15 minutes, but I'll, I'll, I will spare you that. You'll all be pleased to know. Um, I just want uh, to thank everyone who has spoken today, uh, everyone who's been able to join us uh, in Dublin at UCD for the event, and those of you who have participated um, online. I want to give a special word of thanks to Alan, uh, who has uh, made sure that the live stream has functioned seamlessly, and it is a great relief and a great privilege to have been able to work with you on this event, Alan. Uh, so thank you for, um, for, for making it possible. I hope that today's event has kind of um, validated um, uh, my, my view that it is important and valuable to bring unionisms and nationalisms and everything in between across these islands into dialogue with each other uh, in a way that uh, I, I maintain um, is perhaps all too rare. Uh, and I look forward to much more of it to come. Um, keep an eye out on the IBIS uh, website and social media channels for you know, forthcoming events, uh, further discussions on these and other and related questions um you know watch this space for um for work on on a celtic benelux uh, perhaps certainly on 
uh, relations uh, on the on the quote unquote Celtic fringe uh, um, uh, from myself um, and others uh, in the institute. And I think, unless I've forgotten anything, <laughs> and Dawn or Paul will, I'm sure, uh, tell me that I have, uh, bring it to a to a close there. So thanks all very much again. And um, yes, it's been a great day. I've 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 really enjoyed it. <laughs> so I hope everybody else has too. Thank you. Thank you.